can say good morning. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, everyone. And welcome to everyone who is here in person, virtually, and in spirit. Thank you for joining us today for the start of Words Walking Without Masters, Conversations on the Creative Theoretical. From the first conversations about doing, quote, some kind of event, to this convening of such amazing creative theoretical practitioners, this event would not have been possible without the immense amount of support from our professors, our colleagues, and of course, our sponsors. For their generous contributions and support, we want to thank Ella Diaz from the Department of Literatures and English, uh, Elena Viramontes from the Creative Writing Program, Samantha N. Shepard and Karen Jaime from Performing and Media Arts, Carol Boyce Davies, the Frank H. G. Rhodes Professor of Humane Letters, and Carolyn Levine, Mary Pat Brady, Michael Koch, and Kathy Carruth, all of the Department of Literatures in English. We would also like to thank the American Studies Program, Comparative Literature Program, the College of Arts and Science, the Society for the Humanities, Cornell University Libraries, the Institute for Comparative Modernities, the Medieval Studies Program, the Department of Literatures and English, the Department of Anthropology, the Graduate School, the Department of Africana Studies, and the Minority, Indigenous, and Third World Studies Research Group, otherwise known as MITWS. We are also so grateful to the AD White House for being the in-person host for this symposium. Many thanks to Kina and Jen for being so available and flexible this week. This event would truly not be possible without the many people who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes. Oh, I lost it. Most especially Alice Murdoch in the Department of Literatures and English. Your help and patience with this entire process has been truly invaluable. We also want to say a huge thanks to eCornell and to Cornell IT for all of their technical and logistics support. To Laura Caicedo, Taylor Pryor, Lisa Camp, Karina Barris, and Amrita Chakraborty. Thank you for your incredible work, support, and friendship. Last but not least, we want to say thank you to Professor Carol Boyce Davies for her theorizing of the creative theoretical, which inspired the theme for this symposium. We also thank her for her guidance, encouragement, wisdom, and support of both of us each step of the way. It has been so rewarding to not only learn from you, but to also work alongside you. When Jahan and I began planning this symposium, we had no idea how ambitious it was or how deeply <laughs> folks desired such a space. We knew, however, that the silos that seek to binarize and to limit our work as creative theorists could never hold this possibility. In this wonder work, we've homed the marvelous messaging of dream talk and book talks, of critical kitchen table kikis, and of culturally intimate porch talks with, I'll add, countless long-winded goodbyes turned new talks, new beginnings. <laughs> As the symposium grew, so too did our wonder and our commitment to generations of creative theorists who find their work compartmentalized or misunderstood. The creative theoretical is therefore an urgent call, one that beckons us to lean into our otherwise ways of world building and being, a call beyond dying colonial narratives and knowledge systems that seek to restrict our imaginations when we need them most. As we work towards just, sustainable futures and a wounded, death-obsessed culture, the creative theoretical then becomes an urgent call for life. In a recent class, while discussing Audre Lorde's Poetry is Not a Luxury, my students drew attention to the following lines. Quote, possibility is neither forever nor instant. It is also not easy to sustain belief in its efficacy. We can sometimes work long and hard to establish one beachhead of real resistance to the deaths we are expected to live, only to have that beachhead assaulted or threatened by canards we have been socialized to fear, or by the withdrawal of those approvals that we have been warned to seek for safety. Sometimes we drug ourselves with dreams of new ideas. The head will save us. The brain will, alone will set us free. But there are no new ideas still waiting in the wings to save us as women, as human. There are only old and forgotten ones, new combinations, extrapolations, and recognitions from within ourselves, 
along with the renewed courage to try them out. And we must constantly encourage ourselves and each other to attempt the heretical actions our dreams imply and some of our old ideas disparage. In the forefront of our move toward change, there is only our poetry to hint at possibility made real. This possibility was generations in the making. Long before we, ev we were even thought of, many we now call ancestors labored and dreamed so that we might make it this much further, that our struggles and burdens may be that much easier to bear. Loss has characterized so much of these last two years, and Shakoya and I are no exception. To those no longer present in flesh, but always in spirit, we call out your names in remembrance and in gratitude. To my grandmothers, Dr. Willie Mae Williams Crittenden, Ruth Roberson, and Virgil Roberson. To my aunt, Dr. Beverly Jean Williams Cleves, my cousin, Joseph Grubbs, and to Theodore Teddy Anderson. I'm honored by your continued presence and love in my life. The way that you lived was an example I was blessed to witness. You each planted and nurtured so many seeds of curiosity, of soul deep communion, and of unshakable faith in radical black possibility. Those seeds are eternal blossoming gifts. Alongside Jahan, I encourage you to bring your folks from the wake, to invoke your living dead in spirit at this site of possibility. I call on my Aunt Ronella, my Aunt Jill, Sandra Towns, Stacy Slaughter, Bernadine Thompson, Joshua Kidwell, Earlene Davis, and Lisa Ngunda. As Ancestor Bell Hooks describes in All About Love, embracing the spirit that lives beyond the body is one way to choose life. We embrace that spirit through rituals of remembering, through ceremonies wherein we invoke the spirit presence of our dead, and through ordinary rituals in everyday life where we keep the spirit of those we have lost close. Sometimes we invoke the dead by allowing wisdom they have shared to guide our present actions, or we invoke through reenacting one of their habits of being, and the grief that may never leave us, even as we do not allow it to overwhelm us, is also a way to pay homage to our dead, to hold them." End quote. May our people home this critical, sacred space with us today and tomorrow, and may this spirit-led love offering reach who it must as we critically commune at the site of possibility. To the presenters, conspirators, and attendees, we want to thank you for your presence, your offerings, and for joining us in this effort of harnessing radical possibility. Thank, thank you. you. I would like, like to welcome Professor Boyce Davies to speak on the panel themes. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I want to first honor the Cayuga uh, people's chief for being here and your words of welcome. Uh, so necessary and I'm so pleased that our grad students were that conscious that they made sure you were here and you are here. So. We are in your space and we recognize you. I'm from the Caribbean, so Carib peoples also um, have a relationship that we want to also honor and this is why I, I really recognize you as well in this way. So good morning everybody in cyberspace, <laughs> in the audience. This is a new venture, this is a hybrid, a hybrid conference, right? So. We have some people here and some people, many more people I know listening in. So we welcome that huge audience that, that we know is present. I'm gonna read just a little quote from Zora Neale Hurston's The Eyes Were Watching God, which situates a lot of this. <clears throat> the sun was gone, but he had left his footprints in the sky. It was the time for sitting on porches beside the road it was the time to hear things and talk. These sitters had been tongueless, airless, eyeless conveniences all day long. Mules and other brutes had occupied their skins. But now the sun and the boss man were gone. So the skins felt powerful and human. They became lords of sounds and lesser things. They passed nations through their mouths. They sat in judgment. They made burning statements with questions. 
words walking without masters, walking all together like a harmony in a song. Pages one to two, the eyes were watching God. It may be worth returning to a full read of that introduction with all its complexity and beautiful ugly from Paula Marshall's Poets in the Kitchen and Fred Moten's use of that in Black and Blur. But I wanted to identify at least the removal from master disciplinary constructs that the creative theoretical signifies and which is captured in this event. The creative theoretical as a concept arose in praxis in the reading, teaching, studying the works of black writers from across Africa and the African diaspora, pushed forward by the assertions of those like Barbara Christian in the Race for Theory, who claimed that we are already, quote, a race for theory, unquote, and that we theorize in multiple ways in our folk tales, songs, myths, legends, narratives, and so on. At first, it came across as a kind of Caribbean literary phenomena with phenomenon with salient contributions from people like Ciola James, Sylvia Winter, Amy CZ, Eric Walker, Norbessi, Philip, Dion Brand, uh, Edward Glissant, Audre Lorde, and so on. All these writers who were determined to express themselves imaginatively in several modes, the creative and the theoretical radical, as they represented themselves as transformative intellectuals. <clears throat> But as we studied, we saw a distinct pattern emerging in these conjunctions in different ways in a range of black literary fields, even as the academy maintained a strict disciplinary separation as it is one to do. We saw this split as not as useful for our work as we began to evaluate a range of writers from the black radical aesthetic tradition, many of whom, like Toni Morrison, or people like Ai Kuyama of 2000 Seasons had, had imaginative work that elucidated a variety of theoretical positions. We defined it then as that luminal space where the imagination feeds each of these streams and willfully brings them together repeatedly in that magical place where imaginations roam free, new stories, new meanings, and new realities are created. So there was a first cohort of grad students who presented work 20 years ago. Um, and titled with dissertations as follows. Miriam GMR, The Creative Theoretical in the Works of Amar Taedu, Keisha Abram, Revolting Women Writing Worlds, Black Women Writing Autobiography as Resistance, Meredith Gadsby, Sucking Salt Caribbean Women Writers, Migration and Survival, which was published in book form by Missouri in 2006, Marcia Douglas, whose novel for creative writing PhD became her novel, Madam Fate. Siga Jan Sani Bat, Throwing Voice, African Woman and the Critique of the Unitary Category, Woman. So the creative theoretical then is described preliminarily that uh, in the preface to the Caribbean woman writer, scholar, imagining, theorizing, creating, in a way that suggests that not every creative writer is automatically a theorist, know every theorist, a creative writer, but that there's overlap in the writers who do both using a variety of methodologies and practices. And this is precisely what this symposium proposes to investigate. What are these methodologies and practices then? The many varieties of engagements that the creative theoretical brings forward as the imagination again feeds each, feeds each of these uh, two identifiably often as discrete and separate forms, right? But feeds them repeatedly in many different ways. So the place then in the dark where magic can happen that, that Zora Neale Hurston references as the sun goes down or that Jamaica Kinkett identifies, all of these capture then what Zora says, that context, that space for words walking without masters in which she describes that time of the day when people sat on the porches and let conversations and analyses, gossip, ass assessments of community, all of these fly as liberated speech after enslavement. All of this is worthy, I would suggest, for capturing the freedom that we want to emulate in these conversations for the next two days, presentations, kitchen table talks, porch provocations, and so on. So from elder literary statesman in Gugiwa Thiongo to Alexis Pauline Gums, we have a range of possibilities to do all of this and many others who 
uh, here but uh, identified and you will see them in the next few days. Jafari Allen, for example, Thomas Glave, and, and so many more. Mina Salami. It is a particular joy then for any professor, I'm saying this in conclusion, when particular ideas engaged are taken further, developed, made theirs, elaborated, as is happening today in this two-day symposium. Coming out of a graduate course on black feminist theories taught during the pandemic, and some of the students are in the audience, uh, some of them I didn't meet until a year later. <laughs> it was really weird. Um, we presented, these students presented, I have to say, a range of path-breaking papers, one of which, one of which, sorry, a Norbessi Philip is already accepted for publication. Two students, though, in the group, Shakoya Kidwell and Jehan Robinson, became the initiators of what has become this event, aided by an amazing team of students from that class and others from this year's pool of students. Altogether, they have maintained an interest in this project for the last two years, I believe, fundraised, <laughs> advertised, organized uh, to ensure this event's success, a fitting culmination of your work, all of you. Um, this is completely a graduate student initiative, so I'm just a guest or somebody helping to take it further. Um, from our recently renamed Department of Literatures in English, if we are in a department then which students feel empowered to take an initiative like this to produce such a formidable event, then we have to be recognized at Cornell uh, for producing and nurturing cutting edge scholarship and work. So immediately then upon its circulation that we wanted to do this or that students wanted to do this, I was, I was one of the signatories to the initial letter, the response from writers and scholars around the world has been amazingly supportive, encouraging, way beyond all expectations, with many others who wanted to participate still or heard about it later and were not uh, able to be added because of time and all of that, including people like Michelle Mugo, who called it a literary theoretical watershed. Uh, you are being treated then, all of you in the audience, to an amazing cross-section of writers, scholars, students over the next two days. And we are pleased then to begin this process right now we invite you to walk with us like words without masters as we imagine the multiple harmonies of a song. Thank you. Oops. I'm a little shorter. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here with us. Uh, I'm Aliyah Gonzalez. I'm a first year in the Department of Literatures and English PhD program. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to honor Barbara Smith for being here with us. So Barbara Smith is a lesbian feminist and socialist who has played a significant role in building and sustaining black feminism in the United States. Since the early 1970s, she has been an act active as a critic, teacher, lecturer, author, scholar, and publisher of Black Feminist Thought. Smith is one of the founding members of the Combahee River Collective and the Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. Her essays, reviews, articles, short stories, and literary criticism, is everything okay? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and literary criticism have appeared in a range of publications, including the New York Times Book Review, The Black Scholar, Miss, Gay Community News, The Guardian, The Village Voice, Conditions, and The Nation, Barbara has a twin sister, Beverly Smith, who is also a lesbian feminist activist and writer. Words Walking Without Masters, the Creative Theoretical Symposium, honors Barbara Smith for her lifelong commitment to creative theoretical and activist praxis. Okay, sorry y'all, nervous, because Barbara Smith is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> When Jacoya called me up and asked if I had time and capacity to share how Barbara Smith has been central to my scholarship and dream work, I could taste the yes on my tongue before I even looked at my calendar or too, too long to-do list. Barbara Smith and all of the profound and meaningful offerings she shared with us, black feminists, black lesbians, black women, is why I'm in graduate school. My introduction to her work, to your work, was in an African-American literature graduate class at Cal Poly Slow in 2019, where I first read Towards a Black Feminist Criticism. 
This semester, we return to your words in Professor Hugh Pegues' Theories and Cultures of Women of Color Feminisms, where we spent time critically considering what a black lesbian and a black feminist novel meant then and what it means now. I find myself returning to your closing words, where you tell us, I finally want to express how much easier both my waking and my sleeping hours would be if there were one book in existence that would tell me something specific about my life. One book based in black feminist and black lesbian experience, fiction or nonfiction, just one work to reflect the reality that I and the black women who I love and are trying, um, for, oops, sorry, black women who I love and are trying to create. When such a book exists, then each of us will not only know better how to live, but how to dream. It is because you broke the silence that myself and others not only know better how to live today, but how to dream. Thank you. So I think I'm supposed to be talking now. <laughs> Somebody say something to let me know. I want to thank. Um, uh, I want to thank. Is it Alia? Yes. I might have said it incorrectly, but thank you so much for a beautiful introduction and reading uh, reading uh, familiar words <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that I wrote. And thanks to everyone who is welcoming me here. Um, and made uh, this, uh, this connection possible. I particularly want to thank, well, both Shakoya and Jahan. I just met Jahan, I believe, yesterday, although I was going to ask if we had met when I was at Cornell in uh, November of uh, 2019. But be that as it may, Shakoya had interviewed me. And then, of course, there is my longtime friend, Professor Carol Boyce uh, Davies. So uh, it's just wonderful to be with all of uh, you. Uh, I am uh, in, well, a little bit outside of a few miles outside of Albany, New York, which is Mohawk, Wohican, and Haudenosaunee land, often refer uh, referred to as the Iroquois uh, Confederacy. And it is on that land that uh, I am present. Um, what I'm gonna talk about for a few minutes is what made Kitchen Table Women of Color Press unique. Now, of course, there's the obvious, the fact that uh, we were the first publisher uh, run by and for women of color that reached a national audience. There were some other uh, publishers and publications that also focused on women of color, but because of uh, the scope of what we did and also because of the marketing and publicity that a certain person was very committed to, that would be me, uh, our work uh, went uh, very far for a press that literally at one point was on the first floor of my two family house in the black uh, community in Albany. So there's that, the, that our mission was a uh, unique at the time we were founded. How the press was founded was also interesting and unique. I had met Audrey Lord uh, in person in the uh, mid and late 1970s, and we became friends. I was familiar with her work because of the fact that I was reading every single thing I could by black authors. And she was published by an independent press uh, in Detroit, a legendary and pivotal uh, independent press called Broadside Press. So she was one of the broadside poets, which uh, meant that she was a part of the black arts movement of the 1960s into the early 1970s. So I was familiar with her work. And then, as I said, we met in person. Uh, once, uh, one day in 1980, the fall of 1980, we were talking on the phone and she was coming to Boston where I lived at that time to do a black women's Halloween poetry reading. When, when you think about it, that's kind of great. Halloween is actually my favorite holiday. I did not plan the uh, poetry reading, however, but you know, it was uh, mystical, spiritual, and it was about black women. So we were talking on the phone about her coming to uh, Boston. And she said, Barbara, you know, and that wonderful lilting voice of her, hers, uh, absolutely uh, uh, based, you know, in her Caribbean heritage. She said, Barbara, we really need to do something about publishing. 
And of course, I knew exactly what she meant because we had been in the situation of, um, you know, being parts of special issues. And I, I myself had co-edited Condition 5, the Black women's issue. Um, there was t- attention being paid by women's presses and feminist publishers to the fact that they needed to include all women, not just white uh, privileged women. But it was time for us to have a press of our own. And that's how Kitchen Table got started. I uh, got together a meeting during the weekend that she was in Boston at my home in Roxbury. And that was the beginning. Um, We were another unique thing about Kitchen Table is that we were both a movement and a literary publisher. Uh, We are a political press with high literary standards. And that I think is unique because uh, often those things do not necessarily go together. The fact that there were several people involved with the press, in fact, a number of people, I'm thinking about Hattie Gossett, for example, who were involved with the press who actually were superb writers themselves and really valued uh, a level of written expression that uh, just sang, you know, that uh, moved off the page into people's uh, hearts and uh, minds. Um, we were not into belle lettre. You know, like when I say we were a literary publisher, we were not trying to publish the most obscure, most difficult to understand, most rare of work. We were interested in publishing authentic work by uh, women of color. Uh, And when I say that we were a political press, I want to be clear that those politics were leftist, anti-capitalist politics by and large. We didn't necessarily have uh, political discussions like that within the uh, Kitchen Table Press uh, Collective in the early days, like I don't remember having conversations about, uh, you know, like, are you a socialist? Are are you a Marxist? Have you read, you know, (laughs) whomever um, like that? But because of who was involved, and I'm thinking particularly of of Audrey, of Sheree Maraca and myself, you know, there was definitely that those kind of politics, which were not... um, you know, like within the movement of women of color that was building, of feminists of color that was building, that was not uh, uh, so unusual. Uh, we were not liberals, um, and uh, we were certainly not li- neoliberals <laughs> to this day. So, in any event, um, those that was a kind of those are the kind of politics that we gravitated to. We've been in other movements, uh, many other movements too. Uh, kitchen table press conversations or talks were conversations that were materially based and that were concerned with our people's actual material conditions and struggles. We were always mindful of that. Another unique thing about Kitchen Table Women of Color Press is uh, was our decision to be a press for all women of color. Even at that first meeting, I believe that Mariana Romo, Romo Carmona who lived in uh, Boston, the Boston area at the time, and was a friend. I believe that she was at uh, that meeting. Uh, most of us who were at that meeting were African American and African Caribbean. But as I said, we made the decision uh, that we would be oppressed for all women of color, and that was that might have been a departure from what was going on uh, in other movements uh, and in other spaces at the time. I want to share with you how we defined women of color. We Now, we did have really uh, incisive conversations among ourselves when we were arriving at how to make that commitment operational. And what we decided, and Audrey was very central in, that, in those conversations, as was uh, Cherie, um, what we decided is that we considered women of color to be anyone who identified with the indigenous peoples of their nation, of their country. And one of the reasons we put it that way is that there was a question about who was Latina, because of course, being Latina, um, now, you know, Latinx, um, you know, used, used um, still, both terms are used. Um, that, that there are people of various races within uh, the group. So 
like as I, as I was saying to Jahan yesterday, we were not asking people to, to submit photographs, you know, with their manuscripts. That was not what we were about. Uh, we were talking about and, and interested in hearing from people who did identify with the indigenous people of their cultures and of their nations. A particular example of that is uh, Latinas whose uh, families actually came from Europe and came to places in South, um, uh, Central, uh, probably more South America because of the Holocaust. Uh, they were Jewish uh, people who migrated from Europe to uh, South American uh, countries and they spoke Spanish and they were born, you know, in those countries. And so, as I said, we were not about, you know, uh, the the, uh, fe- uh, the the phenotypes, you know, that's like how the how the thing looks. Our, 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 we're not a, we were not about the genotype either. You know, who are you genetically? It was like where are your politics and who do you identify with? Um, often people refer to kitchen table women of color press to this day as a black women's press, and I always correct them. Um, some of the uh, publishing decisions that we made um, reflect the complexity with which we understood our mission. A great example is um, our decision not to translate the book Quentos Stories by Latinas. This is not a translated book. If you are able to find it, I don't believe it's in print at this time, but if you're able to uh, find a copy of the book, and many libraries, of course, purchased it, Uh, when it was available, uh, you will see that there is writing in Spanish and Portuguese and in English, and none of that writing is translated. So whatever uh, language the writer submitted their work in, that was the language that we published it uh, it in. And it was very interesting to me as a non-Spanish and non-Portuguese speaking African-American sitting at the kitchen table, press table, at conferences and events and having certain people get very bent out of shape because it wasn't all in English and was not translated. And like uh, we said, you know, as uh, politely as we could, and maybe this book is not for you uh, because um, we were mindful of like the realities of Latinas living in, uh, well, in the United States primarily, but like of people who were bilingual and wherever they were, because there were people you know, from outside of, of the United States, of course, who, who uh, had work published in it as well. It was like, whatever language you express yourself in, that's fine with us and we will publish it uh, that way. Um, my two favorite books, uh, we didn't do a lot of publishing, but our books really made a lot of impact. Uh, my two favorite books, and maybe I shouldn't say it, but the press doesn't exist anymore, so I could really say anything I want. <laughs> There's really not much way that you could even verify it. But be that as it may, I am telling you the truth. Um, my two favorite books were by two Japanese-American authors, Hisai Yamamoto and Mitsuye Yamada. Those books were published, I think, in 88. And... Um, Hisai Yamada is one of the best uh, you, uh, short story writers. He was, he's not now deceased, was one of the best short story writers in the United States who was getting her short st- stories published in such places as the best American short stories of 1950, whatever. So very early in uh, you know, her career, her work was being recognized, and she had never had a book published until the late 1980s because of anti-Japanese sentiment that was bleeding over from World War II. So the question is, why was somebody who was so good that she was getting all these awards and accolades for her writing and yet never had a book published until a press called Kitchen Table Women of Color Press came along? And it was Mitsuya Yamada who I had met through this bridge called my back, that's who introduced me to Hisaya. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, we, uh, if there were Japanese phrases in the uh, books and they were, they were transliterated into English characters. And the only way that we could proofread that book, 
since we did not know the words. And so, you know, like we would look at the word, we could not verify if it was uh, spelled correctly or not. The only way we could pre- proofread the book was to read the entire book out loud. And that's what we did. So we would read the galleys in those days. It was galleys. You, uh, we would read, you know, like uh, I had uh, interns, one particular intern, Sheila Sable, who is my lifelong friend to this day. So Sheila and I, I we would read the book out loud and verify from manuscript to galleys that we had gotten the spelling of these words we did not recognize correct. And I was a stickler about having everything in the book be correct. I was just so not into the typos and to uh, all the things that, you know, say amateur. One of the things that I would tell my coworkers who were all younger uh, than I, I would tell them that um, like our books have to sit on the shelf next to all the other books. And I told them also it costs just as much money to publish an ugly book as it does to publish a pretty book. So I said, we are going to publish pretty books. And we had great um, graphic designers. My two favorite parts of being a publisher were publicity and promotion and graphic design. I learned graphic design from being a publisher, but I had some background uh, and other you know, material arts. And so it was just a kind of natural fit. So we, we did pretty books that had very few, if any, errors in them. And if I found one, of course, I'd lose my mind <laughs> after it was published. We practiced solidarity, um, political solidarity, for example, supporting the struggles against apartheid in South Africa, uh, the liberation struggles in Latin America. Uh, we participated in various book fairs. Uh, there, were the, there was a Latin American book fair. There was um, an Asian American book fair. We would participate in those book fairs as well as in Black uh, book uh, fairs. Not always welcome because, of course, we were out lesbians, uh, most of us, and published lesbian material. We sent our books free to all prisoners who requested them. And that was a lot. And the majority of the people... It, um, were incarcerated who requested them were indeed men who were in prison. Um, just to conclude, uh, before the internet and social media, Kitchen Table Women of Color Press functioned as a communication network for feminists of color and our co-conspirators all over the world. I would say that wherever English is uh, read, uh, is read and understood, our books can go. And I actually imagine these books with little feet, you know, our little wings flying and going all over the world. And the evidence of that would be when we would get our mail and there would be letters with postage stamps from Japan, from South Africa and Spanish, from uh, uh, Latin uh, Latin America and South America. People would do exchanges. They would send us periodicals. Often that was a practice of uh, independent publishers. So they would send us things and we would send them things like books for review and we would get things that we couldn't read, you know. But um, that was the level of uh, connection uh, that we had. And people would write to us about things that had nothing to do with publishing because we were a visible women of color presence on the planet. Uh, We did a lot of work. Um, It ended, uh, sadly, uh, but... I feel like things ending doesn't necessarily mean they failed. And uh, I now say that um, when I see, and we do see this, when I see first time lesbian of color authors being published by mainstream publishing houses, I say that's because of Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. It would not have happened if there had not been a path that had been broken. And that's what we tried to do. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, we wanted to share some words that we wrote about to honor you uh, today. Let's see. Um, So the lessons to be called from Barbara Smith's life and legacy are so many. 
but at the core of her incredible body of work is the imperative to live and embody one's truths, to build a life in alignment with your principles, to see each part of yourself as integral to both your own makeup and to how you show up in the world. From the Kitchen Table Women of Color Press to the Combahee River Collective, Barbara Smith has lived her truth as a black woman, a lesbian, a feminist, and as a radical love practitioner. It takes a remarkable amount of courage, and in articulating those truths, Barbara Smith has not only helped forge new liberatory paths, she also lit the way so that we might follow, and so that we might find our own way into otherwise possibilities. Barbara Smith's incomparable living legacy is one that continues to shape and to nurture freedom dreams and feminist movements. In our 2020 conversation, Barbara Smith mentioned creative theorists like Toni Morrison and Zora Neale Hurston being lifelines to black women in the 1970s. I personally want to thank her for being a lifeline across generations here, for planting nourishing seeds in us as black feminist students and practitioners, and for providing us nourishing seeds to promulgate as instructors. The Symposium's Kitchen Table series would not have been possible without the visionary audacity, to quote Alexis Pauline Gums, of Barbara Smith's Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. We gather before you in gratitude and with the determination to carry your living legacy onward. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. so much. <laughs> And we honor Barbara Smith because this is what a creative theorist looks like. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, we want to affirm that. Um, mm -hmm. Because we're used to theorists being presented as European and old and white and male. <laughs> <laughs> or black and male. But we, but we say you know, this is what a creative theorist looks like um, in our framework. And for this, we honor you as well for your yes. work. and. Uh, the generations of students who have learned how to think these combinations of being black and woman, black and feminist, uh, and all of the other ways in which you have really brought that forward. And friendship and great conversations. Barbara is an amazing telephone buddy, too. We <laughs> talk about all sorts of things. But she's also amazingly supportive if you have a project. And I say this because we were asked not too long ago to do a, a handbook of black feminist theories. And I asked Barbara Smith if she would um, look at the project. And because of her background and experience in publishing, she was really on it with the press and wanted every detail about how it would look like and talk yeah. to the press at a level that I could not. So uh, uh, I'm here <laughs> Bloomsbury, and this is Bloomsbury Press London, and this oh, is wow. recent. Right, yeah. so this is Barbara Smith. So amazing collaborator, <laughs> friend, and colleague as well. And we were pleased, we sent her a, a, a a tribute, a small recognition, and we wanted to at least let her know that although this is hybrid, that there was actually a tangible mm -hmm. gift uh, of honor that was sent, and we wanted to read it, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. It says, it was up earlier, just a photo of it. It says, Word walk, words walking without masters. Oh. Theoretical, theoretical Symposium, yeah. Department, Department of, of Literature in English, English honors Barbara Smith, Barbara Smith for her lifelong commitment to creative, theoretical, and activist practice. April 21st, 2022, Cornell University. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say thank you back. And uh, that beautiful uh, tribute is on my bookcase. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for honoring me by letting me be a part of this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We break in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I think we're going to uh, have a brief transition, and then we will uh, come back with Alexis Pauline Gums. So thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Amazing stuff. <start. laughs>
Don't y'all feel like we have to get the kitchen table press activated again? <laughs> I just checked my phone. I have like a bunch of random new followers on Twitter. I'm like, who is this? I tweet every six months. Like, I don't know. Coming. Oh, before we start, uh, we wanted to also invite all of our in-person guests to also visit the kitchen table mm -hmm. in the next room. We have a, uh, a long table that is for people to go and process, to commune, mm -hmm. um, to leave little notes on the paper that's there. So please stop by there if you have some time. Um, and today we are so thrilled to welcome Alexis Pauline Gums. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you. Um, Alexis is just a phenomenal human, a phenomenal artist, writer, scholar, thinker, and um, someone whose work and whose example is just completely exemplary for us. Mm -hmm. um, and every time that I've had the opportunity to be in space with Alexis, uh, it's just been such a gift, and mm -hmm. we're so thankful mm -hmm. for her and for her work. Absolutely, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to read a brief bio, but just to let you all know, um, or to remind you, all of the bios are on creativetheoretical.com. Um, Alexis Pauling Gums is a queer black feminist love evangelist and an aspirational cousin to all life. She is, they are, the author of four books, Spill, Scenes of Black Feminist Fugitivity, M Archive, After the End of the World, Dub, Finding Ceremony, and Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals, which we're both teaching. Gums also co-edited the volume Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Lines. She is also the co-founder of the Mobile Homecoming Trust, mm -hmm. an intergenerational experiential living library of black LGBTQ brilliance. Unlike most academic texts, Alexis's work has inspired artists across form to create dance works, installation work, paintings, processionals, divination practices, operas, quilts, and more. We thank you so much for being here today. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. I am just so happy right now. I was screaming, hollering. I did the wave. I did my own standing <laughs> ovation. The honoring of Barbara Smith was so beautiful and called for and radiant. And when I found out that this keynote would be happening right after that, I was like, oh, <laughs> am I going to even still exist? You know, like I just might <laughs> like, go into stardust because I cannot overstate my gratitude for Barbara Smith. There is no recognizable version of my own life that has not been made possible by her diligent, loving, brave work all these years. And so when I thought about that, I was like, okay, well, thank goodness for Audre Lorde, who felt similarly about Barbara Smith. It is very, very clear that Meeting Barbara Smith was a life renewing, life changing experience for, for Audre Lorde. And um, it's, it seems that it was very, very mutual. And so today in honor of this brilliant, brilliant idea, brilliant possibility, brilliant convening around the creative theoretical, I wanted to bring together one, Audre Lorde's first published work of literary criticism, which happens to have been a review piece about science fiction that she had published when she was 19 years old in Seventeen Magazine. And one word that Barbara Smith used to describe Audre Lorde in a recent interview with Cheryl Denier for the FX series Pride, and that word is incandescent. Mm. Oh, and this is this is drawing from the research for my biography and process, The Eternal Life of Audre Lorde. Mm. 
This is the bio from Seventeen Magazine. Audrey Lord is working in Stamford, Connecticut on a leave of absence from Hunter College where she is a scholarship student, trying to make expenses to carry her through her next year in college, Audrey says, I am appreciative of the change in surroundings, but I miss my book collection and my precious guitar, both of which I left in New York. In Audrey's ideal version of the story, life after high school would have gone something like this. After an illustrious high school career, Audrey Lord beloved wit of the student body and editor of the literary magazine, goes on to Sarah Lawrence College, where she communes with the best minds of her generation, revels in the special culture of an elite women's college, and makes wonderful use of the advice and connections of the esteemed faculty, publishing her first book before graduation. Yes, she is well on her way. No, that is not what happened. Audrey won a $1,400 scholarship when she graduated from Hunter High School, and her teacher Cornelia Newton called Audrey one of my future poets, but she was neither beloved by the student body nor editor of the high school literary magazine, and Audrey's parents could not afford to pay the rest of her way to private Sarah Lawrence College, which increased its tuition for the second time in a three-year period in Audrey's graduation year of 1951 to $2,281 per residential student per year. After graduation, Audrey packed her bags, and one day at the end of July, after a heated argument with her mother and her sister, she left for good and moved to the Lower East Side. She enrolled at tuition-free Hunter College, but she had to work a number of different jobs to pay for her housing and food. During her first semester of college, Audrey heard from neighbors that her father was dying. She did not return home. Instead, she took what she called a leave of absence from Hunter and went to work in a factory in Connecticut. And she kept writing paid pieces for Seventeen magazine. As an adult, living on her own tenuous terms, Audrey needed a new story. Her narrative had to reach beyond her resistance to her mother's rules in her father's house. She was on her own now. Her new story would have to be nonlinear enough to hold her curiosity and dreams, her wonder about the beginning and end of the species, her suspicions of impending apocalypse and her deep sense that things could be different. She needed a story scary enough to include her insistence on staying haunted by her dead schoolmates in the present and the future. Some days in Connecticut, out of touch with the people from her former life, she might have felt like she was on another planet, but she had her typewriter and she kept writing. The community you have, she would say later, reflecting back on this time, is the community you create. In January, 1953, the month her father died, Audrey's first prose article for Seventeen came out. It was called, A Science Fiction Fan Discusses the Growing Appeal of Stories of the Outer Reaches. Audrey herself was in the outer reaches of the tri-state area, working on the assembly line for Keystone Electronics, helping to build machines that could make invisible sound waves useful to humans. The first official science fiction organization signed its charter in 1934, the year Audrey was born. Audrey had been reading science fiction for years off the pulp pallets that her father brought home. The world wars and the advances in science and technology in the intervening years, especially the development of the atom bomb, pushed the wider public to think about apocalypse and space travel. Science fiction authors like Ray Bradbury won literary awards beyond the limits of the genre. According to Audrey, by the time she graduated high school, science fiction writers had, quote, pulled their work out of the pulps and placed it in the class of respected fiction. After just a couple of semesters as an English major and philosophy minor at Hunter College, Audrey felt she knew what fiction was worth respecting. Even though 
The title of the piece described her as a fan, and she called herself a sci-fi addict by the end of the piece. She also alluded to her own discerning tastes. She knew how to judge the, quote, character studies and, quote, emotional integrity and, quote, artistry that truly good science fiction authors demonstrated. She called Ray Bradbury a master craftsman for his dexterity in seriously portraying the imagined perspectives of people living on Mars. She called August Derleth a master of all fantasy fiction. For Audrey, it was important that good science fiction and fantasy get the science right. As Audrey pointed out, even children know the basics of science. Sci-fi authors cannot irresponsibly portray humans walking on the moon, breathing without any special apparatus like one author did in a story Audrey does not recommend in her essay. In this piece, our young Audrey, with the hopeful camaraderie of a fellow fan, suggests that 17 readers start with the collections she calls excellent, especially Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles, and August Derleth's edited anthologies, Outer Reaches, The Other Side of the Moon, and Beyond Space and Time. Audrey thought the rise in science fiction's profile was timely and timeless. Quote, the unconquerable drive that will always urge man to scan the future and to seek knowledge of what he knows not is ageless, she wrote. But the timing of this piece in her life is also telling. The future-oriented work she was reading and writing about may have also reflected her own desire to move into a new stage, or in her words, quote, preoccupation with the things to come and with the better world of tomorrow. She empathized with a society, especially people in her own generation who felt, quote, caught in a world very little of our own making. At the same time, she saw science fiction as an important form of world making, noting that what science fiction depicts will eventually come into being. 50 years before the submarine was invented, Jules Verne equipped his fabulous Nautilus with forerunners of present day submarine equipment, she pointed out. And if 19 year old Audrey were to make a world, what world would she make? Her own future had a lot in common with the other side of the moon she had no idea what was going to happen. But she knew she wanted something different. This was the high school poet who wrote, strange other lands are calling, alien cries I heed. Audrey most likely first read Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles while she was still in high school. What did she think of Bradbury's series of interconnected short stories about Earth's effort to colonize Mars, but it's really the United States' effort to colonize Mars? How did these stories show up in her life? Think about the melancholy of the one where when the brave astronauts get to Mars, all they can see is the world full of longing for the people they love who have died. Or the one where the scientist creates facsimiles of his dead family and talks with them every day while he ages and they all stay the same age. Or the one about the bored married Martian woman with the prophetic dreams of a love that will take her to another world until her scared husband and her inert obedience to patriarchy blot out her dream forever. A warning? Maybe Audrey thought of it years later when she decided to leave her own heterosexual marriage for a new world of love. Or, and the moon be still as bright, the one titled after a poem by Lord Byron, one of the romantic poets that Audrey and her crew of high school outcasts called up in their seances. A story that compares the colonizing Mars mission to the genocide against indigenous communities on earth. That one may have especially hit home for the poet who wrote The Makers of Our World at age 14. Audrey's poem was a lament not only for genocide against indigenous communities, but also for the violence of cultural forgetting by those whose authority is, quote, written in Indian blood on land, quote, wet with your lost children's tears. And then there's way up in the middle of the air, the only actual depiction of black people in any of the sci-fi Audrey recommended 
That story must have stood out. Picture a jubilee imagined to take place in June 2003 when all the Black people in the South collectivize and buy their own rockets. The exodus flows like a freedom-seeking river. Black Southerners leave their possessions behind like so many burdens and extricate themselves from the racist white people who finally realize they have no idea who they are or how they will function without Black people to subjugate. Did Audrey laugh out loud? The stories Audrey recommends in the Derleth anthologies are telling too. The one where scientists discover a cure for cancer on the moon and a time travel drug on Pluto. Or the one where two completely different species that thought they were enemies realize that their differences are powerful and that they need to collaborate in order to avoid mutual destruction. Or the one about the epic poet Servant, who no one knew was writing until his poem about the destructiveness of the human species ended up being all that outlasted his captors. Or the one where a tsunami dredges up the bottom of the ocean and the New England fishermen discover powerful beings they never knew existed. Or the one where the scientist scorches the earth with a radioactive bomb designed to teach humans the true cost of war. Or the one about the last man on earth. He built a family of robot children and taught them his favorite poems. The story is from the perspective of the scientist's oldest robot child on the day he completes his assignment to destroy all of his father's creations. But first, he has to read a poem over his father's grave. Or the one where the girl turns into a machine. This is from Audre Lorde's poem, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Lest I go into dust, I have not ever seen my father's grave. While Audre Lorde's father was dying, she got her first full-time job. She worked on the factory floor at Keystone Electronics alongside other black women from the city or the South or Puerto Rico or the local Connecticut community. Most of her coworkers were not on a leave of absence from college. They worked with dirt. Keystone mined quartz crystals in Brazil. Audrey and the other workers sorted them their mission, to find functional crystals in the surface of the earth and turn them into the transducers that made radar, radios, and other electronics work. The factory was the processing site. The women worked the process. First, they rinsed the rocks with toxic carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride is a caustic greenhouse gas once widely used in dry cleaning. It was probably the solvent Audrey's mother used during her brief stint working for a New York City dry cleaner before Audrey was born. The story is that when she worked there, Linda Belmar Lore's lungs started burning so badly that she stayed home sick. And when Byron Lord went to collect her check, the owner of the cleaners found out Linda was not Spanish, as she had claimed to be, but a Black woman married to a Black man. So he fired her. Linda's racist boss may have inadvertently saved her life. Generations of working class women breathed carbon tetrachloride in factories and cleaning facilities. It didn't take a scientific study to feel the burn. But now, studies have shown that the fumes from carbon tetrachloride destroys the liver. It destroys livers so effectively that scientists now use it to test whether new liver medications will work. Their goal is to create something that does whatever the exact opposite is of what carbon tetrachloride does to the liver. At the end of her life, Audre Lorde wondered if that was how she got liver cancer. She might have lived past 58 if she had never worked there or if the company had cared enough to create safer conditions for their workers. Whether or not working at Keystone Electronics made the toxic difference in Audrey's cells, she became part of the machine. A building full of women attuned themselves to the rhythms of an assembly line. Their hands became extensions of the conveyor belt. Their eyes 
were the interface, discerning earth from earth, transforming dirt into invisible waves of electricity, echo, and sound. Between long weeks of breathing fumes and sorting crystals, Audrey would visit her father in the hospital. He was having more and more severe strokes. His heart and his brain were under extreme pressure, especially for a man in his early 50s. Audrey went to the hospital alone or with her new friend, lover and coworker, Ginger. She says, as I was getting off the elevator, I could hear his voice. He was delirious and with his deep voice was reciting the 23rd Psalm, which he used for his real estate business. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. For years, Audrey reflected on this moment. She blamed her father's strokes on his reluctance to allow himself to be vulnerable, his refusal to express his emotions. She imagined that if he had found healthier ways to process his feelings, he might have lived beyond his 50s. She felt that his continuous striving for the unattainable American dream had turned him into a machine instead of a father. Standing in his hospital room doorway, Audrey looked at Byron Lloyd, Byron Lord, through the plastic oxygen tent. He was untouchable. I had the feeling of a cosmic mistake happening, but very little emotional involvement. It was years before I could feel an emotional loss because I couldn't mourn something I never had, she said. When her father died, Audrey came home for the funeral and stayed a few days in the home that was no longer her home or her father's house. When she went back to Connecticut, she got a slight promotion at the factory. Now she worked in the reading room with an x-ray machine, measuring the electrical charge of crystals to determine which ones could be used in machines and which ones would become industrial waste. The company gave bonuses based on how many crystals the readers sorted through in a day. To make the process quicker, Audrey left the protective shield of the x-ray machine up and exposed herself to radiation. She would hide carbon tetrachloride wash crystals in her mouth and then spit them out in the bathroom to get through the pile faster. She told herself she was working to get back to school as soon as possible and to fund her trip to study in Mexico. She worked and worked and didn't visit her father's grave. She didn't know that her work at Keystone played a small part in the evolution of the machines that would beep measuring the heart rates of hospital patients a decade later. She worked the line, like her father had worked, third shift, all those late nights in the munitions factory during World War II. The Western scientists who first capitalized on the electrical power of quartz were equipping submarines in World War I. Quartz helped humans tune into what whales, dolphins, and bats already knew. Location is an echo. Quartz is both a transmitter and a receiver. Under pressure, it transforms vibration into electricity and back again at very precise frequencies. Submarine detectors use that precision, also known as sonar, to measure the distance between themselves and other submarines and to lock in missile codes. Targeted underwater explosions brought to you by quartz. The quartz oscillator in your watch vibrates at exactly 32,768 beats per second. Vibration becomes electricity, which becomes movement again. The invisible becomes measurable. Time, sound waves, radio stations, where and when you will be when you explode. Under pressure, bone does the same thing as quartz. It holds frequency and transmits electricity. On the clock, Audrey Lord measured charge after charge of pressurized quartz. The machine had to press the quartz hard enough for it to lose its internal cellular balance and become charged. Eventually, the quartz Audrey measured became the heartbeat of radios, radar machines, household objects, and industrial products. 
The quartz she spit out and flushed down the toilet returned to the ocean. Eventually, it joined the other quartz transducers and most of the grains of sand on the surface of this earth. The quartz that Audrey swallowed, that remained what it was, a latent echo of where and when, a ticking clock. On the clock, Audrey Lord swallowed microscopic quartz, dust and shards and her cells metabolized carbon tetrachloride and she suffered the imperceptible slow burn of X-ray radiation. She became even more intimately part of the machine that made piles of dirt into sound and long distance perception. The machine that made life more measurable and turned people into dust. In the science fiction version of this story, Audrey Lorde's time in the machine gave her the superpowers that transmitted her work worldwide. Yes, she could, see, she could sense the electrical charge in the people around her and use it. Yes, when she read her poems at a certain frequency, the whole room felt the energy shift. Oh, yes, her glowing face, Barbara Smith called it incandescent. In March, 1953, Audrey's supervisors suspected she was cheating on her crystal count and fired her. She went back to New York, radio active. Thank you for your listening. (laughs) And so with the rest of our time, I have a special way I like to do Q&A that I hope will be in support of this symposium's vision and mission. I wanted us to spend some time with Audre Lorde's poem, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so I made a concordance, an alphabetized concordance of it. And so this is, this is an oracle opportunity. This is an opportunity for a different kind of question than usually we ask in an academic symposium. Of course, this is no usual symposium with its um, expansive vision. And so I want, I want us to open an Audrey Lord Oracle. Is that okay with you all? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If not, as Barbara Smith said earlier, you know, this might not be a book for you and that is fine, but (laughs) that's what's about to happen. So, so the important things for an Oracle are, are three. The first is our breathing. So I am going to take six breaths. I invite you to ground yourself further in your seat or wherever it is that you are. It helps me to not have anything in my hands. And I'm gonna mark my inhale and my exhale. You can breathe along with me or you can breathe at your own pace, whatever feels right to you. Inhaling and exhaling. 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 One more time, inhaling and exhaling. Okay, our breathing, check. And the other necessary component for the oracle is dedication. So dedication is an opportunity. And, you know, we already had a beautiful invitation earlier to call on our ancestors, our our people, our creative theoretical theorists that have influenced us at the kitchen table. And I just want to invite you 
to dedicate your participation in this oracle could be for your participation in the rest of this day or the rest of this two day symposium to someone who's not in the space. So someone who is not in the room there and who that you know of is not in the uh, eCornell live stream sphere and who could be living now or could have lived before and who could be older than you or could be younger than you and who is not you. So I'm saying don't dedicate this to yourself or to a younger version of yourself. I think you already did by showing up, <laughs> dedicate this time to all ages of yourself. And yeah, we have time. Um, if you're in the room, you can say your dedication to the person next to you in a second. I'm gonna model dedication for, for you all. And I don't know if there's a chat. I was looking for a chat on the live stream thing. So I don't know if people are chatting, but if you are, you could put your dedication also into the chat. So I'm dedicating my participation today to my five-year-old niece, Mackenzie, who is, um, who is incandescent in her own way, is an energy worker for sure already, and who is, is wise and one of my favorite teachers and who I'm celebrating because she proudly told me yesterday that she has advanced to the highest reading level of whatever the reading levels are that they're using in, in, her, in her school. So uh, yeah, young reader, creative theoretical teacher of mine, Mackenzie, I'm dedicating this oracle and my presence in this moment to her. And let's just take two minutes and share who your dedication is. So if you don't have access to a chat function and you're participating virtually, just write it down. If you are in the room, just turn to your neighbor and let them know who you're dedicating to, listen to who they're dedicating to. And if you do have access to the chat, you can, you can put it on in there. Take two minutes, go. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that, those two minutes. Thank you, I did finally find the chat. Thanks to my, my partner, Sean Guadara, was like texting me <laughs> where the chat is. Thank you everybody in the chat who shared their dedication. Thank you in the room for sharing with each other. And of course, for continuing to share with each other throughout these, these couple of days. And then the other thing that's necessary for to, to activate the Oracle is your question. So like I was saying before, these are different questions than the academic questions that we usually ask. Um, it has a different purpose. It's, it's not necessarily about um, 
well, really stating our own brilliance and our specialization in a way conformed to seem like a question, which is, which is the dominant mode of what happens in academic questions. This is a question that I think of as a Lordian question. Like, this is a question that's active in your own life. And so it may be in relationship to the person that you dedicated to. It may be in relationship to what came up for you, hearing about this part of Audre Lorde's life and her work at the factory and her um, not being able to feel or process her father's death and um, whatever it is, whatever it is that is there for you, maybe ha having nothing to do with what I just shared or maybe having a lot to do with what came up for you listening. And when you ask a question and I can see the questions in the chat too, so I'm, I'm monitoring those. You can say, your question in whatever way you can say it, or it could just be an area of inquiry that you're in, in your life. And I ask you to associate it with a letter of the alphabet, because I have alphabetized this poem. And, and that's it. That's how the oracle works. It'll, if you haven't done this before, it'll become clear once one person does it. But first, to get us started, and as you think about what your Lordian question might be, Lordian question, because like, it might make your voice shake and that's good. That's wonderful. And that means it's the question for this particular moment. But I'm gonna read the whole poem, Father, Son and Holy Ghost by our beloved Audre Lorde. Father, Son and Holy Ghost. I have not ever seen my father's grave. Not that his judgment eyes have been forgotten, nor his great hands print on our evening doorknobs. One half turn each night and he would come, misty from the world's business, massive and silent as the whole day's wish, ready to redefine each of our shapes. But that now the evening doorknobs wait and do not recognize us as we pass. Each week, a different woman, regular as his one quick glass each evening, pulls up the grass his stillness grows, calling it weed. Each week, a different woman has my mother's face, and he, who time has, changeless, must be amazed, who knew and loved but one. My father died in silence, loving creation and well-defined response. He lived still judgments on familiar things and died knowing a January 15th that year, me. Lest I go into dust, I have not ever seen my father's grave. Blessed day of the Lord. And we, we get to have our questions. My Lordian question, because I believe in modeling and I believe in not asking you to do anything that I wouldn't do, <laughs> in this moment is, mm, what do I need to remember in order to honor my own father's legacy in the way, in such a way that that honoring can serve my niece, Mackenzie, my other niece, her younger sister, his grandchildren who won't know him in the way that I knew him. What do I need to remember in order to honor that? That's my Lordian question. That's an example of a Lordian question, a real live question that I don't know the answer to in my own life. And I would choose a letter, but I might, I might reserve that for later because I want to give time to Oracle responses to your questions. So um, the numbers and um, just to remind you all, choose a letter. So th this is a, sometimes there's a number oracle, this time it's a letter oracle. So choose a letter from the alphabet. The letter that you choose doesn't have to be linearly related to your question, but it could be. It could be that for that I would choose the letter, um, I would choose letter C because my, my father's name starts with a C. Okay, so we have one here in the chat. 
from Shango Dare, and it says, who are the Black queer feminists? And so in the chat, I want your questions and your letters, BTW. You can talk about your questions as vaguely as you want. You don't have to tell all your business, but I'm going to prioritize responding to ones that have a question attached to them this time. And if you would have chose the same letter, then you get to just hear that response. Okay, Shango Dari says, who are the Black queer feminists bridging Black feminism and entrepreneurship creatively? Where do I go for them? Letter F. Okay, so this is the poem for F. F. Father, Fathers forgotten from face, father familiar, 15th fathers. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, especially because I personally know Shango Dare's father. Um, my own father identified as a queer black feminist, even though he was also a, um, West Indian cis straight man. And so that's an expansive understanding of Black feminist creative entrepreneurship. But I wonder, I wonder how we could reclaim the Black feminism of our fathers. Part of the project for me of this particular biography of Audre Lorde reclaims some of the Black feminism of her father. So that's what I'll say for now on that. And folks who are in the physical room, I don't know about a microphone. I don't know exactly how you all were planning to do the in-person Q&A, but just um, let me know and do it, or I'll just keep going from, from the chat. We have a question in the room. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm just gonna keep it vague, um, but my question is, what should I be holding on to? Mm -hmm. And the letter would be R. Hmm. Letter R, okay. So this is letter R. Ready? Redefine, recognize, regular response. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you. Okay, maybe we'll alternate. So I'll do one from the chat and then whoever has the next one in the room. So Sheetal has this awesome question. How can I write fearlessly? Maybe we all have that question. <laughs> this is letter S. Sun seen silent shapes stillness. Silence still seen. Mm. I love that one because it's one, what what shapes shapes our silence, shapes our stillness, but then the reality that the silence is still seen. And I think about um, one, I think about the, the part of my own writing practice is that I write and I write and I write and I write and I don't give myself the limitation that everything I write is gonna be something that somebody sees. But I know that that process and the fearlessness that I need to have in order to do the writing that I need to do is protected by the fact that I insist that my writing is, and my writing process is valuable for its own sake. And I deserve to have the space to write even if it's really just for me to be able to to notice something or to externalize something or to process something. And then later I discern, you know, what, what should other people see? Maybe it's only one person that needs to see it. Maybe this is for my whole community, but that is um, not what I think about while I'm writing. I, I would just say that and I think it's really exciting to think about your fearless writing. Okay, the next person who's in the room. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, what are the vibrations of queer, quiet, and 
expounding um, vibrations that I should attune to. And my word is Q. Thank you. And I've been reminded to repeat the question. So what is the, what is the vibration? I hear a vibration of queer breakthrough that you should hold on to. I know I'm, I'm re-paraphrasing your question. Yeah. I hope that's true to your question. For yes, the, it is. For the repeat for the audience. Okay. And you said the letter is Q? Yes. Okay. The poem for Q is quick. That's the whole thing. So <laughs> the I really love it when there are one word oracle responses because I'm like, well, that's clear. <laughs> you know, like the, there's there's uh, that one word, quick. I think that quick in this poem is so important and it's important in Audre Lorde writes about death a lot in her poetry. It, it's important in her poems about death because she is thinking about quick in, in the sense of aliveness and the difference between the quick and the dead. That quickness is, is part of what she's working with here. His quick glass each evening. So her father, when he was alive, would drink, drink one glass of alcohol when he would come home from work in the evening. And that quick glass is connecting her to this distinction she's making between the grass, his stillness grows mm -hmm. and what his aliveness did. And the major, for me, the major um, thing that she's working through in this poem is how to relate to her father who time now holds changeless, right? While they continue to change. Mm -hmm. And so her mother continues to change and she visits the grave, but she's a different woman every time because she's continuing to age, but her father's not because he died in his early 50s and, and his story doesn't get to continue. She doesn't know how she can meet his grave, his stillness with her still quick life. So yeah, hold on to that. Hold on to that quickness Thank for you. sure. And I love the question itself. Okay, here we have in the chat, what do I need to learn to process that belong to the family I didn't know? What do I need to learn to process to belong to the family I didn't know? And this is letter G. Ghost, grave, great glass, grass grows, grave. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it makes me think about, it makes me think about Alice Walker seeking out Zora Neale Hurston's mm -hmm. resting place and yeah. putting the gravestone there. Yeah. It makes me think about what it means to continue to bring gifts and bring presents to people after they have passed away. Mm -hmm. I wonder if in relationship to this question, there could be a focus on the ancestral connection with that family that actually comes before in priority and, and potentially in time before the next stage of the relationship with the living. Thank you for that question, Camila. And another question in the room? Thank you so much. Um, my question is, how do I write with matrilineal echo? And the letter is X. Mm -hmm. Yeah, X and Z are the only letters that she didn't have any words that started with in this poem. Oh. I love that you choose X though. Um, I will say that there's this so if you remember, I was describing Audre Lorde working with the x-ray machine in the reading room and lifting the lid of it and therefore being exposed to more radiation than she would have been if she used the safety shield. And um, that in itself being an echo to the toxic working conditions and the carbon tetrachloride itself that Audre ended up putting in her mouth on those crystals being an echo of the conditions that her mother most likely had when she was working 
and dry cleaning. And so with that X and with that X-ray, because that word is not in this in the poem that we're using as Oracle, but it is in the it is in the talk that I gave. I think about that. I think about what it is to invite forms of transparency that can also be dangerous. I wonder about how I will say that my own experience is that the areas where I put myself at risk, there's the matrilineal echo. Like I can learn a lot about what those matrilineal echoes are when I find myself putting myself at risk and look at what that is and look at how the, um, or even just when I'm at risk, how those things echo systemically, but also how, um, how they are in my own journey, in my own path, portals and particular openings for matrilineal healing. Mm, well. When I can recognize them as such. So I'll, I'll say those things. And um, yeah, I don't think, I think I didn't repeat your question, but it's a beautiful question about writing with matrilineal echo, yeah. which I will also say that I don't know, I know for myself, it's not possible for me to write without matrilineal echo. <laughs> like there's just all kinds of matrilineal echo. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think I'm writing about something else and it's like, uh, no, it's still, it's still the matrilineal work that I'm doing. That's why, <laughs> that's why I'm writing about this. Um, so sometimes it's also just about recognizing how it's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we have about 12 more minutes. So I'm gonna take another question that's in the chat. And there are so many, so apologies that we won't be able to get to all of them, but this is, I'm just doing them in the order that they're here. Isabella's question, how do I allow my gifts to society to flow without judgment? That is more than a notion. Yes, 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 yes. So, the letter is C, and this is the poem for C. Oh, I switched to another document. Okay, C. Come, changeless creation. That's the poem for C. All right, <laughs> so you got, you got what you need. Um, yeah, wow, without judgment. I love that possibility. Is there another question in the room? Um, wow, I thank you. Just thank you. Um, my question is, was it worth it? Mm -hmm. And my letter is M. M, okay. This is the poem for M. The question was, was it worth it? My misty massive, my mother's must, my me, my. That's the poem for M. Thank you for that question. That's a brave question. Wow. In the chat, we have Ona with how can I let go of ownership? Letter O. On our one, of our one, one on. Hmm. I love how this question about ownership and then this response has the word our in it twice, that, that collective. And then it has the word one in it three times. And that, what if, what if it was that our one, like our one universe, our one planet? Yeah, 
that does seem to me to be a pathway beyond ownership. Thank you for that question. Another question in the room. My question is, what is the role of the witness? And my letter is B. Mm -hmm. Question is, what is the role of the witness? And letter B. Been business, but, but that's a home for B. I love the double, I love the double, but it's this alternative, um, this possibility of an alternative. witness sometimes been business but but makes me think about how it has been and business as usual and the possible interruption thank you for that question about witnessing we have this question from prince what do i need to examine to heal from the trauma rendered down by my father and from his father's father letter H, and this is such an important and brave question also. The, this is a question for, for Audre Lorde as well, because Audre Lorde, those of us who are familiar with Audre Lorde and who you know have read Zami and have read Audre Lorde's poetry know that this phrase, a new spelling of my name, recurs and is the, the subtitle of, of Zami, um, probably Audre Lorde's most read work. And one of the things I talk about in, in the biography that I'm writing is that it was actually Byron Lord, Audre Lorde's father, who first made a new spelling of their name. He added the letter E to Lord, and he did that in part to separate himself from his father. And he was very silent about what his experience was with his father. He ran away from home at a young age. And... I think about that. I think about the unknown, what is unknown in that relationship and in that choice to create a new spelling of his name in order to create distance and literal paperwork distance between Audre Lorde's father and his own father, Fitzgerald Lord. So this is letter H towards healing. Holy have his have his hands, half he, his, his, has he, has he, have. Mm. Yeah. I love, I mean, I love how Audre Lorde's poetry, like you could do anything with it and you still, you're still gonna get these powerful messages. I just think it's a testament to um, the genius of Audre Lorde's poetry, which is why I am so happy to just look at it my whole life. But this H comes to this point of his hands, this action and the impact of action is really important here, but it starts with holy, have his, have his hands and it, it does, this is something that Audre Lorde is working through with a poem, and it's also something that's really drawn out in your question, Prince, is half he, his, his, has, he, has, he, have. And have is the conjugation, it's the first person conjugation, right? And has is the third person conjugation. So what someone else has and what I have is the, is the relationship there. It's important to me that holy have starts it and then the last conjugation is have because it does bring it back to, to the first person, the possibility of impact our own hands and the presence of all that has happened and that other hands have done half he. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you for that possibility of healing. 
Is there another question in the room? Uh, my question is, how can I do the work while still holding the ones I love? And the letter is E. Mm -hmm. So the question was, how can I do the work and still hold the ones I love? And the letter is E. Ever eyes evening, each, each evening, each, each evening, each, each evening, each, ever. Audrey Lloyd does it again. Yeah, I think that that's it. And I'll, I'll say that um, one of the ways that I do the work while holding the ones I love is by calling that little munchkin I dedicated to each evening. Each, each evening. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. We have a question in the chat, how important is understanding to our spiritual health? But the letter was O, which we already offered. So that was the one with our and one and on. And we have this question, how do I honor my ancestors when my ancestors have caused harm? Very similar to the question we just did with H, but it was for the letter E, the one that we just did, right? So honoring our ancestors each, each evening, each ever. And we have a question from Lisa, where should I seek reparative roots? And the letter is W. And this is the poem for W. Wood worlds, whole wish, wait, we, weak, weed, weak, woman, who, who, well defined. The week in that poem is week like days of the week, W E E K. Where should I seek reparative roots? Mm, mm, mm. And I love how that seeking for reparation does feel very, does feel very um, present in this excerpt because of Wood World's whole wish. And then these weeds. So Audre Lorde refers to it as the grass, his stillness grows and depicts her mother tending to her father's grave as removing that because it's, it's the weeds, right? So I think too about the reparative roots or the fact that stillness grows something or the really interesting way of thinking about what are the plants that are fed by the recent the recent transformation of our dead. Thank you for that question. One more question from the room. How do we uh, avoid the toxicity and not let it destroy us as it can try to do? Mm -hmm. Was what your Lord also experienced and had to take it in? Yes. yes, how do we avoid the toxicity and not take it in with all we're moving through? And what was the letter that T into you? The letter was T. T, okay. Letter T, that turn the, the two, that, the time, things, that. So I love this poem for that question because moving through toxic space and, you know, something that Audre Lorde wrote about and was, was really the first theorist of around in, in her work, the cancer journals, was around the fact that human beings have made our entire ecosystem toxic and carcinogenic at this point. So we're moving through toxic space. We are moving through toxic space. And the way that that shows up here, that turn, the time things, that, 
makes me think about the recognition. And it's something that you all spoke about and that I can feel is a fundamental, a really founding energy of this symposium is when you feel it, right? When you're when you're in that conversation that can be communion, when what was a gra graduate seminar turns into something different where something else is possible, where more scales of our being are possible. It's like that, that, right? And the recognition to be like that um, is I think a key discernment moving through toxic space. When are we recognizing that we're in a life-giving relation that, um, moment where the goodbyes turn into a whole other conversation. It's because we recognize that we want to stay in that energy and we can discern between that energy and the energy that shuts us down and where we want to like leave as soon as possible. Right. So that's, that's what I think of in terms of navigating the toxicity. It's really cultivating our recognition of the, the that time things. Yes. Yes, yes. Speaking of time things. Okay. This will be the last question from the chat. And thank you all so much for allowing me to be myself and, and do what I love to do and just live in Audrey Lloyd with you for this, this moment of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we had a question in the chat. How do I learn to balance knowing and not knowing more gracefully, which um, is through the letter B, which we, we also already did been business but but question about not being able to breathe this person not being able to breathe when they do visit their father's grave and they had chosen the letter m which we also read my misty massive my my me my um jodine has b also what do i need to embody the truth that i have been authorized to be of our lineage Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And um, Imani Uzuri, hey, loved one, is the letter is V, the gratitude is there. V is the other letter that is not represented. I might have misspoke when I said there were two, because I guess there are three letters that are not represented in the poem. I would say, I don't know the question in your mind, and I do know your heart. V, when I think about V in the archive of this, of this research and in the context of the maternal echo that was brought up earlier, V is for volcano. V is particularly for the volcano Kikum Jenny, which is the volcano, an underwater volcano that's between Kariku and Grenada that you travel to get, you travel over to get from Grenada to Kariku, which is the journey that Audre Lorde's mother would take every summer and, and also through the years and when somebody was getting ready to give birth. And um, this idea of the underwater volcano is a whole thing. It is a whole thing. And for me, it's, it's the only way that I can describe the maternal relationship between Audre Lorde and her mother, very heated relationship. Mm like an underwater volcano. If Kikum Jenny were to erupt right now, within 20 minutes, the whole Caribbean region could be submerged. Wow. That's the power of this underwater volcano. It could cause tsunami that reached to the islands furthest from Grenada. Um, we remember that the Caribbean region is actually all volcanoes it's just that this is a volcano that's still active yeah. so v is for volcano imani and i i love you and i will end there they know there's so many more questions I, i'm grateful for the generosity of these questions i'm grateful for the generosity of this space i hope that this can move into your kitchen table conversations and the other conversations that we get to have throughout the rest of the day I love, love, love that I have been able to bring Audrey Lord to this space in this way. And I love each of you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. We love you too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
So I think we're going to break for lunch, and we ask you to join us uh, back here at 1 o'clock, and we will just start things off with, uh, with Mina Salami, Carol Boyce Davies, Thomas Glaive, and Ngugi Watiango and uh, Makoma uh, Wangugi, who will be here in person. Thank you.
Oh, speak up. Oh, yeah, but I have the other one on. So. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, okay, whichever works then. Um, but let me know when we're ready. Um, and the lantern moves. Okay, no, I'm joking, okay. <laughs> Concentration, more comma, concentrate. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Professor Mukamawa Goge. I'm a professor in the Literatures of English uh, department here. And as we talk, you'll see why that's very important. In fact, one of the highlights has been hearing first year students say, you know, they're in the Literatures of English department because of the name change from the English department. Uh, but I, I want to thank uh, Jayan and Shakoya for putting this together. You and the whole team behind Words Working Without Masters. And what a great, you know, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that, uh, but let, let me not dig digress from my, <laughs> from my remarks because <laughs> of time. <laughs> yeah, so for putting this together, uh, words, words, words Working Without Masters, Conversations on the Creative Theoretical, and of course to Carol, Professor Carol Boyce Davis, and to Professor Dirango Achanga, you know, who, who, who is the filmmaker behind the video you'll see. But I wanted to add, he's also the documentarian for Goge, the official documentarian for Goge Wadi, you know. Uh, Meshere Mogo, Ali Mazrui, Wale Shoyinka, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I'm mostly thankful for the occasion to be, an, to be in an intellectual conversation with my father. I think the last time we had one was in 2019. Um, you know, we do talk a lot. It doesn't mean we haven't talked since then. <laughs> but it's usually about familiar stuff, you know, fights here and there. You know, you know, you know how it goes, family gatherings, and so on and so forth. So, but it was great to have this space. Uh, where we could just, you know, be two intellectuals uh, in conversation. Um, so, for, for those of you who don't know Professor Goge, uh, he's better known as my father. Okay, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, he's, he's, he's one of Africa's leading uh, theorists, uh, pract practitioners, actually, of this, uh, of, of this gathering. Um, you know, and one of the questions I asked him was, what has been the cost of being a, 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 a theoretician uh, who is also a practitioner, who is also a scholar, I mean, who has refused the, the, the sort of boundaries we are breaking here today. And, you know, uh, you know part of it is that, um, you know, he was uh, detained by the Kenyatta government for writing in Gekoyo, right? Mm -hmm. Consequently, he was sent into political exile because of his, uh, because of his political writing. And he didn't, his exile didn't end until the year 2004 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. So, so there, there is a cost that, uh, to the work we do here. Um, oh yeah, so, and before we changed our department's name here from English Department to Literatures of English, uh, they had started, they had done that uh, in the 1960s in Nairobi University at the height of decolonization, right? The contradiction of, we are decolonizing <laughs> we're in an English department, right? Sometimes when we talk, we laugh because some of these things are so ridiculous, right? Uh, when you think about them. Um, but what I loved about the conversation you're about to see is seeing him, you know, because I know him, he's seen ideas crystallize in his own head, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so the idea that crystallized for him as he was talking was the concept of from here to there, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I don't know if you'll see it in the video, you can see him realizing, oh, that's what I've been doing all these years, I've just been moving from here to there, right? You know, so, and he talks about uh, the movement and the, the department's name change as moving from here to there, moving from our set, center in African literature and then moving outwards, right? Uh, Center in African languages, uh, decolonizing the mind, global ethics. So he can organize all that under, or I could see him thinking he can organize it, you know, under from here to there. Um, but I wanted to highlight four things, and then we can, you know, we can we can watch. Uh, again, organized around the idea from here to there. Uh, that at least from from my perspective or his perspective, actually it should be everybody's perspective, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> Uh, African languages should be at the center of African literature. You know, it, it, and it, I'll give you an example of how ridiculous it gets, you know, that you have to do an acrobatics when, of saying, oh, I mean African literature in African languages, you know, because African literature stands for European, Europhone languages, and so on and so forth. Um, the other one is African literary criticism in African languages, right? We can't, we can't be talking about creating African literature. You know, actually, as we do with the Kiswahili Prize, where you know we publish winning books in Kiswahili, but without the symbiotic relationship to literary criticism, so literary criticism in African languages, 
uh, African concept. This is a pet peeve for me, actually, I should add. African, African, um, African concepts to read African literature, right? You know, yeah, so now, this is some of the things that start making me laugh. Like, where would we be talking about, uh, you know, I don't know, hybridity in things fall apart when you can use Igbo cosmology, right? Mm -hmm. Or why should we be talking about, uh, I don't know, intestacies and so on and so forth? Uh, to, to, to talk about less or Shoinka's work when you can use the fourth stage. Which, so in other words, shouldn't the, shouldn't the cultures that's producing these literatures also create the concepts to be used, right? And I'll give you a quick one, hopefully I'm not using, using too much time. So amongst the Koyo, there's a concept of, uh, of Itweka, which means revolution or break, right? And if, if you read Goges, Goges uh, to bring everything back together, <laughs> if you read Goges, uh, a grain of wheat, it's about revolution, right? So, and I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with Marxism. In fact, you could argue that's, that my ideological leanings are towards that side. But why should we first go to Marxism and then come back to read a grain of wheat when indeed we can use it to eka, right? And grade as a concept and so on and so forth. And we can talk about that uh, later. Uh, yeah, so, and uh, we, later we can talk about Jalada, you know, which is uh, this magazine that was started by young, by young African scholars and writers, right, where they took a story written by Goge, written in Gekoyo, he translated into English, and now it's been translated into over 100, uh, 100 languages, most of them African. So here, if you wanted to add to his theory, it's from here to there and back, right? <laughs> you know, and you can keep adding that. Uh, but finally, I'd like to, to claim that African writers uh, are born in the crucible of the creative theoretical, right? And uh, you can mention any of them, Amata Idu, Nawal El Sadawi, Goge, Achebe, and the list goes on. Uh, in fact, when you listen to, uh, or rather when you read the early transition journals in the 1960s, right, it's really a practice of that movement of the creative theoretical. So for my own personal example, it, 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 I literally, it literally never occurred to me <laughs> that I could just write fiction or poetry or pure, or pure theory. And one of, my, one of my enduring memories was when I was coming up for tenure, you know, and the question came up uh, whether my fiction should count. I, I don't know, like I, my mind couldn't, I, I just couldn't comprehend it. <laughs> it was so outside my radar. Uh, but anyway, okay, so now for the video. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> What I like, yeah, yeah, I write what I like, yeah, yeah. So, so I say, I write, what I like, what I like, yeah, yeah. So, so I live saying, I write, yeah, what I want to, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, I do creative writing. I do creative writing, I do fiction, mm. I do short stories, you know, uh, but at the same time, I do, you know, uh, the other kind of writing, which is, you know, theoretical, even journalistic, I've done all that, you know. Mm. Um, but what I found in me uh, mm. is still the narrative element is very important for me. Um, in whether fiction, short mm. story, or for that matter, my theoretical work. Huh? Mm. You read uh, a book like Decolonizing the Mind, for reasons, you know, um, mm. it's full of personal narratives, but theoretical, mm. you know, uh, at the same time, right? And my, uh, most of my work is uh, mm. like that. It's, is narrative analytical, mm -hmm. maybe for in a word, narrow analytical. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just coin words on demand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, 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 let's say, what did um, decolonizing the mind or global, uh, global ethics do, right? The lesser wizard of the crowd did not do, right? Or Guy Kadeda, like what, what's, would the form itself you're using, how, how does it change? You know, like so, how, so, how, how does it work so, differently? With a, with a, with a, you, an, you make an argument. Okay, mm. let me, I think this difference with a uh, theoretical work or not. I'm making an argument uh, mm. consciously, okay? Mm. I'm structuring as an argument, 
like you, you and I are arguing, or I'm seeing like a convince you, uh, and I, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's the main What has with the creative writer? I'm think I'm, I'm fascinated with the story itself, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, or poems. I'm interested how almost like a poem, one line leads to another it's just another right right mm -hmm. you don't sit down and just think and think and think and then uh, it's like one image leads to another uh, mm -hmm. right you know whereas um with no i'm thinking how to structure that as an argument say i see what i'm arguing with you okay mm -hmm. so i'm putting my facts and argument uh, in a certain way to persuade you in an argument or in an argument. Um, mm. Yeah. But with uh, <laughs> with critical writing, I'm trying to draw the, the reader into my world. If there's an argument, he or she will catch it along the way. Eh? Mm. Mm. Yeah. In other words, when they come to a critical piece of writing, what they are, the reader is interested in is the story itself. Eh? For mm. instance, if you preach in a critical piece of writing, people will be very bored. No matter how, no matter how, what clever things mm -hmm. you might be saying, eh? right? You cannot write a fiction and put the reader there. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Part of the fiction, yeah. Unless as a character. Yeah. So um, I, I think primarily you'll be speaking with um, all the people who'll be listening. It will be from the universities or and so on and so forth. Mm. And uh, specifically, I'm thinking in terms of uh, having changed the department's name here from the English department to uh, to Department of Literatures in English. So, but can you talk about your own processes and 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 then and then later I'll ask you what are the costs of the work you do, right? Uh, but for but, now, let me. If you come back to the for if, just come back to the other one. The problem uh, with creative writing for I had to be as concrete mm, mm -hmm. as possible. So, uh, concrete is the key because I must draw a picture. Huh? Mm -hmm. I must make the reader see, feel, touch. Okay, mm -hmm. I people. All their senses, mm -hmm. okay. You know, uh, I wanted to argue them into a position, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. with their, uh, but with their non-creative, I'm trying to persuade them with an argument. The only thing which I like to make here is that today I find the critical language very. Uh, there's too much. No, when I write the critical, I like to also be as simple, simple as I can. Not, a, not simple, but I want to the idea to quite understand, to follow what I'm saying. They may disagree with me or mm -hmm. agree with me, but I don't want to read goes I, I, my listen to go about as what was he really saying. <laughs> What do you think he meant yeah. by this, you know? Yeah, so um, density of language can often mean, uh, not always, but can mm -hmm. often mean, you know, uh, a little bit of, uh, <laughs> well, what it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it no, no, I'm, you know, when you yeah, put it I'm thinking of <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm thinking of reading Derrida and, you know, both as an undergrad and, uh, and, and later not understanding what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at some point, there was this argument between Noam Chomsky and I think Foucault, where Noam Chomsky said, you know, if I've been in the field for so many years. If I don't understand what you're saying, surely it's not my fault, right? But, 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 the, but the idea being that, uh, you know, even doctor to doctor, you know, physicist to physicist, you know, they, they, should, they should understand each other, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that kind of language sometimes can obscure mm. thought, huh? mm -hmm. right? It was clouded with 
word density of form huh? yeah but not density of ideas right mm -hmm. you know um, i want you when i write you have to go i want the reader to actually hear what i am saying they may disagree or agree or even say that's nonsense eh? mm. but not because they did not hear or what i was saying for instance people ask me about global ethics okay so global may sound very a bit heavy and it's a bit heavy because it's coined term you know uh I call a combination of global and yeah. dialectics, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I tell people, for me, global act is just an expansion of the notion of here to there, eh? mm -hmm. right? There to here, you know, uh, like a here to there in a dialectical progression mm -hmm. of mutual elimination. Because they help each other. That's what I like. I want people to be passionate when they read the calling. I want them passionate about what I'm saying, whether they agree with it or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, the other question you asked. Uh, uh, yeah, it's around the colonization and our, our departmental name change here. But um, oh, oh, yes. Maybe I'll a little bit about your process. Uh, yeah. Again, mm -hmm. the department change. Remember, even the notion of here, from here to there, in a way started when we were trying to reorganize mm -hmm. the, oh, the teaching of literature at the University of Nairobi. Yeah. Remember before that, when I came to the department, I found that the literature really that we were learning was actually English national literature from mm -hmm. a, as as you say, you'd say from uh spencer <laughs> from shakespeare to the friend <laughs> yes elliot kind of kind of thing yeah mm -hmm. and there's nothing there's nothing wrong you know um with those writers they are very rich in ideas mm -hmm. and other things you know uh, but but they are also writers in africa right mm -hmm. Why not start from you know Africa outwards? Mm -hmm. That's all we were doing. Mm -hmm. With English literature is fine, French literature is fine, but what about, what about if you begin with African literature and then connect outwards, so to speak? Mm -hmm. So we said African literature at the center of the syllabus, Caribbean literature. African literature, Latin American, Asian literature, and then European literature in that order. Mm -hmm. I want to make very clear, we were not dismissing European literature because mm -hmm. it's very rich, okay, right? But the order of learning is very, very important mm -hmm. because the order of learning, it was colonial order, you know, is what I call them. The 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 the, the, uh, the the cognitive process of the colonial system is to make people always start with that which is farthest removed from themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the imperial centers become the beginning of knowledge system, and it's not true. Actually, the colonial order of education, most of which still prevails in the world today is one which takes away um, the cognitive process from here to there and turns it into there first and then here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I must travel there to somehow see myself. Yeah. But the normal cognitive process is always, always from wherever you are to elsewhere, right? Yeah. And the two movement go on eliminating each other because the more you know where you are the more you can the far, you can now from where you are you can go further and the further you go it can help to look back on where you you were and then you go on eliminating each other 
Yeah. Okay. Oh, the, I don't know if we have time. Oh, four questions. We have okay. Five minutes to go. Yeah, yeah. but maybe mm. a microphone. If there are any questions from the audience, or oh, you, you might. <laughs> yeah, I have it. Yep. Yeah. Any question from the audience? Or, yeah? Yes, there's one over there. That's a tough question. <laughs> um, you want to repeat? Oh, okay. Oh, I, I, actually, that's even better. I have time to think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I essentially asked um, in conversation, and I know like it was mentioned about how a lot of people use a lot of words, and that adds density and not much thought to questions or just comments. I feel like I've seen that at Cornell through inaccessible language. So at your time at Cornell as a professor, how have you seen mm. that? Um, and how do you see if that has been a barrier to, I guess, the diaspora throughout? It's still tough. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay, okay, let me know. It's, it's we have five minutes. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I said you, you see the language here all the time, right? You know, from scholars, you know, um, but also black scholars, right? You know, because that's how we are trained, right? Um, you know, like, I, I, yeah, you know, I, I went to college in the 1990s, and that, that was the height of deconstructionism. You know, and we're expected to use that language, but at some point, uh, at some point, you have to refuse to use it at the risk of being seen less scholarly, right? But, but, we, but for us, we are coming from a liberationist, right? A liberationist tradition, right? You know, so why, why, why would you, let's say, um, go to, I don't know, a church and speak Derridian, right? <laughs> you know, or go to an activist march and so on and so forth. So, so, but, but the idea of translation, though, right? Uh, I, I, I think in my own head, deconstructionism was useful, actually, in terms of, I don't know, master narratives, blah, 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 right? Uh, but we have to do that sort of translation. But then there's the other one we can do, which is in, the one I was mentioning, at least from the African side, where we can use African concepts, you know, to read, um, you know, to read African literature. For example, from here to there in Gekoyo simply is Kumahago Diharia, right? And if you tell somebody that, they will immediately get it, right? You know, so, yeah, so I, 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 I'm all for accessibility, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have to move to another session. There's another question in the back, right? Okay, we'll take that one, and then we'll move to the next session. Mm -hmm. Hi, and thank you for this session. My question is, um, I believe knowledge production precedes literature, and... Um, I would even argue that theorizing precedes what we have in literature. Mm -hmm. In your work, how have you included mm -hmm. these other modes of knowledge production that it seems mm -hmm. um, the academy doesn't quite recognize? Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, how have you in your work done yeah, that? Yeah, so I mean, I'm primarily a writer, right? I'm primarily a writer and scholar, so, but I can answer that in terms of what I do with my own fiction. So for example, I write detective fiction, right? which of course was looked down upon, you know, when I started out, it was seen as less scholarly, right? Um, I use a lot of music as well, right? You know, so for example, my latest novel, I'm Very Our Dead with Song, is all about musicians who are in a quest for the best. It's a form of Ethiopian music called Tizita, right? So, so it's, it's also what you do with the form you have, right? Yeah, but, but, but certainly there are so many modes of knowledge production, and I believe actually intellectuals are the problem, right? You know, because if you're, if you're a musician, you'll sing in your language, right? If you're a newspaper editor or you're studying a newspaper, you lose the language that people, that people are using. They, 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 okay, let me, let me leave you with one thing because of time. Uh, I was in Lemuru as a visiting professor, which is my hometown, you know, at a Catholic university. And in there, they had a Bible translation center, right? So when I was talking with one of the fathers there, and he said that for them, they move from the principle that God can, can come and speak to you in, uh, in French or Latin, right? <laughs> if God wants to speak to you, he's, he'll speak to you in the language that you speak. Mm. So, yeah, again, from here to there, right? Yeah. I guess that will become the phrase now for everything I say. <laughs> no, no, but thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, for the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Let me collect my Thank words. Thank you, Makoma. This is amazing. What you witnessed a little bit of history because 
you have this father-son conversation that took place, but writer-writer, different generations, different locations, all made possible by the technology that we work with now. So one of the limitations, of course, is distance, but one of the positive aspects is that we can do a lot more with curating different kinds of engagements. And again, we are grateful for this opportunity. So the next phase of this includes Mina Salami, who was one of the um, black feminist theories we read in Black Feminist Theories. Her book is called Sensuous Knowledge, a black feminist approach. There she is for everyone. And the other person is Thomas Glave, who is an author of, actually a professor at Binghamton State University. Um, and he has written books including Whose Song and Other Stories, The Torturer's Wife, uh, words to our now, which many of my students read, particularly the, the, the letter Jamaica Shame. He's really good at those public letters to prime ministers. To, he wrote one to Cornell, actually, um, and the faculty of the male faculty of Africana at a horrible incident that happened at, in our department uh, <laughs> just before he gave a talk <laughs> at Cornell. Um, and also the editor of Our Caribbean, a gathering of lesbian and gay writing from the Antilles. So what I've asked them to do is for five minutes just talk a little bit about how the theme of this engagement uh, that the students have organized um, is interpreted from their lens. So I'll begin with Mina Salami, uh, and then I'll come to you, Thomas. Go ahead, Mina. Welcome, and it's a pleasure seeing you, finally. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, indeed, I can see you. Um, you're you're a sort of miniature, but you are still a, a very. It's a very huge honor for me to, to be sharing this space with you. Um, I, thank you to all of you, to Professor Boyce Davis, to Shakoya, Jahan. Um, I'm slightly overwhelmed to be here, but I'm I'm just mainly very very happy to be able to um, share with. A community like this that is focused on the creative theoretical um yeah it's it's a huge honor um i my presentation is about 10 minutes so i hope that that will be okay but if i need to be cut off then please please do um so i wanted to start with a sanskrit word drishti is the word and it translates to something like vision beyond the literal in yoga practice, the word drishti is used as a way to hold attention to a specific part of the body, such as the third eye or the tip of the nose or the, the right index finger. And what that does is help to develop flow in the practice, but also uh, a kind of inner um, illumination. Um, and the idea is that when you focus on um, a specific, on something specific, you also oddly end up enhancing the whole. Um, so you, you experience subjectivity and passion at the same time. The concept, I, I wanted to start with it because it strikes me as um, useful, not only in yoga practice, but also as a way to think about knowledge production and the creative theoretical, um, because creativity, as I understand it, in my view, is um, it's, it's quite much about the singular, about that kind of honing in on something that we are fascinated with. Um, but we live in a culture that encourages our, a, a kind of fragmentation of the mind and, and a, a constant multitasking, which makes creativity very difficult. And yet the point of knowledge production should be to equip people with vision beyond the literal, or to put it differently, to equip people with, with clarity. And especially for communities that have been excluded from epistemic traditions or who have been indoctrinated to think about um, themselves in the world in particular ways, um, this vision beyond the literal is especially important. Um, I, I really liked what it said in the synopsis for uh, the event uh, that, you know, theory is can be generative and creativity can be critical. But that is not um, how we conventionally approach knowledge production. Rather than vision beyond the literal, the typical approach is uh, to produce vision 
that is about the literal. So if something is a little bit unruly or awe-inspiring, we force it into, uh, you know, formulaic processes and systematic data-driven uh, inquiry. In my book, Sensuous Knowledge, uh, A Black Feminist Approach for Everyone, I refer to this mechanical approach that impacts knowledge production so widely as Europatriarchal knowledge. It is an epistemology that is also male-centric and Eurocentric, um, and it seeks to uh, robotize and domesticate women, people of color, and indigenous communities, as well as the more than human world. But today, I, I don't want to direct, excuse me, I don't want to direct all of my criticism toward Europatriarchal knowledge and the systemized uh, arrogance that it perpetuates through its ideologies of racism, sexism, classism, and so on. I, I feel a sense of urgency to the work that we're doing today. Um, I'm joining you from, from Nigeria, from Lagos, Nigeria. And just earlier today, I was speaking with a woman who had been um, kidnapped, um, just rather sort of, she, she relayed the story back to me as a kind of almost casual um, occurrence in her day. And she had been kidnapped and then bribed for the equivalent of about $150 or so. Um, of course, our times are also shaped by surveillance capitalism, by a pandemic, by, you know, this potential of a world war that we faced and inequalities um, uh, that cause a lot of suffering. And people are seeking uh, answers desperately, and yet they are uh, very seldom able to satiate uh, their, their pressing concerns. It feels to me like it would be uh, too easy to rehash arguments about the obvious um, male and white supremacy that, that chokes our creative flames. Or perhaps it just seems easy because um, I've been invited to join a community like this, which uh, consists of brilliant minds and, and hearts and souls, uh, people who are um, already very well aware of this, this fire of Europatriarchal knowledge. And so instead, I wanted to explore why um, the schools of thought that we ourselves shape and are engaged in, um, and which indeed have, have for a long time sought to disrupt uh, robotic and biased approaches to knowledge, still aren't producing vision that is beyond the literal or, or, or drishti. I'm thinking of schools of thought such as feminist theory uh, and especially black and women of color feminisms, critical race theory and other radical epistemic traditions. Because despite that these fields have, have troubled the rigidity in academic work with alternative epistemological and ontological positions, we're here today because we are still seeking language, which is radical and generative at the same time. And I think that part of the problem um, of, these, of these fields of study, which by the way is also part of what makes them so progressive and radical, but part of the problem is uh, that they are shaped by political theories, uh, which uh, Ngugiwe Tiongo also alluded to, um, such as, uh, constructivism and, and post-structuralism, um, which have given us concepts such as situatedness and lived experience and, and social constructs. Um, and, and those in return help us to, have helped us to understand that political action is um, informed by norms and ideas and beliefs that we hold and our identities. I'm not critiquing um, these fields of thought um, just to be clear, I'm not critiquing um, the political theories even, such as constructivism and post-structuralism, um, or any of these brilliant concepts, which have been really and truly gifts um, for us to, to resist. Um, these are the, 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 the fields of study, the, the, the political homes and the intellectual homes uh, for my work as well. 
What I am critiquing is one of the legacies of these schools of thought, which is, and, and this, this is a bit complicated, um, so I hope I can express it um, in the best way as I'm working through it myself. Um, but one of the legacies is the, the belief that uh, troubling social constructs, theorizing lived experiences, we rightly do as a means of political intervention, um, is also necessarily a creative act. Um, and we end up with a kind of formula for disruption, which is useful for political aims, but not necessarily for creativity. And as we, as we aim to, to expand um, and understand the creative theoretical, it is important that we untangle our perception of creativity from our perception of disruption, uh, especially within uh, academic discourse, not in order to create any kind of hierarchy between these two, um, between creativity and disruption, but to make a distinction um, in which there is more freedom for creativity. Because um, disruption can, of course, lead to, dis to, to creativity, but it doesn't necessarily do that. Um, we may talk about, to give some other conceptual um, uh, spaces that are seen as creative quite often. So we may talk about things like uh, decolonial heteronormativity or epistemic violence. Um, these are not necessarily creative endeavors, endeavors while they are um, disruptively, politically disruptive endeavors. Um, and if we believe that disrupting language is synonymous with creativity, then those of us, um, you know, uh, radical public intellectuals, artists, scholars, activists, and so on, um, we become confused and despairing in the instances that it doesn't feel creative when we are disrupting knowledge or language. So, um, in short, disruption is not always creative, but true creativity is always disruptive because creativity is more, in, it's, it's more concerned with understanding reality, whereas disruption is, uh, is informed by political aims. Um, in my favorite James Baldwin essay, which is titled The Creative Process, um, if it is possible to, to choose a favorite um, Baldwin essay, they're also good. Um, but he writes there that the creative or the artist, um, the, the, the role of the artist is to correct the delusions of society. And therefore, um, Baldwin argues that uh, societies have always battled with the incorrigible disturber of the piece, who is the artist. If it's true that creativity is in the Baldwin um, sense, then we have to really get to the bottom of what creativity is. And it seems clear to me then that creativity is not only writing and speaking, but also, of course, you know, crafting and dancing and singing and painting and all of these things. And, and that is why black feminism um, has always especially been championing what we now may refer to as the creative theoretical. It is always uh, within black feminism, we have always sought a holistic language through which we can, we can be free and, and through which we can cultivate an attitude of freedom. Hey, can we put a and this was there and then we'll come back at it again just to give the other person a chance. And this is a good place to stop, I thought, and then we'll come back at it. So let's go, if you don't mind, to Thomas Glaive, um, and then we'll come back. Thank you, Thomas. Hi. Sure. And you may start, Thomas. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Jihan Shikoya. Thank you, Professor Boyce Davies. I'm going to barrel right through because time is short. <clears throat> Sorry. So let me just position myself very quickly. I'm a Jamaican-American gay man possessed of two nationalities, Jamaican and U.S., living for the past eight years in Birmingham, England, from which I'm speaking to you right now, so from the very heart of England, and if in a way you might say one of the hearts of the British Empire, right? And some of my work, I write fiction and creative nonfiction, what some people call um, literary nonfiction. And I think that for my purposes as a practitioner of 
uh, fiction and, and creative nonfiction, the word, the, the word theoretical, although it intrigues me and it intrigues me in the, in the work of my scholarly colleagues, is uh, a word that I choose to replace with uh, the phrase detective work. I think of myself as a detective trying to get answers to and deepen the answers to questions. I'm going to just start with the, the first thing I was really intrigued by years ago, Toni Morrison's experiment with not only Paradise, but also her earlier short story from decades ago, Recitatif, I think it's, pronou it's pronounced, when she removed all the racial markers from the narratives and put the weight of guessing about race, if you will, upon the reader, thereby forcing us to question ourselves as to why race was to know, right? And I thought, what if I try to take this a little further for myself as a fiction writer, and I posit this, this um, construction in a short story in which I have two men who are intimate lovers, partners, who are clearly, it seems, in love with each other, strongly erotically attracted to each other, have a very rich sexual life, and yet that sexual, intimate, and erotic and romantic life is based very much upon their attraction to each other because of their differ their different races and colors, but also a repulsion for those races and colors, if you will. But the race and color of each is never named or identified in the story. And I'm going to read a little bit from this right now to you. I've long been intrigued by what this might mean if one finds oneself in such a situation. So their names actually Jonathan and David. I'll just read this short section. And oh my God, I thought, I'm really kneeling on my knees in front of one of them. But it's David, I thought, not just, no, but that skin, I thought, and that smell, that hair and those lips. I was kneeling, but I closed my eyes because I didn't want to see, but yes, I want to see. But no, I heard him groaning and calling out my name, but no, I felt his hand on the back of my head. But the whole time that I was kneeling in front of him, all that I could think, even while swallowing him, especially while swallowing him and tasting him, Jesus Christ, tasting all of him, but I'll never tell anyone about this. Yes, no avoiding it. All I could think of as I was swallowing and breathing in and out with my eyes closed was that one of them was actually in my mouth, actually in it, all the way back in my throat, as I tried, tried really hard not to gag. So that rather, <laughs> I suppose, explicit um, fiction really brought me to think about what does it mean when um, one lives in a society in which not only is so much determined by race, but race can actually, racism and race can also be fetishizing and eroticizing factors in life problematic at the same time, right? So that was some of the fiction. A second piece of fiction from which I'm not going to read, but which I'll just briefly discuss, is the torturer's wife story. That is the title story of that book, which that, story, that first fiction appears. And what I was gesturing, trying to work out with this piece was, what might it mean to live right beside atrocity, to live in the face, in, in the proximity to great evil, and yet not necessarily have any agency in preventing it? And I think this is a very relevant question for the time in which we're living right now, right? Um, and so the woman's story, The Torturer's Wife, as I wrestle with this question, is trying to figure out what do I do when I'm married to this man who loves me, who is the father of my children, who is a good provider, et cetera, et cetera, and yet systematically tortures people and has people tortured and killed in the regime that he controls, right? A really interesting question for a fiction writer in thinking about detective work and perhaps theorizing. I'm going to close with talking about uh, Professor Boyce, as I alluded to my uh, penchant for writing letters. Um, last year, I wrote uh, a new piece, which was published uh, in London in a literary journal, which I'll be including in a new book of uh, creative nonfiction. This piece is titled A Reminder Letter to England. And it came about when, um, after the um, January 6, 2021 insurrection, I was fascinated by noticing how many people in Britain here were making deeply, appropriately disparaging remarks about the insurrectionists, but also about Americans in general, and saying about, oh, these Americans are so racist and so on and bigoted. And I thought, yes, yes exactly. But what about the, right? <laughs> and aren't you all actually the inventors of white supremacy? And didn't it sort of start on these very shores and so on? And um, the more that I thought about it, I thought, let me try to address this a bit, particularly living with Boris Johnson's Tory government. 
So this is just one paragraph toward the end as, as a reminder letter to England, harking back to the 2016 and the 2020 elections in the United States. Those Americans, yes, they are always so racist, you have said, England, and so bigoted. And the fact that so many of them unfortunately voted for the orange-faced horror in 2016 and then, fortunately without success, in 2020 served well to underscore your points. Oh, I should say, by the way, I'm not going to use the, the, the uh, vulgar word that Donald Trump used for women's genitalia, but I will refer to it in this piece, right? Um, they even voted for him, many women and men alike, after his egregiously disgusting 2016 grab by the remark, referring to his own grotesque attitude towards and practices with women. You, of course, England, have been grabbing women and dark women especially mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. centuries and doing far worse things to them. As one could say, my very own skin color and the varying colors of others you've encountered and grabbed up and down through the past few centuries suggests. But still, as the French are so often inclined to do, and the Dutch, and the Spanish, and the Italians, and the Portuguese, and in fact, as just about every European nation does, continue blaming the savages, those Americans across the sea, England. Blame them for their flaming crosses, for their white hoods, for their grisly and sometimes scorched tree hanging strange fruit blame them for their caged children for their regular deadly shoot 'em ups for their millenarian fantasies and their conspiracy dreams blame them for their messianic crusades and their indefatigable hatred of perceived yellowness do criticize them and do deplore them england for they are deeply benighted and very guilty those americans and worse yet Many of them appear to savor their guilt, especially in this arguably post-orange-faced era. But again, remember England, that your loathing of their, bar of their barbarism becomes both more credible and in fact braver if you look up from that cup of Ceylon tea sweetened with Tate and Lyle sugar to acknowledge your own innumerable atrocities and evil as both source and inspiration. Mm. I just wish that I'll leave you at the end now with just a Jamaican proverb. I grew up with Jamaican proverbs, fortunately the feet of my grandparents when I was a child in Jamaica. I wish so much that the British 400 years ago had thought of this proverb if they'd known it at the time that I think just speaks volumes on in terms of necessary wisdom. In Patwa, Jamaican Patwa, it would be, Gort hafenoe big and batty hole before him swallowed Paris seed. A goat should know the size of its rectum before it swallows an avocado seed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I'm still not used to seeing you with, with no hair or low hair. <laughs> it's a different thing. So we have time. We have time again. We never have enough time. But we have time for maybe a couple of questions again, I think from the audience, because I don't know who is monitoring the chat. So question from the audience, please, anybody? We have about six minutes, and we will still be on time. Or okay. Ish, yeah. <laughs> right. Question for Mina, you can bring Mina up as well, if, if you can bring both um, up for questions for Mina Salami. And, well, I can ask Mina a question. So Mina, when you, um, in your book, we were taken by the fact that you deliberately took categories like beauty, knowledge, um, sisterhood, um, and let those be um, liberation, decolonization, and let those be your chapter titles. And then you went into it using a range of sources, theoretical ones like Hannah Arendt and others. Um, creative ones to your grandmother and her Adi Ray making and all of those things. So if you can probably tell us what, what you were, what was the intent from your point of view in terms of this framing of how our students are thinking through these creative theoretical models? Well, um, thank you for the question. I, 
Um, I mean, partly related actually to, to what I was speaking about. I, I, I wanted to be disruptive. So in, in so far as uh, those were the, the titles of the chapters, um, I, I saw this book as sort of, uh, you know, disrupting a, a tradition of, of essay writing um, by, you know, very important white men who can write about topics that are sort of intrinsic to philosophical inquiry, such as liberation and beauty and knowledge and identity and things like that. Um, and I wanted to, to look at those topics um, from a Africa-centered and a woman-centered prism rather than the, the male-centered, uh, Euro European-centered um, uh, uh, paradigm that we typically see them through. Um, but it wasn't as, I mean, that almost makes it sound mechanical. I was, um, I just really was interested in describing my reality. And, and that was what sensuous knowledge, um, you know, at large is, is really about. It's, um, you know, it's insisting that uh, things, there aren't these binaries and these distinctions between uh, like the political and the aesthetic or the creative and the theoretical um, or, or storytelling and academic studies. So when I, uh, you know, just as a, as a human being who, who happens to have been in Africa and in Europe and, and comes from many parts of the world, uh, and just my own personal interest, when I, when I started to think about something like beauty um, or power, I was um, influenced by by the kind of pluralism um, and hybridity of my own of my own experiences and and experiences of of others whom I know who are in my networks or whose whose work I have read and studied and learned a lot from. Wonderful. I think we have time for one more question in the audience. Anybody? No. no? Okay. Anything else? No. So Thomas, perhaps? Oh. Yeah. Oh, there's one. Go ahead, Shakoya. Hi, Mina. I hope you're well. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to ask you a quick question around your theorizing around exousience, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, we were really taken with that terminology in our Black Feminist Theories class, and I would love to just hear you speak more about it, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. So nice to meet you. <laughs> um, yeah, exusions, um, that's how I pronounce it, but, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, it was, it, it really was a process of um, being in a creative theoretical space. So um, I think the chap, exusions was coined in the chapter about power. And that was actually, if I had to choose, that's, that's the chapter that means the most to me, because that is, because power is the concept that shapes the spaces belong to so feminism uh, you know the radical black traditions pan-africanism we are all uh, you know, if there's one one notion that we're really grappling with i would say it is power and yet over the decade or so that i've been speaking and you know engaging with this these spaces i i found that um typically even while we were uh, you know criticizing the power structures um our understanding of power was still so uh, you know, derivative of uh, Europatriarchal definitions of power. So seeing power as synonymous with violence and authority and all of that kind of thing. And so as I was working on, on that chapter and, and seeking a, an alternative um, and creative uh, way of, of redefining and reimagining power, um, I guess it just so happened that I was also, um, one of my obsessions at the time was uh, going to rivers. And it has always been water as my element. Um, but at the time, I, I happened to travel to places where there was always a river. Um, and I would just observe the river. And eventually, I felt like I was having a, a kind of communication um, with rivers. Um, I would also watch loads of, like, videos on YouTube of just, you know, you could just watch rivers flowing for hours, if you want, on YouTube, which was great. Um, and I had read about the ancient Greek word for power, which is exousia. And so the, the kind of combination of, of these three things um, was what led that. Okay, wonderful. One for okay, one for Fred. You want to read it then? Sure. Okay. There's one for Professor Glaive on the chat. So Ronald Cummings asks, 
Thomas has mostly published short fiction. I wondered if he had a specific if he had specific thoughts about the potential of the short story as tool and or genre for creative slash critical work and practice. Maybe repeat. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. Um, I, I, have, I publish short fiction. Um, yes, that's true. And I'm actually working on long fiction now and fiction, nonfiction. Uh, the, the, the short story as, can you repeat the last bit of the question? Wondered if he had specific thoughts about the potential of the short story as tool and or genre for creative slash critical work and practice. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, okay, right. I think that the short story has, has existed as exactly that, a tool for all kinds of, of powerful practice, intellectual, political, et cetera, um, across different races and colors and nations and times. Because uh, it's it's narrative, isn't it? It's storytelling and it's sharing people's experiences. If we're open, some stories are much more political than others. Uh, uh, if thinking about political in the sense here of um, um, work that um, really seeks to engage, to critique, and really truthfully analyze the society out of which it comes, let's say, or the world at large, right? But I think absolutely um, there's a great power and potential in the story. I think potential has actually already been realized. It was realized more than 100 years ago, more than 200 years ago, but it's still being done today. Um, but I think it becomes, that potential becomes more elusive in particular corners of publishing, where the more political and the more politically urgent um, sort of fiction that can emerge from people living in particularly desperate circumstances is not always welcome because it might not be marketable at the particular time, right? And this is a particular problem, I think, in the global north and in places like the United Kingdom and um, the United States, where there's a plethora of fiction, um, but not necessarily a, a, a vast amount of interest in 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 the um, really urgently political work that some people are doing. If you think about writers from Palestine, for example, and writers from um, black writers from South Africa um, now still, and people uh, writing from uh, the so-called fourth world. Um, so let's say, for example, um, uh, parts of Antarctica. Et people from China um, who are writing uh, dissidents, who are writing fiction, that may not necessarily always be as widely marketable as the work of other people who are more mainstream writers. So it's a, the, the, the marketplace comes into your question is what I'm trying to say, the marketplace that, that we have to contend with as writers and readers. Does that speak to your question? Or to, is that Ronald Cummings? Thank you. Thank you, and that was, the, yeah. And that was um, Ronald Cummings from Canada who, who was asking that question. That's really amazing. So we want to thank Professor Makoma Wangugi and Gugi Wathiongo, Thomas Clay, and Mina Salami for a really wonderful discussion with you. Enjoy. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Just four minutes over. <laughs> Not bad at all. So I'm going to go to my office with a friend more. Okay. But do I need a special? He sent that link already. Right? I'll send it to you right Yeah, send it again. Okay. That's right. <laughs> the reality. Porch publication. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I'm driving. Oh, nice. you need your mic, don't you?
be introducing uh, India. Um, so India and I were both in uh, Lai Ray's class, Lai Ray who's on uh, the next panel. Uh, we were both in her class, Trauma and Invention. And uh, Lai Ray gave us the assignment in that class to write a recommendation letter for a peer. Um, and so uh, India, Shakoya, and I, we all wrote uh, praise songs for each other. Um, so I'm gonna read uh, my, my praise song for India as her introduction. Um, and we're, we're both in the MFA poetry program here. Praise song for India. You talked about how Toni Morrison said, all water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. So you must have a perfect memory. Memories between this realm and the other side, across all your channels. You said you had to go and get some of your poems up out of the water, but that would be getting them up out of you. The well you draw from your poem, song, dance, plays is unending because the water is unending. In the midst of the quick sickness, in the midst of the exhaustion of listening and moving in spirit and with the spirits calling for you, you stay committed to that worthy thing. Your warrior self is always trying to fight its way to take the center of you. But this life is for your water self, for all the ways you shape shift and change form from the warrior water to the gentle stream. You carry the wolf, the warrior, the knife within you and the water body. I'm honored to walk, run, crawl this poetry journey with you. Please welcome India. Okay. Thank you, Mackenzie, for reminding me. <laughs> um, I'm a sad, so no tears, y'all. But. <laughs> But um, no, thank you. And I um, also want to thank Shikoya, and I want to thank Jahan, and I want to thank you for wrapping your vision in your love and in love from very beyond places and for keeping it safe so that we're able to gather here and walk in it. So thank you. Um, everybody else was bringing folks up here with them, so I'm going to bring... Jim Hackle up here with me for teaching me how to smile. I'm gonna bring Sarah Bowers up here with me for teaching me rhythm and beat and for teaching me to speak up as well. And I'm going to bring Mami Wada up here with me for teaching me time in my dreams. So that's back here with me, okay. Yeah, sorry, look, it's just a little awkward, okay. <laughs> I know. I know the day is coming when my mother will jump down into the sky and I will caught her. I'll mother my mother, dip her in appropriate rivers to thicken her skin, cause I want my baby to get big. She is on the phone now and saying she wants to go home and I know I can't drive her there. My baby is on the phone asking how I got out. Could I not take her with me? It's true, I parted my water from her water. True all summer, I've been jumping in portals to unmap me, almost broke my neck, jumping that portal. I wanna see you, so. Your bars. These braids fall from my head and pile on the cobblestone downtown. They fall dead and long and loud, but in Simone is louder. She asks, isn't it a pity? It is pitiful the way I fear. I fear someone will come near this body and say, you dropped something and point at my, my braid on the ground. 
They will point at, but never pick up the dead, cause it's a familial act to pick up another's braid. Only in our homes do we swing these dead things from finger and thumb. We banter, girl, come get these snakes off my floor. These are familial acts, but there is no family here. Only me, mold in my shower, and in Simone still asking, isn't it a pity? It is pitiful the way I cower in the corner with the mold. I cower because all the water in me is screaming and all the water out me is screaming. The two want to commune, but I am in their way. I atom and membrane and bladder and brown. These braids do look like snakes. Snakes circling the open drain, eating their own tails. The water wants me in two. Origins. Knew nothing about space junk until his daughter this time. And there's this thing we do when I'm in town. You, you call, you say you'll stop by to see me before I leave again. I'd say that'd be nice. Then you, better yet y'all, come to my place. You, your sister, and bring the girls too. You say, I'll make some pinto beans, fry some fish. Now we mapping, talking these vittles down to the seasoning. And our nowhere, no never, we're redecorating the hell out of these walls where repetition is holy, but repetition can't carry the whole family. So I know not to tell the girls, cause they are kids and will think that this place where we light ourselves over and over has coordinates, space, daughter, this time. And there's this call before I leave again, come to my place, bring some some mapping, knew nothing about junk until this thing we do when I'm in town. You say you'll come by, you'll stop by to see me. I say that'd be nice. Then you, better yet, y'all, you, your sister, and the girls too. You say, I'll make some pinto beans, fry fish. Now we talk in these vittles down to the seasoning in our nowhere. We're redecorating these walls. Repetition is holy, but can't carry the whole family. So I know not to tell the girls, because they will think that this place has coordinates. No, never the hell out of where repetition are kids and where we light ourselves over and over. My baby said it was because the folks in there didn't like the way her and Mr. always fought. The folks in there from the other side of the watery wanted us out their house. They picked up the glass from the living room table, the one my baby always kept so clean, not a fingerprint ever on it. That table, the folks in there flipped and threw back down, now glass is plural. And Miss Sis say they was always walking around upstairs. She say all our hamsters died and even the dog got missing, got the hell up out of there. Here I was thinking all this watery glass was new, but it's back in the back, raised on a flipping, raised on a flipping glass table. I say, Miss Sis, I wasn't even born yet when y'all lived in that house or I had to be a baby, baby. Miss Sis say, no, you were right there, old enough to remember. How do you not remember? Okay. Bring the floor up to me. Then the first wall the one with the roach on it, 
Where me and Miss Sis, nothing like Miss Gwendolyn's girl, Melody Mary. We are predictable scary of roaches, bed bugs, and fleas. Of all those thems that make us start over when we haven't even started yet. Where the second wall is a doorway to a little hole in the wall. A Taranga African restaurant between Wyoming Wyoming and Roseline, where there never was no roses. I enter, waiting on my fish meal. Yes, I want the head of the fish too. And Miss Lady sitting next to me, waiting on her oxtails with her boy. And Miss Lady behind the counter is giving the boy a free can of juice. But the boy looks up at his mama before taking here. Here I am facing, facing the fourth wall, the one with the TV on it, with the killers in it, all three convicted for Aubrey, for Ahmad. I'm about to cry under this mask because the conviction feels good and feels low loving. I want their heads to give to the roach, to give to the boy who will ask his mama, can I? Okay, this is my last one. And my longest one, so. But y'all are in for it. Thank you for the feedback <laughs> and all the love. Okay. Trinities. I'm humaning at this restaurant table with you, but to be real, I just wanna throw limbs where language supposed to be. There's so much I wanna say, but not with this tongue. This tongue gets stuck, but limbs don't stutter. I am humaning, I don't know how to say my own name. You are ugling your face at my condition of not knowing. You act like I haven't tried cleaning the tacky way I talk. Tried saying my name with all my chest, but the chest is filled with forever fluid. Yeah, man, I am water from water. My mama is water, and sometimes my human mama forgets how to say my name because she didn't have nothing to do with naming me. It was the water talking, taking her tongue. You see why I don't trust tongues. My name isn't my human mama's memory to summon. My Trinity is it mine to rearrange the body 24 the water old older than the beginning the God back boneless a baby floating in the body water can't rearrange my condition of not knowing my own powers if I could sob all this condition out of me I would I get up from this table and stop playing human with you next time I want to fuck a god, something who gets it, who won't ugly their face at me, every time my arms stick out into a T, defaulting into ready position, waiting for my nails to come hold me up.
welcome again. Um, talking to you virtually this time from my office. I was just in the 80 weather, so I made it. Uh, I was able to get here and get on this um, panel. So it's my pleasure, actually, to talk to two colleagues um, this afternoon about the creative theoretical. Uh, Fred Moten, who um, we are so happy to have on campus this semester, and he's, uh, sadly I'm not here, but he is here, and he's teaching a range of amazing courses of and hearing students talking so amazingly positively about as not as to be expected, right? But Fred is the author of several works which really engage some of the questions that this uh, conference is engaging. Um, I was indicating my most recent is Black and Blur, which I've been reading um, over the last few weeks, um, and uh, several others that you already know about, but Soul in Life, and definitely the classic in the break. And then my dear colleague, uh, Larry Francis Stefanen, is a poet um, whose work I love, I've cited in my own work, and she continuously animates a lot of our discussions by ensuring that we make the links. One of the things that she talked about with me at length at one point is the link between the creative and the political, and I'm hoping we get to talk about some of that later in this discussion as well. So first I'll go to Fred um, and probably ask you to talk a little bit about how, in terms of methodologies, because I noticed in your work, you freely move from citing um, major European theorists to jazz masters, to Calypso, <laughs> to Caribbean scholars of all sorts, um, and, and demonstrate an amazing range of knowledge range in terms of the whole black world, if you will. So probably if you could talk a little bit about your approach to doing this kind of work and how it, it's generated in your process. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Carol. Uh, Professor Boyce Davies, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you. And uh, Larry, I, I'm, uh, you know, I've been having such a good time at Cornell this, uh, this semester with um, it's been a pleasure to get to know the students that y'all have been working with for so long. And, and um, it's been uh, it's really renewed, you know, my 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 belief in, in in study. So I thank you for your students and the work that you've been doing with them. Um, so I, I don't know if I have a, a methodology. Um, I think when I was in. Uh, when I was in college, you know, I, I, the friends that I, I hung out with a very particular group of uh, black nerds and, and especially um, one guy in particular named Alan Jackson, who's a history of science major. And, and the art, we read a lot of books together. We read a lot of things together. And one of the books that we read that really made a big impression on me was a book by, uh, this uh, German philosopher of science named Paul Feyerhoff and called Against Method. And, um, and I guess it seemed to me that he was thinking through, you know, the ways that, that scientific discovery kind of moved by way of these sort of improvisational maneuvers um, and, and informal maneuvers. And, and, and it moved as a function of interests that, that different groups of scientists had in common that, that were not necessarily always so kind of hyper programmatic. And um, so I guess really, I, I just, there's a lot of stuff that I like and that I'm interested in. And I try to see what happens when I put them together because they're all together in my head, you know? And, um, and that's, that's pretty much what I, what I do. Thank you. Um, and let me say welcome again, because we have to make sure that, that we recognize, right? Larry, then, can you engage um, as well? Similarly? Sure. Um, uh, first, I want to say thank you, uh, Carol. It's good to see you. And um, thank you so much, Shakoya and Jayon, for your work in putting this together. I could not be more thrilled to see um, um, what you all have 
have done here. And I just am so, I feel so honored and privileged to be um, included. Um, for me, I think about a poem I wrote when I was a little girl in elementary school and having a moment where, um, so Fred just said, they're all together in my head. Having a moment where I wrote this poem in elementary school where all of these different things that I was thinking about and the place that I'm from and the place um, where I was making all came together in my head and giving that poem to someone where that made it public um, and suddenly realizing as an elementary school student, I think I was 10, oh, this is what I do. This is what, this is what I do. And then just kind of moving from there, from that space. And it's a poem that stayed in my head for forever now. It's it like, it, I still remember that poem. Oh, I thought you were gonna tell us that poem. When you meant I, I can tell you the poem it, because ahead. I still remember yeah. the poem. Um, it was about a space shuttle launch. It was about the launch of the space shuttle Columbia in 1981 and I'm a Floridian. And so those were like kind of a, always a big deal. And so, um, yeah. So the poem is the water falling on the launch pad. The countdown will begin. The smoke will come out in a minute and all delays will end. The people wait excitedly to watch the shuttle fly. And one man who is 44 spends his birthday in the sky. In just eight minutes in the sky, they're already over Spain. And it's a relief to everyone to note that it won't rain. Then everyone goes back inside to turn on their TV and to watch the replay of the launch as the shuttle flies over the, the sea. And then I gave that poem. And then that poem winds up like they read the poem over the intercom with the morning announcements. And then suddenly there's the whole Pledge of Allegiance and academia and how people think and traveling out into space and why is there a fake waterfall on that launch pad when they're doing that? What is that doing? And why is it suddenly mediated so that this live thing is happening, but we're all going to watch it on a video? And like all of the stuff that that little girl is processing and, and thinking about like coming together and then realizing, oh, none of this stuff is separated out and this is how I think through it. Mm -hmm. So basically the separating out is, is an academic project. And I know why, because in a sense, it is a way of making categories that people can hold, understand, you know, really go into and analyze. But it has the effect then of creating these artificial separations. So what you were doing in that poem is giving a historical account of something that was taking place or that happened that becomes now a documentable piece of literature that, that, that engages a, a moment, right? Theoretically, but also talks about questions of space and so on. Um, and I was thinking too about Hurston, who we began with, from Florida as well, who talked about the horizon always, and, and she actually forecast this logic of jumping into space. She said, if you jump at the sun, right, you will, you'll at least you get off the ground. And she'd heard this from her mom and repeated it in different ways. So the question of not being grounded and all of that is, is all in that whole process, isn't it? Right? For yeah. me, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I was thinking there's a poem I, I used to use years and years ago by uh, one of the first poets named Lucy Terry called Bass Fight where she documents watching an Indian raid on some New England people. And, and it's like bit, and she wrote this, I think, which was like 14 or 15, really clear documenting of what happened, who ran, what happened, so on. Um, and then the other example, and Fred, um, we, we talked about Calypso earlier. The other example I have is, is 
Lord Kitchener from Trinidad and Tobago singing about Ghana independence, meticulously giving the date, the time, the leadership, what the flag would look like. Um, and then Ghana is the name he kept repeating, you know, really doing that function of the degree was saying, well, this is how we name, right? This is how we, we, we document and historicize ourselves. One of the functions of the poet is that, isn't it? As the Griot, as the person who documents the moment, right? Right, Fred, in that context, since you referenced some of those Calypso references earlier, I have to, I figured I have to pull you back on that as well. <laughs> Talk about that. Well, I mean, you know, Lord, Lord Kitchener is a, an internationalist um, and a, and a pan-Africanist. Um, He's speaking, you know, always, I think, from from the the ground, the demonic ground, if you want to say, after winter. Um, and McKittrick, you know, of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and it's a it's a space of of displacement and um and of complication and of all kinds of rich, you know, um movements of people and social movements and movements of populations. Um, and so he's already coming from a kind of cosmopolitan ground. So that when he goes to England and meets people from Nigeria, meets people from the Gold Coast, which will become Ghana, they, they're already, you know, they're already moving within a kind of complicated enactment of, of Pan-Africanism, right? Like it's, we can talk about Pan-Africanism as a social movement, and we can talk about Pan-Africanism as a as a as, as a as a set of ideological constructs. But but Pan-Africanism was also, you know, a bunch of house parties in Brixton. You know, it was the very specific materiality of all these people getting together. You know, um, there's this great book by Samuel Selvan called The Housing Lark that I've been sort of obsessed with for a couple of years and. And he really talks about that. He really, he really works through how it is that 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 these new sort of meta cosmopolitan spaces in in the so-called metropole actually bring cosmopolitanism to the place where it is purported, you know, but wrongly, you know, to have to have begun. So mm -hmm. there's this really cool thing. Like if you, you know, one of the great sort of great musicians of Ghanaian independence. Um, uh, uh, who, who, oh man, I'm, I'm spacing out. Um, hold on, you have to bear with me while I, while I look his name up because I can't remember anything anymore. I'm getting to that age, but, uh, uh, um, oh man, he, 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 he has these great songs. Uh, great, great, great song called For Lewis, which he wrote for Lewis Armstrong and All For You. I'll, I'll think of his name in a minute, but but if you look at, um, you know, he's basically one of the king kings and, and one of the sort of progenitors of high life music. Um, but he's got this great song called Ghana, Guinea, Mali, which is about the the sort of the immer the beginnings of trying to to to, to shift Pan Af the Pan-Africanist movement into an actual political formation on the continent. But, but he lists the song as a calypso. It's explicitly called a calypso by um, E.T. Mensa. That's his name. I don't know why I can't remember his name. But E.T. Mensa lists the song as a calypso. And it's as if he's saying that for this specific Pan-African sort of musical and aesthetic and political aspiration, we need the specificity of Calypso in order to articulate it, right? So, so it's just all this, these, these movements across the globe of, of Black freedom struggle and, and the musical, you know, cross fertilization was real and deep, you know, from, from the very beginning. And, uh, and Kitchener is like a great example of that, but there's a bunch of other folks too, obviously. So. Cool. But one of the things I um, I was taken with with reading your work repeatedly is this question of the blur, because you have it it runs through all kinds of of framings. It, it it evokes blue and then blur, but then you also talk about this sort of question of separation. And I was reading a line where, in which you said, if the problem is the maintenance of separation, 
then saving is the blur that movement makes in not arriving. And uh, what I keep getting um, is this sort of constant questioning, even of your own um, sureties, even of things that you were thinking at one point. And I, I like that, that, that sense of consistently interrogating where you have a series of questions, what if, and what if not, that run through a lot of um, your writing um, in, in several ways, both the poetry and, and the fiction. So I'm wondering if you're using blur as that sort of inability for us to be locked into, into shorties that we think we know. Is that what, it, what you would say? Yeah, definitely. I think it's uh, the whole I the what what the blur is meant to indicate is is a level of precision actually. So it might seem paradoxical, but but it feels but if but if you you know if you you look at something, the closer you look at it, the the blurrier it becomes because because all of the moments of definition and separation that that might appear to us on first glance, you know, upon closer examination, those those moments of separation are just disrupted. Those lines and those boundaries and, and separations are 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 made to to shift and move. So so the idea is that yeah, blur and one way to think about it is blur is what happens when you stop looking at something and start looking with something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a, it's when it's when when visuality um, is inseparable from from an embrace. Wow, brilliant! So, Larry, do you have any comments or questions you have for friends? Well, I like that that looking with and and that idea of the blurring and at the closer that you look at something, the blurrier that it becomes. And I, well, I'm thinking about um, how that shows up in your, in your work on the page. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing you say something about that because it's a thing that I think about too. And for me, it, it plays with the, um, the bonds, the punctuation that I use in my poetry that in that combination of the M dash and the colon with which I was trying to get at a kind of valence and um, a kind of, of even, even if you like kind of think about looking at something closely and at the way that if you look at a molecule or something, or you think about like uh, shared electrons or things like that valences and how those fragmentations come together and make a thing in a moment and then come apart and make another thing in a moment. And can you talk about like how that is um, in your work? I mean, I, I love, um, you know, it just feels like you kind of have to love these moments of, of, of of indefinition and and love what it means to to live you know in the in the interval actually to put it in your words in the open interval you know in a in a in a suspension that that actually becomes you know generative you know as because of how we inhabit it um and in those moments you know there are all these these are the moments that i think actually make it so that the way that we've been thinking about there's like this great book uh, i forget the name of the author um called the voodoo quantum leap you know and it's it's very concerned with the the relations between you know sort of forms of of haitian cosmology and 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 quantum mechanics and and it's like a major kind of clue you know that that you know that basically that the the the, the most important developments you know, in 20th and 21st century physics, you know, you know, at the sort of head, so to speak, of the European sciences is, you know, it's just now starting to catch up with um, with forms of indigenous thought and forms of, uh, you know, sort of black thought, you know, as it's manifest globally. But but there are poets here. Can can I read you one of my one of my favorite poems? 
Don't, don't, don't get mad if I mess it up. Yes. <laughs> it's called Transit of Venus. Oh. The oh. actors mill about the party saying rhubarb because other words do not sound like conversation. In the kitchen, always, one who's just discovered beauty, his mouth full of whiskey and strawberries. He practices the texture of her hair with his tongue and her five billion electrons pop their atoms. Rhubarb in electromagnetic loops, rhubarb, rhubarb, the din increases. It's like this beautiful poem about complexity and richness and entropy and how it corresponds to the ways that we think and the ways that we converse and how we gather when we try to do something beautiful together, whether it's making a play or making some food, you know, and um, and and there's this beautiful buzz of 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 it's not repetition. It's it, it's a buzz of indeterminacy because of the repetition of the rhubarb of that word. You know, it's like you say that word just enough to make it sound different to us. You know, and um, and I know you know, I'm I was born in Las Vegas, but the people that I grew up around you know, we're all from Arkansas. So there's all this Arkansas, black Arkansas in my voice. And it's, and it's coming from someplace different than, than where your voices are coming from. But, but, but the richness of, you know, of, of, of the form of the poem means that, you know, that anybody from anywhere in the diaspora can sound something that's already given in that, in that poem, you know? Uh, and so, that's that to me is the open interval, you know. That's this sort of the ways in which you know, even even in this sort of you know what Cedric Robinson called the eternal middle passage. Even in that suspension, you know, there's a place for us, you know, to gather um, and to and to and to try to make something in in in, in how we you know how we approach how we approach that gathering. It's you know, it's okay. How am I supposed to talk? Because Fred Moten just read one of my poems, but like also, um, study. When I think about study, and I when I think about the the space making that you open up for us in terms of the way that you think and talk about study, and about the ways in which sometimes these spaces that we live in don't make the space for the fact that you know. A, good deal of the study that's happening, you know, before I sold my house, that house was the party house. <laughs> and so like when, when people would come and give a talk after the talk, people would wind up at my house. That, that was like a regular thing. And so like, I think about, you know, um, Richard Eiden being in town and just like having Richard Eiden at the, at, at the house and having this like, conversation where I was just, you know, with a friend of mine, just like, uh, we want to know everything in your brain right now, you know, just in the living room, not up at some podium or something like that, that that's where these things were taking place or the ways in which we're supposed to think of some kind of um, um, approbation or accolade or whatever. But I always think about, and I tell this story all the time and my bestie, um, Dagmar Wipshet tells this story all the time. Like the night of the National Book Awards for me is you because Dag and I walked out of that place and we we're all dressed up to the nine. I don't know if you remember this. We're all dressed up to the nines and we're getting ready to get into a cab and you you stepped out of the cab. And it was like the cosmos had come together or something. And so we were, we just came up to you. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but we were like, you're Fred Moten. You're Fred Moten. <laughs> oh my God. You're Fred Moten. And so like that night to me is less that thing than the door opens to the cab that we're about to get into and Fred Moten walks out of the cab. And that's like one of those moments that gets one of those punctuation marks with those valences to me. Like that's how it all, that's how it all works. Yeah, it was, I'll, I'll never forget that. It was, it was so great because I was, I was doing something at, at NYU and, um, 
and they put you up sometimes in their hotel just right across the street from that place where they have those awards you know and uh the club quarters it's a hotel down there in it's all in the financial district in in new york and i got out and i was like wait a minute i know these folks. <laughs> you know <laughs> and um and i you know the experience of kind of you know shuttling back and forth from from one institution to another you know mm -hmm. from, from your so-called home institution to some other so-called institution it can be you know it's part of the work that we do and and it's cool to have a chance to do it you know it's nice to have a chance to travel but but it doesn't take long before you realize that you're always kind of on somebody else's time and on somebody else's schedule and um and so when you you know anytime you can open the door and see and see somebody <laughs> that you want to see you know it's a great thing so so that was like uh that was in that was totally yeah that was like some kind of I'm pretty much of a heathen, you know, but I do believe in in that 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 the cosmos sometimes holds good things in store for us, you know. So we were each on the other side of that portal, you know, mm -hmm. um, yep. making some kind of transport possible for the other. So that was cool. That was cool. Yeah. So why do you think of one of your poems you want to read for us as we kind of get to the end point? We do try to take some questions from audience and students too, because we want to have this more interactive. So people in the audience, if you want to do that, can you, at this point, this will be a good moment. And then we'll come back still to have you, we want to hear your poetic voice too, at the same time, Larry and Fred. Questions? And people who are online, please feel free to send one via chat as well if you need to. Anything from the audience, yeah? Okay, so maybe we don't want to use up all the time. No. Have it not Professor, we have uh, we actually have 30 more minutes, so we can keep oh, the conversation cool. going. <laughs> okay, great. So are there questions yet? Uh, okay. Richard? It's good to see the audience, though. It's lovely to see you. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the talk today. Um, a question I had for you, Professor Moten, is um, in, in some of your poetry collections, you tend to gravitate towards these very particular spaces of gathering, Houston's Tavern and uh, the Service Porch being two such examples. And I was wondering how you think of the space of gathering um, as a as a component of your theoretical books, whether that whether you think of those as two different ways of organizing space that apply differently to those two styles of writing, or um, whether books like Black and Blur and In the Brick are also um, thinking of like the space in which people gather in some way. Does that question make any sense? I'm sorry if not. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> hey, Richard. Thank you, and um, and I. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I mean. Uh, well, there's a relationship, I think, you know, between the gathering and the blur, you know, that, that there's a phrase that people often use now, like in organizing circles, um, people talking about holding a space, you know, for um, and I, you know, I mean, I think that we hold we hold the space, but we also make the space. Mm -hmm. And and that means that the space is is in motion um, and it's it's in formation. And um, which sort of means that space maybe isn't even the right word for it. Place might be the right word for it. But but once place is put in motion, then um, then then that word seems to need a modifier too. You know, and 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 years ago, Norbessie Philip gave us this. You know, in the form, in the notion of this place. You know, uh, D I S space P L A C E, and um, and in a different way, Amiri Baraka gives us this when he talks about placement, 
place and placement, but he spells placement P L A C E slash M E A N T. So that in making place, we're also making meaning, you know. Um, and, I, and in my mind, I the the term that's always sort of in my head the last few years is is displacement. You know, the the sort of a combination of those two terms from from Philip and and Baraka, and and I think that gathering is displacement. Um, it's why it is that when we gather, we can't be scared to disrupt what it is that we thought we knew or disrupt what it is that we thought was certain. That's what the whole point is of gathering. That's what the whole point is of study, is to, is to ask questions and to, to disrupt, um, and to disrupt you know, our, our certainties about ourselves. Um, you know, and uh, so so all those things feel to me like they they are inseparable from one another. Um, and uh, and I think, you know, one of the things I think is really cool about poetry is the, the, the ways that it's organized and the way that it operates is that it 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 produces effects, you know, that are that are similar to these to these activities, to these to this this interplay of, of displacement and gathering and approach. Um, so that's that's basically all that I've ever been, you know, that's what I've been trying to study. Um, and uh, I used to think, you know, man, why did I have to go to school and spend so much time doing all this stuff just so I could study the stuff that the people who raised me seem to know in some intuitive way? like. Why did I have to get sent away, you know, in order to just just to sort of come back home? Mm -hmm. But I think the reason is because it wasn't that they knew it in some intuitive way, but that they were also always actively involved in this modality of study, mm -hmm. right? They 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 weren't they weren't certain either. So um, so yeah, this is this is what this is what this is what we do, you know, and it feels good, you know feels lucky to be able to do it. Thank you. Good. Any other questions from the audience? I see. Yeah. Hi, um, hi Fred, yeah, Larry, this is Jasmine. Um, so I'm also carrying um, into this, this talk, uh, Fred, your, your talk a couple of weeks ago on Mary, Amir Baraka and um, W.B. Du Bois and et cetera. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about um, how you talked about poetic activity, uh, seeing and saying and naming, and how those things are bound up in conquest um, and, and many forms of violence. And so I'm wondering if and how you both are thinking about unsaying and, and unnaming um, in your work, if that, if that makes any sense. Uh, I I think so much and and teach so much um, um, about the palinode, about the poem itself that unsays as a mode that that is what the poem is doing. How do you write the palinode? How do you write the poem that unsays and what also are the tools that poets use to talk around a gap or talk around a space mm -hmm. or like or like um, trace or track these orbits of unsaying in their in their work? Um, what does that look like? Y'all know me and y'all know how much I obsessively talk about a denaton because I love it so much and about like that space that's made not just in the poem um when i teach it like i talk about phyllis wheatley but also about um stevie wonder because i always use stevie wonders as to teach a denaton because that whole song is made of a denaton but also like another one of my favorite songs never too much by luther vandross which is a denaton 
you know, that unsayable, that, that uncountable number, that thousand kisses, that's never enough and I don't want to stop. Um, how do we unsay through marking certain silences? And I mean, Norbessi Philip was just here. And so the way that she um, gets certain silences to speak out of the legal texts, you know, that she pulls um, Zong from, for example, you know, how those things are working and then how then she builds the fugue, which is in itself a palinode of that legal text in a way. Um, is how I think about it. Oh, hey, Jasmine. Uh, Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't had a chance to see you yet, but I still have a couple more weeks, so we'll figure out how to get together. Um, that, would be, that would be so lovely. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, you know, I, I think everything I love as to I love never too much too and I I um so here's a here's a thing and this is part of what I think I mean I'm pretty much stuck you know with with the well I shouldn't even put it that way I mean English is the, the language that I use you know um and I've never been very good with other languages. So, but I've but I've at least been trying hard to to pay attention to the var varieties of English and and then to try to branch out, you know, from there. And um, I was think I have this friend, um, a great 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 poet named Harmony Holiday, and we used to do these like listening sessions together sometimes. And um, and we were talking about. It is something that goes back to Nate Mackey too. Um, he, you know, in in his sort of, uh, he's very, you know, interested in and 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 invested in certain kind of Islamic poetics, um, you know, and and in Islamic music, and um, and and you know, and in the connection to the Quran in, in various ways, but but also certain certain key terms in, in Islamic music and Islamic writing. Um, and Habibi, he turns Habibi, which is this, you know, word that means beloved, he turns it into a verb, you know, the, the Be Habibi, you know, to, to, I don't even know how you would pronounce it, a beloved, right? Um, and, and, and there's a, uh, the, the great, the great Malian singer Umu Sangare, you know, like she got this amazing song. It was like a huge hit, you know, in Africa, you know, 15 years ago, like all throughout the continent, called Andia. Um, and Andia in in her language means beloved, right? And then, and I was thinking about you know the great Guyanese thinker and activist and and philosopher, whatever you want to call her, Andaya. And I don't know what her original name was, or if we could even call it that. But but I'm thinking, is Andaya also a term for beloved? Is that is that where she takes that name from? And then there's Luther, oh my love, you know, right? So there's this, it's like, you can run the changes across and through all these different languages of love, the beloved. And it makes me think that there's like this common practice of naming right so but but the way that it works is through this kind of unraveling right and through the fact that there is no name that is equivalent to what it is it will be named and so we actually engage in the practice of unnaming or unsaying every time we name every time we name it is an act of devotion towards what would be named. And it is also at the same time a confession that the name of the moment is absolutely inadequate. 
so that for, so that what if poetry is this constant practice of devoted naming that manifests itself at the end of the day as a practice also of unnaming or this devoted practice of unnaming against the very idea of the name right against any kind of sense of ownership or propriety or whatever that we would course that would correspond with the, with the name you know so so for me when baraka at you know all throughout you know um you know in town that great poem he's like i i uh i see something in the way of things and you see it too you you can't you just can't call its name it's this moment of profound ambivalence because on the one hand it's a i i well i think that he i think that by the end he he always wanted to distance himself from any notion of the poet as the one who gives some final name and at the same time, I think he wanted to embrace the idea of poetry as this constant practice and activity of naming against the name, you know. Um, so anyway. That that makes me think too about um, again, like how we study and like one of the those the prime uh, ways of studying um, for me is just like kind of looking back and looking at the, the everything that you grew up with and everything that you were being taught before you like get sent to these schools or sent away, like you were saying. And I always think about the way that we would say things growing up. And the when, as you were talking, the phrase that kept coming to me was the way that in different situations you would say to people, I ain't studying you. And what I ain't studying you does. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when and how you could say, I ain't studying you. Mm -hmm. And I ain't studying you as a palinode, as an unsaying, both as in terms of if somebody's coming at you in the way that they sometimes do in these academic spaces, that that was a tool that we were already sent to school with, where I could just look at somebody and be like, I ain't studying you. Like, I yeah. literally am not studying you. Yeah. It's not you I'm studying. Yeah. I'm I not stu studying you. <laughs> I ain't studying you, Mar Marjorie Furlong. Yeah. Yes, I ain't studying you. But then also the way that then that can get turned tonally into this like address to the beloved who is doing the thing that gets you to do that. I ain't studying you. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Ain't nobody studying. And that, that, that addition where it becomes, ain't nobody studying you. Ain't nobody thinking about you. Ain't nobody, <laughs> ain't nobody studying you. No, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, man, just the richness of the everyday speech situations that, that we come from are, as you say, immeasurable, you know, mm. a thousand kisses, never too much. <laughs> never, never too much. And, um, and when we, and, you know, when we start to read, you know, when we start to think with other people too, their, their speech situations they give their speech situations to us too, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, it's just, uh, look, it's, it's the, it's the terrible beauty, you know, of diaspora, you know, um, the, the terrible beauty of this intensity of abandonment and dispersion is that look at all these new things that got made, you know, um, you know, uh, that's, I know, you know, Carol, you mentioned the Creole, you know, Gleason talks about, you know, Creolization at, you know, Brathwaite, you know, I mean, you know, that's what Baldwin is always talking about. I mean, it's just, and it's so many different locations. And then it happens in across so many different languages that, um, you know, it just, you know, really what it, part of what it means to not be studying them is that they don't even, it's like, I, I got some, we got so much stuff to deal with, you know, that really, I just, you know, it's like, not only do I not have time to, to be thinking about you, but also don't have time to actively not think about you either, which is like, you know, if something crumbs across my desk that, that becomes useful for the project, then, then my not studying you also means that 
I, I'm not thinking about you enough to be mad at you enough to not read your shit if your shit is useful to, to me or whatever, you know. Um, so it's like that too, you know, it's just really I what you think is is of little importance to what we're trying to do. You know? Um, you know, what you think about what we're trying to do is of, is of little, little importance. Um, Exactly. I think in Googie spent a nice chunk of his talk um, looking at this question of the here and the there and the language. It's in the language already um, to to have you, you know, be able to articulate how you. The, to me, I'm reading that I'm not studying you even larger in terms of what Black Studies is supposed to be doing or, or what Black Studies is supposed to be doing or how we are supposed to engage these intellectual spaces. How much of it, you know, does one take in um, in terms of how they separate, in terms of how they create these barriers to knowledge um, and so on. So I like that. That was really, really rich discussion. I don't know if there are any people in the chat um, with questions. I know somebody was monitoring it there. If there are, can you? From our audience outside. Okay, I um I have a quick question, and then Lisa will read um some questions from okay. the chat. Okay, go ahead. Um, so this is a question for both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, selfishly, I guess I wanted to think about uh, genre slash modality, and you know, as people who both write prose and poetry, and who work in a number of different modalities, I wonder if you could uh, speak to, like, why poetry? As opposed to maybe fiction or, uh, you know, maybe literary nonfiction, I think, as, as Macomo was talking about earlier, or, um, you know, any other type of uh, either written or expressive art form. Let you go, Larry. Oh, um, I am. I am. Um, so next Wednesday, I'm meeting with a choreographer to um, work on some movement um, to go along with a project that I'm doing now, which is some poems that I've been working with a percussionist to set those poems. And now I'm gonna try and get those poems in the body. Um, and and um, so that's a project that's really like kind of in the forefront of my mind right now. But also again, when I'm teaching, one of the things that I've been talking with um, the students that I work with about is how much lately I'm, kind of focused on people talk about the way that I talk with with my hands mm -hmm. and um, for a few years now I've been paying a lot more attention to the gestures and when I start talking why is this why did that just happen you know where it used to be a thing that I would just be doing that and now I'm paying attention to what gesture happens when and what is it? Because it's not just like kind of anything, you know, why is anything anything? Why is that anything? And what does that look like? And how can I move that between, um, between genres or things like that? I published a, a, a short story and because I didn't feel like I knew how to make a short story and I needed a box to put that idea in that short story is written as a villain now. Um, and so here's this, this like piece of fiction as a villain now, you know, like what's going on with that more and more and more. I'm just not, I'm less, 
interested in the division, in, in keeping the division than in moving through those different spaces and then looking at the ways that they're being moved through and what I can learn from that or what I can learn from that. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I've been thinking lately. I'm ready to get into that studio with that choreographer and move the poem, that poem through my body. I would just say that uh, I think I, I think I know what you mean. For, I mean, per, first of all, just it feels like maybe poetry is just a little more po portable, you know, in a way. Um, it's easier to move with, you know, and move into different genres, and maybe a little bit easier than fiction to to be adapted across a range of possible you know, genres or modes, you know. Um, it's it's almost like people can just do more stuff with it, you know. Um, it doesn't require as much infrastructure, you know. Um, but then on the other hand, it's also a function, for me at least, of like, what I used to say, you know, I every once in a while I try to start writing a story or a play, but I just don't have the attention span, you know, and I don't have... I would need like AIDS, you know, like, I mean, I would need somebody to help me, you know, remember the names of people and stuff, you know, I just, I can't carry anything through like that. Um, but then I also realized it's not really so much a lack of attention span. It's just, it's just a whole bunch of different facets of, of the same thing. Like basically it's just about one or two things that I'm really interested in. And then I have this sort of obsessive compulsive relation to it and poetry, you know, you, you can just keep coming at it a different way every, every day or every 15 minutes or whatever. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it, it, it's, you know, um, and we have, um, several questions in the chat, so I'm going to go in order. Um, Aliyah earlier said, I love that you brought up portals. What kind of portals do you enter your work through? It could, it could be anything. Like, I keep putting my mute on because my window looks out on 8th Street. Um, and, uh, like, I don't, we have, you know, you know New York apartments. So I, I don't have my own office, but I'm kind of in a corner of my living room and the, the window looks out on the A street and it's very loud and it's all these trucks and stuff. And, and um, it's kind of great and it's, it's annoying because it's so loud, but then there's another way in which you're sort of constantly uh, being interrupted and, and all of those interruptions can be a, a portal, you know? Um, like now I think, you know, man, I want to write something about, um, you know, just hearing all these different car engines and then how it, how it, how it doesn't actually, what if it turns out that it, it doesn't, it doesn't obliterate, it doesn't drown out Carol and Lyra. It's, it's like some kind of other accompaniment, you know? I mean, all of the musicians in, in our various traditions, they would take those extraneous sound effects and fold them right into the music you know so so how can we do that you know how can we how can we write that you know? so the, the portal is just anything that happens <laughs> you know anything that happens that day so it's the same or anything that like kind of makes me do that um that hell that head tilt you know where i'm just kind of like oh that caught my attention right now um on my mind so much lately is this young woman her name is ashley fox and she is the pole sport champion and has been the pole sport champion for a few years now and um there's a particular routine of hers 
that I have been watching and I took a bunch of stills of that I've been looking at so much in part because of the way that people may or may not think of pole sport and the, the route that pole sport is trying to travel to get, um, to get quote unquote recognized. But there's this one still from this one routine that she did this, this one year. And there's two poles on the stage when she is um, doing her routines. And there's this still that I snapped from this routine in which she's standing between these two poles and she's made her body into the shape of a lambda. And for me, like that got the head tilt because I'm just like, okay, that is a readable thing right there in mass, you know? And so what is that determinant that she's putting before us? Because she's between the two straight lines and then she's got that lambda of her body that she's making there. And so that, uh, the poems, there's a poem that's a, that is, I think is about to come out called Pole Sport that I wrote about that moment where she's making that readable thing. Um, but then the, multiplic- the multiplicity of possibilities of reading that, like the absolute value of Ashley or the, the, the determinant of Ashley that's there. And, and that kind of thing just gets me so happy because there are, there are things that we know, um, thinking about that both Einstein you and Einstein you, that we know in the body and show in the body and like, I'm always going back to like that moment where Tony K. Bambara in that essay ask, has the, um, ask, uh, what are you pretending not to know today, little girl? You know, the, the way that the things that we know and the way that they show up, um, um, how we process that and how we figure that, like my processing of that is going to be through these poems. And I have to get that those lines in those poems and what she's doing in those lines, you know, both as that Lambda, but also what she does when she's up on that pole and she, her body is completely horizontal off the side of the pole. She's holding herself up there and there's a way in which there's a gravity cannot hold her, you know, aspect that's going on. When you look at it, when I show it to people, they're like, wait, what, how is this possible? And the way that that routine begins with her up on one of the poles in what looks like a hung body, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's this way in which in this pole sport, she is like processing these historical narratives that I think is just so beautiful and so unexpected and so like maybe, you know, depending on who you ask, not what people think that. I'm studying, but that's what I'm studying, Mm -hmm. you know, like that's what I'm studying. That portal, I can't, I I find it irresistible. I find it irresistible. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are like 320. I'm not sure how much time we have for the rest. If I can get the um, organizers to indicate. Yeah, I think we're we're out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I just wanted. I was reading a little piece from Fred's prefatory statement, particularly since this session is was titled "Poetry is Not a Luxury," and I liked it because he said something that fascinated me. Um, criticism is supposed to let you see through that. Criticism is poetry in this regard. Baldwin is more and less than either critic or poet or both. He makes us let us look for ourselves and through ourselves till we are beside ourselves. To be beside ourselves with holy looking is to practice Baldwin's selflessness, which is only his to give away and demanding that we see through him too in pursuit of impure, eccentric fugue rather than the chaste satisfaction that's said to live in the one and one relation. And I like that he goes on to talk about what he calls the indexical play of observer and observed, theorist and theorized, dreamer and dreamed, that these ebb into what he calls topographical caress, glistening, unheld, and gazing, intricate towards scalar, neither here nor there. We go down at the cross. I just found that so 
thoughtful and such a lovely sort of summary of the kinds of things that we've been thinking about. And this is From All That Beauty by Fred Moten. Thank you all for lovely conversation. And again, we need to do this together. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Lani. Thank you. Like she read my praise song, I'm going to be reading a praise song for her as well. Before I do so, I just want to direct some love and some attention to her debuting poetry collection, Slack Tongue City. You can hold it up. <laughs> oh. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So get your copy and show her some love. Okay, um, praise song for McKinsey. I can still feel that dream where you and I are in a room practicing our forms and fist. We're putting our hands up towards the sun coming through the window. I can feel you warrior to warrior. When I think of you, I think of something earthy, of soil, steady ground. And even though I've never communed with sweet grass, you remind me of that too. That tidal braiding sweet grass feels like how I would describe the way you move and speak and poem. And the way you say boom when something is done or decided like it is finished. Like you take us back to the marble room and we're all trying to figure out when and where we'll meet up again. We're mapping everything out and then you said boom and we abandoned each other until it was time to dream gather again in this portal town. I believe that's how it happened. And when I hear you dream dreams about a time when there is no time, I should be terrified, but I'm not. Because in those dreams, you're still a warrior fighting for the ground, the soil, the sweet grass, so something has got to be all right. I'm praising to keep warring with you, I'm praising to keep hot raining with you, me as impulsive as the rain, and you as sure of herself as the sun. Thank you. Thank you for that, India. Um, I'm sitting in that and in, in the panel that, that we just heard. Um, uh, and thank you, Shakoya and Jahan, um, for, for having me. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, I'm going to start out with a couple poems uh, from, from Slack Tongue City. Uh, it comes out on Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> so this poem, uh, my, my mom, she, she works for a hospice, and she's a chaplain for hospice. So um, for, for folks who don't know, um, those who, who have um, on the end of their life, um, they can enter hospice care, so she works in, in death care. Um, and so I wanted to start with this poem in Ode to Death, but also uh, in Ode to People Who Do uh, Care Work More Largely, which I know a lot of us are teachers, so i um, sitting in that too. Ritual of Breathing. My mother works with dying people. She says she can easily tell, looking in both eyes, who will spend their last night scratching, frantically pointing at the corners of the room, and who will open the door lightly, tilt their heads and wink just once. She says, near the end, everyone tugs at their collars, casts their clothes and tries to pull out of their skins, skeleton and itching, 
Death, like drugs, tends to make an honest family. And so they sit in waiting rooms saying, I never liked her, but it's nice to see a wicked woman still. Or remember all the times she fought the man for trying to strike us small. Of course, we're all dying people, but I mean the ones who have the grace and terror of knowing what's nearest. Sometimes, if they have young children, they make the chaplain, my mother, tell the children first how death means the body means nothing anymore, how it looks like their mother will soon grow far colder. Other times, if they have old children, they make the chaplain, my mother, leave so the children can crawl in the bed, place their heads on the collarbone, their feet hanging off the edge. Once a son went into the bathroom stall and downed a bottle of tequila, coming out swaying and asking if it was over yet. No, it's not over yet. Everything polite dissolves when single months are left. I always wondered if dying people cut her off mid-sentence with a head shake, if her prayer didn't salve because their time was especially too short for limp letters to God, mostly, who would be left to know if she did her job badly. She must have made a sacred pact with everything grim, swore to usher every last breath true, if only for her own. She must know when the heart stops, the chest bursts upward like a sky split endless, So the, that, that poem I actually wrote um, here in my first semester here. Um, so I thought it fitting to start with that one too. Um, and I'll read one more from the collection. Um, so a lot of what Slack Tongue City is, is reckoning with. Um, it's an ode to my hometown, Louisville, Kentucky, but also reckoning with um, the South more largely um, in place. Uh, so I'm gonna read the last poem uh, in the first section. Magnolia, there's no way out of the South but driving. Miles of sun, good faith in an ending. We all know what last struck the other. The car window still busted to count who's missing. Miles of bottles, a good temper as intimacy. When the Kentucky man said he might shoot me for turning around in his driveway, he didn't raise his voice, as by routine. The last person to lose their way must have unmasked him. Asked what have you to say of yourself, of your family tree? There is a highway no one uses. Towns made for strangers to be lost. You do scarce to find a mechanic shop with all its parts, or any road without a dead stop. If, if you're done enough, you'd walk and somewhere distant, the Dixon, the heat would bring you to your knees. Miles of salt, good eating to die quick and well, the last on your fingers, what you stay for. So that's um, a couple from Slack Tongue City, but I also wanted to read uh, some from what I'm working on now, which is uh, quite distinct, this uh, surrealist dreamscape. Uh, kind of manuscript, and so I'll start with the first one from it. Rehearsing for Carnage. In the distance, I hear a chorus of wolves singing. They stand upright in a circle, pawing each other's gloved hand. It's not a strangle like how a fox wails, no. It's a song that starts in the toes and collects an orchestra of organs as it moves up through the chest strumming. I used to be their conductor of ceremony, back when I was foaming at the mouth to match them. By tradition, the wolves dip their snouts in the bucket of paint at the center, shaking their heads to scatter. The goal is to paint without tasting. They call this discipline. Whoever loses dies by formaldehyde. This is the best way to learn fast. Before they feast, they sacrifice one of the pack. Something angrier is hungry. Whoever is angrier wins, that's the pact. 
I won nine Sundays. Then I didn't have enough red left. I exiled myself before my exhaustion threw me to their thudding feet. They all sing well to ward off musicless things. I know because if I get too close, I fall right asleep. I stay far away, rolling in the grass and picking at my heart lock. So this, uh, this next one, um, wrote it uh, for friendship and, and for reckoning. Oral history of my well-being. Every time I see my best friend, she asks me, are you ever gonna take care of yourself? This has been our tradition. Her and my well-being, they're old friends. Sometimes I sit between them, cowering, she met my well-being before I did, introduced us, dragging me to the table by my loose skin. My well-being and my best friend, they talk about me. They laugh, what an almost beautiful person, clinking their glasses. I touch the face of my well-being and stop there. My well-being does my laundry. My well-being doesn't look for me. My well-being knows better. My well-being isn't disappointed in me, only expecting of it, a child left sitting on the front steps. My well-being stopped crying by age seven. My well-being walks behind my proof of work every time. My well-being carries my coat. Every time I see my best friend, I answer. My best friend, she grabs my shirt collar. My best friend and my well-being, they hold hands. They're shaking heads. My best friend is not impressed with me. That's why I can be honest. I am not impressed with me. That's why I can't earn my respect. Uh, so this next one, leaning into surrealism, but it doesn't feel like too, too far off. The word market. The committee has raised the price of words indefinitely. The last local word store went out of business. They've opened six new grammar factories, citing demand and rural economies. They've made words smaller, funding technologies to shrink them and shrink them. Every word purchased is a word chiseled into the sidewalk. At the city square, we go walk on our pile of words, we point, we trip, we vomit. The writers have organized meetings in the alleys. They wear their pockets inside out in protest and emptiness. Me, I keep watch. I crouch on my stomach in the alleyway, upon my elbows. I spy the committee spies and sketch them. The writers, they tell jokes and give themselves away. They can't afford to do their work. They have to compost the words from their drafts. They barter nouns for verbs, but never adjectives. The prose writers fist fight the poets, who leave bruised but smiling. The poets ask, how much did it cost to write coherently? After the meetings, I take my scraps, my fragments fallen from their notebooks. I piecemeal, I cash out. This, uh, this last one I'll do, um, I was uh, thinking, thinking of ways to, uh, to bring humor into, into a surrealist world, um, and this is, this is what emerged. Sweat theory. There's an acre of shovels that sprout up from the tip, standing up straight like petrified spines. The acre grows one shovel a year. No one has ever seen one sprout the town of Why Not designates the rowdiest group of eight-year-olds within a 12-mile radius to keep watch in the month of July, August. According to the town elders, the ground sweats so much it heaves a shovel off. This acre in particular is prone to sweat. Why no one has seen it? Well, the acre has secrets, having grown distrustful. The eight-year-olds this year They've invented a vacuum to suck up the ground sweat, theorizing that the acre will be unable to throw the shovel up. 
and they will have their four proven sweat theory. They camp out each night and each day, taking shifts of paying close attention. They wear headlamps and glasses, even the ones who don't need them, rubbing mud on their faces and hanging upside down from branches for new sight. The town church has taken up a tithe to fund the efforts, calling each, eight year olds, eight, each year's eight-year-olds to the front and laying hands. They pray to understand the acre. They pray to prove the elders. The eight-year-olds grin, beam, make themselves taller. After each July, August, the town calls a morning meeting. They wallow, walk to the town hall, wringing their hands full of bells. Me, I laugh my ass off, peering up from underground with my shovel in tow. Thank you all for having me.
where it's made flat. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank Jahan and Shakoya for sharing this labor of love with us. You brought something magical into being. I am honored that our paths have crossed and to have the chance to call you dear friends. It is truly a delight to share this space with such brilliant scholars, activists, and creative theorists. For the sake of time, um, I'd like to jump right in if everyone's okay with that. All right. So, first we have Opal Palmer Adisa. Opal Palmer Adisa, gender specialist, cultural activist, and writer, is the former brilliant university director. Space, such brilliant scholars, activists, and creative theorists. Oh. Meta. Of time. Um, I'd like to jump right in if everyone's okay with that. All right. First, we have Opal Palmer Adisa. Opal Palmer Adisa. Quick standby. Yes, quick standby. Just a little uh, feedback. Okay, hello, sorry about that. I think what's happening is someone is watching live um, in the room right now, so that's why we're having a little bit of feedback. Um, so would I just say, I guess, turn off that version? When you say in the room, you mean in this room? In, the, in the Zoom room. Should I try again? You're not echoing. Okay. That's a good move. I'm so sorry. I apologize. This is just, here we are. <laughs> okay, I apologize. Opal Palmer Adisa, gender specialist, cultural activist, and writer, is the former university director of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies. Adisa believes that literature and the performance arts are the best approaches to interrogate gender inequality and formulate an approach to gender justice. A feminist activist for four decades, Adisa has published 20 collections that includes essays, novels, short stories, poetry collections, and children's books. Her areas of focus are gender-based violence and ending child sexual and physical abuse. Her essays, stories, poems, and articles have been anthologized in over 400 publications. She has just completed the authorized children's biography of Portia Simpson Miller entitled Portia Dreams, Jamaica's first female prime minister, and is the editor of 100 plus voices for Miss Lou, poetry, tribes, interviews, and essays, the, w, the UWI, excuse me, press 2021. Please, whenever you're ready to begin. Thank you very much. I want to just thank you all for organizing this conference and for inviting me. I'm primarily going to read from my very new book that came out in March. Uh, so it just it's just out uh, and it's called The Storyteller's Return. And actually, it's a perfect text to read from because it really looks at the whole issue of textuality. One of the challenges I've had as a writer, particularly as a poet, is always trying to find the topography and also trying to find the composition. How does the poem sit on the page that somehow mimics what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling? And in all of my collections uh, from the very, you know, big face, not big face and other guava stories, but um, Tamarin and Mango Woman, I Name Me Name, um, Eros Muse and all of these other poetry collections. I've always been struggling with the textuality of it. And with this collection, The Storyteller's Return also presented that challenge for me because I'm always trying to render the meaning in conjunction with the landscape. And there's always a disjunction that happens in a similar way that there's a disjunction that happens in the European um, chronology of time, past, present, and future. Because anyone who's familiar with the Caribbean knows that there are those spaces when there is no past, no present, no future, that they all collide. And I've always, even in my novels and short stories, have been trying to find a way to transcend that, to textualize that. So let me start with this poem. Um, I think I have 10 minutes, you know, holler at me when I reach that time, and I'll just 
try to talk about it. And what occurred to me, because you're not going to be able to see this, that I should have actually sent some of these texts so you could see how they're written. Because even in the very first text, the first half of the book, I have two voices. I have the storyteller's voice and then I have the grandmother's voice. And they're, you know, on, on the same side of the page. But one might not be sure how to read them. As someone said to me, do I go across or do I go down and then start the other one? Anyway, here goes. Memories lie. Home is a lie. Emotions subvert everything. Historians are trustworthy. Home smells like a freshly cut lime. Seeds dug out before being squeezed into the glass. Pulp dripping to the lid. Home is a dresser drawer pulled open, rummaged through, and on the tissue paper and nylon slips are letters wrapped in handkerchief. The cursive lean and slanted words are smeared. I did not mean to. What's legible is a mystery. It was such a long time. Old lines faded, watermarks, trails. Your father was a man sealed into a buried home. Grandma insists that I listen. Home is a fishbowl she laughs falling off the chair. Her tears water the plants. And so there is this, you know, there are these subtexts that are happening in the first part of the narrative. And then the second narrative of, of course, it's, it's the grandmother's voice. And how do you, how do, you know, grappling with that as a writer in terms of how do I translate that on the physical page, but also how do I translate that in terms of the, you know, the whole mental working out of text. This other poem that I want to, um, that I'm going to share continues the challenge that I have presented for myself, you know, and I, and I sometimes wish I was one of those poets who just write the poem in basically how we said a poem should be written. But I was listening in on the session before and someone mentions Norby's Phyllis, who is a the Trinidadian writer whose work I very much love and teach. And certainly from her first uh, text, um, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name and I've taught it so much. Um, that, that, that won the, the Cuban prize. Anyway, you know, she experimented again with the layout. I'm sure Aza could tell me what that is or anybody out there. And then of course her Zong and, you know, Marlene talks about trying to imagine or to create the sound and the spaces that were in the holes of those ships. This is the way, uh, so this, this next poem is, is called Accident. When you fall and scrape your knee or elbow, there is no alphabet to shelter home. You remember the night you, your sister and mother, were picking your way through a foreign road to reach a house that would become a home. Your mother had gnashed her knee, blood streamed down her leg, pooled at her feet. The heavy suitcases made the path zigzagged, so home seemed that much further. Grandma ran away from her father's home, built herself a roundhouse, planted crotons, and put up a triangular sign which reads, This is Fimi Home. So there again, you see the text that's happening and the way in which as a writer and specifically as a Jamaican writer growing up in Jamaica and the way we write and tell stories and the way we jump from something that happened long ago to something that's happening now um, and the way we blend in different stories. I'm always trying to put that on page. And I don't think I've done that successfully yet, but I keep experimenting. So this theme and this topic is very much in keeping with my exploration as a writer uh, of both prose and poetry and children's book in terms of how do we render our lived reality, you know, our lived reality, the orality of it, the visuality of it, the pacing of it, how do we, as people who have been borrowing the English language, we have a Jamaican nation language, but how do we textualize that? So in this uh, next poem, which is called Turning Three, um, I think I, I, I expressed it in a, in a much more effective way. Wrapping her arms around Lily's neck, she was lifted from the bed and spoon-fed banana porridge. 
stand, standing on the site where she was born, the storyteller burped. The house in which she was born had been torn down, but that did not mean she had not been born there, nor that her mother hadn't been ironing, ironing clothes when her water bag broke, and when the cramps wound her back, she stomped her feet and stomped the iron on her husband's work shirt, burning out the pocket, the room singed in smoke. Her mother trampling from one foot to the next and hollering, mercy, mercy, let this child be born safe. Home was the wet floor and a beige shirt with the pocket burnt out, neatly folded in a drawer. The storyteller had witnessed fights and bodies somersaulting the stern. So as you can hear in that poem, you know, it's about the birth and it's about the history of how that bird happened. But then the last line takes us way back to the Middle Passage and the memories. And this book is really about memories and home and how these memories and the history of who we are as a people in the so-called New World collide. And how do we make sense of that? How do we write that in any, I want to say coherent, but coherent is not even the right word to use because it is not at all coherent. You know, Erna Broadbury, the Jamaican writer says, all of us in the new world have to be a little mad, a little crazy because we've survived the middle passage. So for me to even try for it to be coherent is, <laughs> you know, paradoxical or uh, I don't even know what to say it is. It is what it is. Okay. So I'm going to do two more so that we can have a little time with others and we can uh, talk. Um, so returning home, you know, I lived in California for almost 25 years and then I returned home to Jamaica and I didn't think it would have taken me that long. It is something I'd always planned to do. And so when I announced it, my children says, but mommy, that's what you've been telling us since we were growing up. And returning home has been wonderful. You know, some people have bad experiences so far, maybe because I live in my head and it's euphoric. I've had a really good experience. And this book is about returning home. I started it when I came home and it's about the way we remember our childhood and the past conflicts and sometimes conflates and sometimes is reinforced by what we experience now and I'm very lucky because I'm living in a place which is not the place where I grew up but is very much like the place where I grew up um, she often kept company with the birds. The yard man, which is pronounced Adam's apple, taught her how to whistle like various birds, frequently neglecting to trim the edges, which made her mother cross. They shut the storyteller away in the closet room devoid of colors. She was delusional. They were giving her time to follow the rules, to stop being a heresy, creating chaos. The past was behind them, even if not forgiven. She was not their griot charged with their history. Her stories were too heavy, calamity and misfortune, cliches, rubbish, move on. The storyteller bit her lips, pressed her hands to her mouth, but still bauxite spilled out. If you tore the line, home can be a sanctuary of protection. But of course, most writers are rebels, so we never told the line. So there's never the sanctuary that we dream of, you know? We're troublemakers, sometimes not because we want to. I mean, I don't think I want to be a troublemaker. I just happen to be a troublemaker because bauxite spill out, you know? Um, and I hope those of you know that aluminum, all of that aluminum that you guys think is very normal, that Jamaica at one point was the third just large box, Bauxite, and as a result, we have you know polluted many of our rivers, and now there's another group of colonialists who want to continue to mine and pollute. But that's part of my rebelness. Anyway, um, so I, I, I'll, I'm going to close with this one: Days of Return. Um, everyone who leaves thinks about home and plans to return at some point. Memories of baskets stacked with ackee feels as parched as the devil's mouth. Home loops through the storyteller's mind. Home, a word of hunger and longing. 
Some vow never to return. Some want returning to be a special occasion. Some plot their return. Monday might be the best day to return, everyone at work and school. Your rival is secretive, no witness to feed the susu. Tuesday evening might be a best way to begin. Children are getting ready for bed, you slip in unnoticed. No, Wednesday when the bread is almost gone, slip in while the helper is cleaning and pause to relive your first kiss at 13, tongue in your mouth and you wondering, should you bite or sup or something else? Maybe you should return on Thursday during the cricket match, sit on the spectator's bench, shout and rise from your seat when the batman bowls a six. No, Friday may be the best day, join the men going home from work. You stop to pick and wolf down mangoes, pick at the hairs traced, trapped between your teeth. You couldn't imagine that there might be another place different from home you knew as home that would steal you away forever or for a long time or forever or even longer than forever a similar home but not the home you knew and loved for everyone who has left and is thriving and thinking about returning there is an anglican church at caymanus estate with a ledger dating back more than 50 years that captures your mother's commitment to godmothering many children who needed bread exercise books school uniforms an educated person to speak to the principal about how they might how they they are and regardless of class should be directed towards the academic track when home does not offer the possibility to become more or equal for all. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Home is something that I'm always thinking through and reckoning with, so I really, really appreciate that. Next we have Jafari Allen. Jafari Sinclair Allen is currently inaugural co-director of the University of Miami Center for Global Black Studies and director of Africana Studies at the University of Miami. His second monograph, There's a Disco Ball Between Us, A Theory of Black Gay Life, was released by Duke University Press this year. His scholarship and teaching has opened new lines of inquiry and offered reinvigorated methods of black feminist narrative theorizing in anthropology, black studies, and queer studies. At work on two monographs, Marooned in Miami, Ecologies of Black Life on an Edge, and Structural Adjustments, Global Black Survival in the 1980s, Professor Allen is the author of Venceremos, The Erotics of Black Self-Making in Cuba, editor of Black Queer Diaspora, and a number of other publications. Engaged in ethnographic research in Cuba and the Caribbean for more than 20 years, recent research has also taken him to East Africa, Brazil, and Western Europe. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you uh, for having me. And uh, thank you so much uh, to the organizers, to Taylor, to Shakoya, to Jahan for envisioning this and for welcoming us into the space. Uh, thank you for those who, who spoke this morning. I've been in and out because I've been in, been in class, but I was, I was so um, fortunate to begin my day uh, begin my academic day uh, with the earlier, earlier space, earlier spaces, and I'm still thinking about that uh, the the Audrey Audrey Lord uh, offerings that um, that our sister Alexis offered, and here we are again this morning. Um, we begin with uh, the inimitable Opal, Opal Palmer Adisa who has evidently written the same book that I have written um, and in the same time frame, because we are both concerned with telling it, with the telling it of, of it, of trying, she says, to render lived reality, of, um, of trying to textualize, I call it re-narrativize uh, old stories instead of trying to dream up uh, something new that will be so slick and cool that I would be America's next top prof and be selected by uh, Tyra Banks, etc. But rather to think about life, to be in life and to be in uh, the experience and to remember. And so I am going to 
uh, I'm going to put my timer on because I timed myself perfectly earlier. And then as uh, Opal read, I thought, no, I need to read this part too. Um, so I will just very quickly, since we talked about place, I'm going to go to my place. Uh, my parents' place includes the Caribbean, but my place is in New York in Queens and we talk fast. And if I talk like I'm from Queen, like I'm really from Queens, I may be able to get it all in. So here we go. Um, before I begin the piece that I, uh, I plan to, to read from the book, there it is. Um, I'm just going to, since uh, we've, all of this poetry has been in the room and poetry is central to what I've written, just do two pieces before, or talk about two little pieces before I get to put your body in it. And the first is uh, I begin here uh, by talking about a mirrored pool of brilliance from, uh, from Dr. Margaret Walker, right? Again, another poet who tried to render lived reality and who, while we are still trying, I think she got it, right? Um, and then uh, we move to our friend Elizabeth Alexander, who in her Ars Poetica, the first time I read it, I thought, She's talking about poetry, but she's really also for me talking about ethnography. And so I respectfully replaced poetry with ethnography. And it sounds like this. Ethnography, I tell my students, is idiosyncratic. Ethnography is where we are ourselves. Ethnography is what you find in the dirt in the corner over here on the bus. God in the details, the only way to get from here to there. Ethnography, and now I hear my voice is rising, is the human voice. And are we not of interest to one another? Then I move on later on to Amy Cercel, who saw it this way. In the current state of things, the only avowed refuge of the mythic spirit is poetry. And poetry is an insurrection against society because it is a devotion to abandoned or exiled or obliterated thought, myth, excuse me. The vital thing is to reestablish a personal, fresh, compelling, magical contact with things. The revolution will be social and poetic or it will not be. I'm calling upon the magician. I'm calling upon the enraged. And my work, there's a disco ball between us, tries to re-narrativize, to remember and to theorize a disco poetic, a black gay sensibility. And so of course, am I gonna be able to share my screen music? No, so I'm not, but I'm gonna play it and hope that you can hear it and feel it, which also has to begin and, uh, and entice us to use our bodies, to enjoy our bodies and with music. So here we have this play. Can you hear? If you can hear it, wave your hand. You may have noticed that this groove is intramural here we are among friends and our mode of intellectual engagement is a dance. Cue Stephanie Mills, 1979, Invitation and Command. Put your body in it. Picture yourself on a pulsating dance floor or comfortable spot among friends or fellow party goers in a tightly packed fet. I hope that you have had this experience of safety, generosity, and deeply embodied pleasure. What we do here, moving through one theoretical position to the other, one disciplinary commitment, interpretation, or, or intellectual habit to one that might fit better or might precise more, more precisely for the moment, is that ever so gentle hand on your back, hip, or shoulder, unobtrusive, Without disturbing your rhythm, it suggests, invites, impels. This way, please. We unconsciously move aside to let another stirred by the DJ or on the way to the bar pass on their way. Straighter texts brushly push past the writer whose pen precedes it. Not here. Our engagement is not a sidestep or a dance around. It is something more intimate and mutual. The gesture is in tandem, if not syncopation. 
After all, this groove is not about supplanting or imitating other formulations or strictly arguing our own. This follows other modes of intellectual generosity, like Carol Boyce Davies' critical relationality. Likewise, a Herstonian hermeneutic is at work and at play here, but this is much sweatier. It is perhaps more embodied, more erotic, and taken over by the shared experience of feeling the base in your chest. Something, the intimacy, sometimes the intimacy is less personal, simply a respectful sharing of space. Other times it inspires a little shimmy or a reciprocated touch. In a few cases in our conversation, the move will resemble that more suggestive furtive touch on the small of your back as another dancer passes your way, a tiny piece of perverse heaven. But most times we will simply waltz our way from one end of the dance floor conversation to another. I understand that some, and unfortunately in increasing numbers, prefer to haunt the perimeters of the party, perhaps suspicious of the laughter and what may look like intramural ease or fluency. Seeing these merely as gestures of everyday aliveness may allay your reticence to come closer. These are attempts at connection. Whether you dance or not, you are an important part of this communion. Like critical relationality, this is an intellectual strategy of deep listening and conversation marked by going a piece of the way with one theoretical framework or discourse, then with another, knowing that the length of fellow traveling is contingent on how effectively and affectively it takes one where one wants to go. Carol's critical relationality saunters elegantly along long, winding, and often rocky roads of the sort of critical ethical stance we want to invoke here. One can almost hear the clink of her gold bangles and the smell and smile in her warm, lilting voice. Critical relationality, Carol says, is a process and a pattern of articulation, a way of relating to visitors of diff or, or difference is embedded in, embedded in this approach. She wants to, quote, engage a number of theoretical models, including feminism, postmodernism, Afrocentricity, nationalism, etc., as visitors. To honestly engage in this way, we must also eschew opportunistic fashions in favor of a more capacious and fluid models, including those that have already been overlooked or misunderstood. I'm going to go fast. So what sort of moment is this in which to raise this question? Today, the political economic landscape is stony and contradictory. The economic outlook is dire and there are new reminders every day of the banal denial of black beauty, black dignity, humanity, and life. Thus, we are living through technologies of the changing same. So out of our political, economic, and cultural crisis and precisely to stage the inauguration of a new and more possible meeting, that's Audrey, of course, of disciplines, commitments, aesthetics, geographies, and temporalities, this work enters to offer another way, exceeding the current limits of social science scholarship. You may think of this book, this invitation, as an uninvited new iteration of the Black radical intellectual tradition, re-narrativizing social cultural analysis through an insistence on end both intersections, compounds, hyphens, strokes, parentheses, and messy interstices, intersections, understanding that our black interiors are neither inviolate nor completely destroyed, nor hollowed of humanity that reaches out to one another. Yes, that we have interiors, that we are. We out here, I hear my students shouting in the street, we be, let this confirm that what let this confirm what we who live through this nadir also know and must remind ourselves together we add up we add up to more than the calculus of our compounded vulnerabilities that's my nine minutes and 47 <laughs> seconds and i'll stop there to look forward to the conversation <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, your mention of gestures of aliveness made me think of uh, Lyrae's mention of trying to bring poetry into the body and uh, bringing, invoking dance to feel poetry within the body. So thank you for that. Next we have Donna Azawir Soleil. 
Dr. Donna Azawir Saleh is the president of the Association of Caribbean Women Writers and Scholars, otherwise known as ACWWS, and former coordinator of the Mellon Foundation's Hispanic Serving Institutions Pathways to the Professoriate Fellowship at Florida Inst International University. She's also an associate professor of English and affiliate faculty in African and African Diaspora Studies, the Center for Women and Gender Studies, and the Latin American and Caribbean Center, LACC, at FIU. And Andrew W. Mellon and Citizens and Scholars Fellow, formerly Woodrow Wilson, Weir Soleil is the author of Eroticism, Spirituality and Resistance in Black Women's Writings, two poetry collections, First Rain and The Woman Who Knew, and co-editor of Caribbean Erotic, which features essays, fiction, and poetry from 62 writers from the English-speaking, Spanish-speaking, and French-speaking Caribbean. Her critical and creative writings have been widely published in national and international forums, including scholarly and literary journals and edited volumes. Thank you so much. Oh, you're muted. Thank you, thank you so much. And I must add co-editor of Caribbean Erotic with none other than Professor Opal Palma Adisa, <laughs> my dissertation director from the University of California, Berkeley. So if you are very, very good, you may get a chance to co-edit a book with your dissertation director as well. And it is a pleasure to be on a panel with her again and with Jafari Allen for the very first time. I hope it won't be the last. And I just want to thank Professor Cara Boyce Davies and all of her graduate students, particularly Shakoya and Jehan, who responded to all of my questions really promptly and just made me feel like I was not just an old woman who did not understand the technology and, and, needed, and needed to be walked through everything. Thank you so much for your graciousness about that. And so I am under pressure having to go after br the brilliant Professor Adisa and the brilliant uh, Dr. Allen, and also to keep time doing it. So let me see, it is now 4.16. Let me see if I can do it in 10 minutes. I don't know, but I will try. Sojourner, self-made woman. Truth is, Sojourner was a mystic and a sage, consorting with Mama Bet's God in the sky. One by one, she stacked her pain, her losses, and her many traumas into a stairway to heaven to, rest, to wrestle from God. The, that power, the world told her, was not her birthright and made a liar out of men, gods, and devils. Truth is, Sojourner was a natural mystic, a self-made Black woman in the 19th century. In her groundbreaking essay, The Race for Theory, Dr. Barbara Christian champions Black women's creative theorizing in narrative forms, in the stories we create, in riddles and proverbs, in the play with language, because dynamic rather than fixed ideas seem more to our liking. I want us to think about the ways in which Sojourner Truth's self-representation extends that idea and challenges us to read her, to see her, the way she wanted to be seen and read based on the record she left for us. Sojourner called herself a self-made woman. Critics argue that indeed she created an image that at times run counter to their, their ideas of who she was historically. For example, Sojourner did not live in the South, but when Frances Gage wrote her famous, or infamous, depending on how you look at it, speech, Aren't I a Woman, in 1851, the speech that she said Sojourner Truth gave at the 1851 um, Women's Convention in Ohio, Gage represented Sojourner's speech as Southern dialect, dialect and made other spurious claims such as that Truth had 13 children, which both of which I tries to identify um, Truth with Southern slavery, slavery when she was in fact um, a Northern slave. Um, the record only gives us five children when Truth never admitted to having 13, although her mother had 12. According to some critics, Truth's actions after the fact did not indicate that she soundly rejected those characterizations. They cite as example, the fact that Gage's speech appears in Truth's book of life, a scrapbook of sorts that includes letters, 
and other writings by famous individuals or by ordinary people who held her in high esteem. Taken together, the compilation in Book of Life demonstrates unequivocally the far-reaching fame and influence of this woman who was born a slave and never learned to read and write. Critics who scrutinize Truth's failure to correct written misrepresentations of her seem to forget what it means to not be literate. Sojourner operates skillfully within the wheelhouse of orality. Do they then assume that she had the entire contents of these writings read to her, to her or understood subtle cues and codes of written works? On what basis? Do they also assume that if indeed someone sat down and read all of these writings to her, there could have been no editorial changes made after that reading that she was not aware of? Critics are familiar with the publishing world and know how it works, so how come? Whatever the agenda of these critics, what they managed to establish is that Sojourner deliberately and intentionally courted some of these misrepresentations or let some things slide because they served her larger agenda to set herself down in history in a particular way. But how did this come about? How did this woman who suffered systemic rape and physical abuse typical to the slave experience, had her first child at age 13, had some of her children taken from her, lost her mother when she was fairly young, and was even subjected to sexual abuse from one of her mistresses as well as from her masters, developed such a strong sense of self that she was able to invent a new identity and make of herself an icon, a figure so well known and so highly respected that when writer Harriet Beecher Stowe of the infamous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, mistakenly thought Truth had died, she wrote a lengthy, if overly sentimental and chock full of Stowe's trademark racist caricatures, obituary for Sojourner. Titled The Libyan, uh, Libyan Civil, the piece not only increased Stowe's reputation as a writer, but also added to Sojourner Truth's national fame. Truth later included Stowe's piece in her book of life, along with letters from other famous Americans, including one from President Lincoln. Oh, I see you in truth, Mama Sojourner, rising from the wallow of self-abnegation and self-hate, where you let your children starve, worshiping some false god of immorality that stole their bread, trying to be good by someone else's definition, a definition that canceled you, broke you, hammered your life into submission and self-sacrifice at the altar of white gods feeding on your annihilation. How Sojourner grew from object to subject is instructive. Sojourner tells her amanuensis, Olive Gilbert, that she once denied food to her children in order to obey the dictates of her master against stealing and prided herself on the fact that the fruits of her womb added to his acquisition of property, privilege, and power. Gilbert suggests that Sojourner told this story with some level of shame, chastising her former self for being naive and brainwashed. So... From whence came this dramatic turnaround from pitiful object to iconic subject? We can look to Isabella's conversion experiences for the answer. Imani Perry asserts that Sojourner had two conversion experiences. The first is her religious conversion, and the second is her, is her change of name and identity. I submit that for truth, the above two conversions are imbricated and impossible to separate. Truth, like Jarena Lee, like old Elizabeth, who wrote um, spiritual, both of whom wrote spiritual narratives, all make the same claim in very similar language that their newly empowered identity after conversion came directly from and through their relationship with God. Sojourner learned about an all powerful, all seeing God in the sky from her mother, Mama Beth. When she's living with the Dumont's truth had no privacy and no place to pray. So she finds a place in the woods where she can meditate, pray, and petition for God as her mother, petition God as her mother had taught her to do. Truth's altar in the woods is a place of natural beauty, serenity, privacy, and peace, much like baby Sugg's altar in the clearing in Morrison's Beloved. It is therefore not a stretch to imagine that she gathered scraps of spiritual knowledge from her mother that her mother intuited to her, what she gleaned from the limited religious teachings by her masters, and what was revealed to her through her conversion experiences. Over time, this syncretic, 
fragmented, experimental, but powerful sense of spiritual agency, perhaps inclusive of low Dutch religious practices, Protestant Christian teachings, West African beliefs and spiritual practices, mysticism, transcendentalism, and other extant doctrines and practices of that era, known as the Second Awakening, came to inform Sojourner Truth's foundational wheelhouse of spirituality, birthed and augmented her strong sense of self and developed a powerful new identity for her, one that she used to reinvent herself, to fashion the sojourner self in opposition to the no self that slavery had pounded into her since birth. For decades, I have pondered on what more you might have achieved. Had you access to the page and the power of the pen, now I wonder if I have been second guessing the worth of your intellect, finding your education wanting for not being as formal as my own. Clearly you had all you personally needed to leave your stamp upon history, to live forever in our hearts and minds and records, influencing us into time immemorial. In truth, you stand as standard bearer to these truths that reading is not limited to book learning and intelligence is not granted by diplomas, certificates, or institutions. You who read the people and the room and the mood of the era and responded with vision, prescience, and right action is our teacher in this era also, reminding us that our worth is not to be measured by burnt offerings to false gods. Our worth is intrinsic, free, and God-given to be taken by us in the fullness of our power. Um, Imani Perry also um, argues that Sojourner Truth saw her name as something she owned and could protect against desecration by others, even those who are white and wealthy. Her investment in her rep reputation at a time when black people were routinely subjected as, an, as, sub subjected as an entire group to racist stereotypes that obviated Ob obviated rather any notion of a good name is almost unbelievable. Not quite unbelievable, this notion that yourself was yours to name, to claim inviolable, this self-baptism under a new name, Sojourner, on whose home is the earth growing wherever her feet may take her, this name change, a second conversion from adherent and follower of the word to word maker, world shaper, mover, shaker, self-definer. My name is no longer Isabella. Call me Sojourner Truth. I am going east. The spirit calls me there and I must go to testify of the hope that is within me to speak my truth. From that point forward, Sojourner Truth's, Sojourner Truth's life became a catalog of heroic acts. She petitioned Congress for land for free blacks, made friends with famous people all across the nation, became the spokesperson for many of the utopian communities she joined, preached and taught the word based upon her own understanding of the relationship between righteousness and justice and equality, always combining her religion with her politics, her preaching and teaching to her quest for race and gender liberation. Imani asserts that Truth's articulation of her rights through motherhood makes it undeniable that she should be designated as one of the foremothers of Black feminism. Indeed, Sojourner's first recorded act of heroism is her pursuit of a lawsuit to return her son Peter from Southern slavery. She won this suit against overwhelming odds, mostly by virtue of her dogged persistence, the strength of her ability to persuade others to enlist in and fully support her cause, and her unwavering faith that God would help her to get her son back. In response to her slave mistress, Mrs. Dumont, who told her she had no means to retrieve her son from the South, Sojourner stated, I have no money, but God has enough or what's better, and I'll have my child again. Oh my God, I knew I'd have him again. I was sure God would help me to get him. Why, I felt so tall within, I felt as if the power of a nation was within me. Many claim Sojourner Truth as a foremother of Black feminism. She's also the foremother of the civil rights movement as we know it, having petitioned against segregated streetcars in D.C. after the Civil War and won. Truth is also, Truth is also foremother of the reparations movement, having petitioned Congress for land out west for free Blacks in D.C. who were poverty stricken and suffering after the Civil War. I submit to you that she may also be claimed as a foremother of queer clapbacks. In an 1851 anti-slavery meeting in Indiana, pro-slavery Democrats challenged Truth's identity as a woman and misgendered her. They tried to shame her by demanding that she bare her breasts to prove she was a woman. 
Sojourner subverted the shame tactic by telling them the shame was their own, not hers. She bared her breast to flaunt their shaming tactics that were purely based on respectability and conventions of feminine propriety. Then she issued a counter challenge of her own. Bear these breasts? These breasts that suckled white babes at the expense of my own? In truth, these breasts are makers of men men far superior to you. You so wanting in manhood, you dare to deny us our humanity. You so starved of spiritual sustenance, you find yourself lacking in all that is good and God. These breasts you deride, hold your salvation. I bid you come, suck, make of yourself a man. Both um, critics argue that Truth took advantage of certain misrepresentations of herself some critics state that Truth represented her meeting with Pre President Lincoln more favor favorably than it actually went. Imani Perry argues that it is because Truth remembered that Truth recognized that she spoke for the black race. Her cause needed Lincoln, a president, to be remembered as humane to an illiterate black woman so they might continue to hope and to hold dear the promises of reconstruction. Critic Augusta Robark argues that truth allows some depictions to stand because she found them useful in her self-fashioning. Robark points to truth's favorite picture, which is constructed to preserve an image of womanhood that was consistent with the conventions of femininity of that era. If y'all could put the picture back up, that would really be good. Both Perry and Robark comment about the frequency with which Sojourner had herself photographed and her intentionality in the construction of these images. Perry argues that truth was not just arguing for the recognition of her womanhood, but also for her unrecognized beauty. I see you standing outside the door after one of your fiery speeches, a stack of note cards in your hands, selling that clean cut image of a woman dressed modestly with a simple white covering, a fringed white shawl draping your shoulders, your knitting in your hand, the knitting needle announcing itself a table with a book on it that you, could, that you could not read and a vase with flowers. The light hitting your cheekbones highlight gold undertones beneath that dark brown skin akin to mine. Small horn rimmed glasses suggest color, accentuating a humble elegance and sophistication the way you want to be remembered. The constructed you, you want to sell us. In charge at last of your image, you put every convention to use. Navigating and negotiating like a true baller, shot caller, selling the shadow of the self to support the substance, still hidden. We theorize and dissertate and turn ourselves inside out, trying to get to you, trying to push past what you show us, what you want us to see and know, as if there is a truer you to be discovered, as if you did not invent yourself, fashioned in your own image, using all the tools and all the weapons made available, as if your efforts were not good enough for us, as if we need to see you and see See you bleed more than we already knew you did, to see you dirtied, flawed to pieces as if suffering is the real you. Oh, the violence of our desires for the one truth. Today, I fully declare myself satisfied with the way you work so hard to with the you you work so hard to give to me the gift of you as beautiful, dressed up and sitting at your leisure, inviting the camera to come close, but not too close, calling the shots. Sojourner Truth. Yeah. How powerful. I'm going to fly through this so that Amiris <laughs> has enough time. That was wonderful, Professor. Um, Amiris brings together black feminist thought, visual studies, black disability studies, and psychoanalysis to examine the interrelation between social desirability and political disposability in African diasporic literary and visual culture. She experiments within the narrative, challenges, and possibilities posed at the intersection of intimacy and expendability through methods that are critical, creative, and somatic. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Africana Studies at Cornell University and has been awarded fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and the Whitney Independent Study. Yes. Thank you for being here. Um, I feel like I need a break <laughs> after that, um, but I'm, I want to move along because um, the greatest gift is for us to be able to talk with each other. Thank you, Jahan. Uh, thank you, Shakoya. This is incredible. Thank you, Taylor. Um, 
okay, let me time myself. And thank you for the, the provocation, um, words made flesh. Uh, so this begins with an epigraph um, from Dion Brand's map to the door of no return. To live in the black diaspora, I think, is to live as a fiction, a creation of empires and also self-creation. It is to be a being living inside and outside of herself. It is to apprehend the sign one makes, yet to be unable to escape it, except in radiant moments of ordinariness made like art. To be a fiction in search of its most resonant metaphor, then is even more intriguing. So I am scouring maps of all kinds, the way that some fictions do, discursively, elliptically, trying to locate their own transferred selves. I've entitled this meditation, Mapping Timeless Being, in an effort to draw upon the synchronicity of two works that bless and haunt my life and make clearer meaning to me when read together. These are Hortense Spiller's diagram in Chosen Place, Timeless People, Some Figurations on the New World, and Belkis Ion's series of concentric collagraphs produced in 1998. Reading the works discursively, elliptically, trying to locate the artist's notion of transferred selves, I want to suggest that these two artists invoke flesh as a metaphor and a vehicle that disturb systems of human priority in modernity. Given the panel's title, I do not want to suspend the major theoretical insights for which Spillers is popular, popularly known, namely her distinction between the body and the flesh in captive versus liberated subject positions. However, I want to expand on Spillers' contribu contributions to new world being, not only as a theoretician for which we call upon her, but as a visual artist who offers technical illustrations of stolen and invented life. I offer an abbreviated philosophical meditation on the artworks, Spiller's Diagram of Timeless Being, as a portal through which to read Ion's portrait. Portal, 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 we're reading. <laughs> in this excerpt from a chapter in my dissertation, I'm concerned with how these artists draw upon the fleshly thresholds of timelessness as a conceptual vantage point where prevailing notions of social revolution reconsider those it has sacrificed for the possibility of its gains. This meditation is held together by a set of investigative questions. These are, how do cultural theorists draw? Why do black feminist philosophers engrave the notion of timeless being into our theoretical and practical horizons? How do Spillers and Ion narrate the event of self-invention and self-erasure as rituals for survival? Spillers, this is on the, uh, on the left. Spillers calls it a diagram, but I think of it as a map and that it offers wisdom about how not to lose ourselves in the world. I realize you all can't read that well. Circles of myth is on the outside. Circles of history, circle of ritual, circle of ontology. She tells us, these circles of involvement, myth, history, ritual, and ontology identify the primary structural and dramatic features of the world and that our understanding of character and motivation takes shape. In a crisis, we sit at the center of a set of social rings. At the center is she who is afflicted, and beyond that are her rituals for survival, encircled by a sense of herself as a historical agent, and finally, by the myth of her rumored life. In order to discern something about our Caribbean intellectual inheritances and our sense of new world being, Spillers routes us through the realm of, time, of the timeless. We might ask, in what ring do we most often find ourselves trying to be understood as a matter of our own survival? 
Spiller's map of timeless being gives us a sense of the problem space that Ayon inhabits between living as a fiction and the symbol of a self. Here lies the narrative entanglement where I believe the works make portals toward mapping an agent outside of her social meaning. Oh cool, it got bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the left. Belkis Ayon was a prolific calligrapher, philosopher, and teacher. At the age of 21, Ayon emerged from art school into a global art scene and throughout the 1980s and 90s was celebrated for bringing calligraphic depictions to the Awakua, a fraternal order originating in southeastern Nigeria and southwestern Cameroon. Critics have described her work as allegorical, iconographic, a, symbol, a symbolic representation of a religious order for which she did not practice as an Afro-Cuban woman. In early works, Ayon reintroduces the figure of Sikan, the sacrificed princess of the Awakua legend materialized by the skin of the ceremonial drums, as a figure who foils at the social, religious, and patriarchal plot of her works. Cristina Vives tells us, interpreting her body of work from a socio-historical perspective that, quote, we reach the depth of her ethical positions and understand her as an artist immersed in a time and place in which art was able to carry a camouflaged social militancy with conceptual mastery, end quote. The universe of relations reflected in Ayon's work anticipated the social and political realities experienced under Castro's revolution. The sense of personal and collective impairment, the squeezing out of undesirables from cities, the totemic collapse of democracy, the instant institutionalization of the artist's life, the squandering of revolutionary politics, and the dissolution of justice as a legal or social protocol. In 1998, Belkis Ayon withdrew from the messianic, scenic-driven works and began to produce a series of concentric portraits where she and the figure of Sikan, who over the years began to resemble the artist in shape and size, become, where they become fictively enmeshed, two bodies that cannot be separated nor understood in isolation. Unlike Ayon's earlier work, these portraits, by contrast, make demands on the reader's power to interpret the symbolic institution of sacrifice as a metaphor for living inside the present social order. I'm, I got the rest of this page. Okay, are we at 10? That's okay. Okay, so sorry. I'm so, okay, I still have, I'm looking at my timer, I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sentence was, um, unlike Ayon's earlier work, these portraits by contrast, by contrast make demands on the reader's power to interpret the symbolic institution of sacrifice as a metaphor for living inside the present social order. A sacred character is a disposable character, disposable because she is sacred, René Girard tells us. In the calligraph depicted, pairs of eyes peer out from a circle, a circle we could perceive to be the world. Hands belonging to no body grasped from behind the perceivable world at its periphery. A shield, a portal, a reflection, one feels there is a crisis at the center. Someone is trapped beyond a discernible surface. Unable to ha inhabit the location of the figure within, there is a sense of another realm that is not grasping for us. While the late 20th century marked the rise of political affiliation as an individual expression of one's humanity and social worth, Ayon understood that no political affiliation would derail the state's aspirations of absorbing and disposing of human life as it saw fit. In acoso, harassment, the image there, I read Ayon's theory of social annihilation and its function to make disappearance seem self-inflicted. Rather than assertion of a clear feminist or anarchist position, Ayon's methods offer us a critique of the contours of intimacy and social regard that, explat that exploit black life in modernity. So this is concluding. <laughs> 
for those who seek refuge outside the narrative conventions of modernity and beyond the visual field of representation, those dysfunctional, unproductive, wayward black subjects who surrender to nonconformity because incoherence is the only possibility for living. Timeless being is a metaphor for living outside the domain of the present social order. Spiller's diagrammatic drawing offers us a conceptual field to imagine what emerges at the center of Ayon's aesthetic realm, a vantage point, an appropriation of systems of sacrifice and human disposal, a body that grasps at, a, at the perceivable world from its periphery. Through engraving and through black feminist diagrammatic thinking, we might map what emerges from the fold of desire and need and sketch the limits of what we can feel, the status of living in the black diaspora as a fiction. This demands the question black feminist poet and scholar Ramalaika Imhotep asks, do we want to end the world or take ourselves out of it? That's it. <laughs> Thank you so, 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 so much. Amazing. Um, so we're technically on break, but I feel awful about not having a Q&A. What yeah, do you want to do? Let's have a few minutes. Chris, is that OK? Yeah, let's have a, a few minutes of Q&A. OK, perfect. Um, does anybody have any questions in the audience? or in the chat. Is there, where's the mic? I was gonna say, we don't need a Q&A. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay, yes. awesome. Thank you all for your amazing generative discussion. Um, I found that each one of your pieces kind of talk about this powerful sense of returning home, whether that be a geographical place or would that be bodily in sort of this fashioning world, whether that's in the dance floor or in the woods or at home or in the mind as well. But I wanted to know if, if you each can talk a little bit more about this sort of analysis of bodily proximity with other bodies while also being attuned to your own. Hmm. That's a big question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Time, but let me let me just say, in in conceptualizing and writing my piece, return the storytellers return. In a sense, there are bodies that are interconnected because I'm looking at the griot. The storyteller is the griot in the new world, and in order for the the storyteller is returning through the poet who is the person. Um, both spiritually and historically. So there are many bodies that are colliding and collapsing in, in the rendering of this piece. Um, and what we know is true of the Caribbean is that we're all storytellers because we carry our stories with us and we tell it to the different people we meet and encounter. And I'll let someone else pick it up from there. I was I was waiting for my, my friend on the other side of Miami to begin before. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I just want to say really quickly um, that for me, it's I guess what, when I was working on the piece about Sojourn, I've been thinking about Sojourn as one of my favorites from the 19th century. She's my, my favorite woman, actually, from the 19th century and my favorite favorite Shiro from the 19th century. And when I when I read some of what's written about her, I feel like I want to step into the, her time so I can do her makeup for her. You know what I mean? Because obviously she wants to be represented as fly. And I'm a fly girl from Jamaica and Harley's Queens. So I'm always thinking about, she likes to be fly. I want to make her more fly. I mean, Sojourner, we could just make you more fly. We, can, we see you. We see who you want to be, how you want to be represented. And that's important, right? And so in that way, I guess bodies in that sense wanting to to, to have the body travel through space and time to have that interaction where I can actually make her do more, help her to be more of who she wants to be rather than the less that I think some people want her to see her as. Mm. 
Mm. See, see, I knew, I knew, I knew that's why you, you should, you should go first. From Hollis to Laurelton, I'm from Laurelton, right? <laughs> Next door, next door. Next door. But, but this is a, a very incisive thing that you're seeing between what, what's holding you know, what's holding these these conversations together, and you know because I'm teaching uh, introduction to, Af- uh, to uh, Africana studies this semester, and returning over and over to Manning Marable's understanding of Black studies as as descriptive corrective and prescriptive that when I hear when, when I hear these I'm thinking okay so we can be uh, to be corrective and descriptive is to say sojourner was fly and is fly that's right and my redescriptive <laughs> my re-narrativizing this is putting it in a way where you can see this right so yeah. like a yeah. lot of pro- projects that are happening in black study we are um, we are are in, in some we're honoring the dead we're honoring ourselves by doing this we are re-narrativizing ourselves also and so for me um also the, the other the watershed the thing that that shifts this also the embodied piece is the piece of of black feminism and black womenism that insists that that I, that we put our bodies in it. That insists that we cannot leave. Uh, we cannot leave our sensuality, our desires, um, and our vulnerabilities outside of our theorization. And so, for me, you know, my book begins with one line that then shifts, but that's still where the book begins, which is, "Joseph Beam was my first, mm. right? Joseph Beam was not really my first in that way, uh, you know." Uh, but because of how much I wanted Joseph Bean and how my 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 intellectual and my political and my literary libidin, libidinal self collapsed through this figure, um, it is it is so clear and important to me that that my my archival and ethnographic and writing research be embodied and that I remember and feel the bass in my chest. I feel the hand on the small of my back. I hear, um, I hear the music. I feel it um, in ways that then when I see Belkis Ayon's uh, work, which, uh, which I saw first in situ in Havana, you also get a sense um, and, and to put in juxtaposition uh, uh, the 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 concentric circles um, of of Professor Winter and and then Belkis's piece also that you even in those pieces there is a sense of the body's placed in the body's placed in space and our need to be in space with one another and so I'm I'm, I'm really thankful for this is going to cause a lot of um a lot of my free writing tonight as i go back to um go back to think about about these conversations thank you so much for all of you on the panel and for person who asked that that the question in the in ithaca brilliant question Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you is there anything you wanted to quickly add amaris oh um only that the concentric circles are a diagram I borrow from Professor Spillers. I just wanted to um, make that um, clear. And mm-hmm. then also, I think one of the, the last thing I would just add is that um, I'm really curious about the way that Sojourner Truth um, entitles that work, I sell this shadow to support the substance. Yeah. And so when I think about that, I'm thinking about, in your question, um, what does Sojourner Truth not put on display? Like, what is, what is the substance that is kept for herself? Mm-hmm. So I don't know, as a kind of order of intimacy, um, how in some ways might she be refusing a certain iconographic uh, representation or giving you just what she has? and keeping the rest for herself. So the rest for herself is, is the kind of relation that I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. OK, so thank you so much. I wish I had more time to sing your praises. This has been amazing. Thank you for being here in the space with us. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you to uh, Shikoya. Um, thank you to Jahoon and uh, Shikoya for putting this on, and uh, I'm really grateful to be in this space um, with all of the scholars that have came before me. Um, I know we're short on time, so I'll just get right into it. Um, I'm just going to be sharing one poem today. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of background and uh, get right into it. So, um, on March 18th, 2018, officers responded to a call of a man wearing a black hood breaking car windows in Sacramento, California. Within minutes, he was executed in the backyard of his grandmother's home. He was shot eight times in the back. His younger sister and his grandmother were at the home at the time. His name was Stefan Clark, and he was 22 years old. So often, we focus on the death, how it happened, what happened. But what happens next? Um, what happens next for those that could not just turn off the TV screen or uh, turn off social media to just, escape, to just escape, rarely get seen? So what is it like to sit there and see the general image, and not just see a general image of another one, but see your own loved one across the screen? What happens when it's your cousin that you see? Um, so I'm going to move into my poem. It's an emulation piece of June Jordan's Moving Towards Home. Okay. Dark brown casket cascade through the middle aisles of the church pew. Our family, your friends, and news reporters stood in heart-dropping stillness till dew-filled eyes and pain-filled souls became your weeping choir. Unshaquita led us as she began wailing in anguish, calling out your name, Stefan, oh my baby Stefan. A cry that pierced through our chest like police bullets tore through yours. My eyes feared the box they put you in, the box that young brown boys know all too well. I stayed glued to the banner of your face with that infectious smile I remember. That is my cousin Steph, I thought, as Al Sharpton glided to the center, staring right into the news cameras, as your brother, Stefan Tay, clung to him like he was our savior, a man who will make the world feel our pain. We are all Stefan Clark, Sharp Sharpton shouted. My lips grew silent. I do not wish to speak about the squad cars and the headlights not quite illuminating all of the blood-soaked pavement and the gun shrapnel. Nor do I wish to speak about the Black Lives Matter chants that reach the police stations where cops corroborate cover-ups. Nor do I wish to speak about the fearful mother who instructed her melanated son to follow the antagonistic officer's orders before government bullets blew him away. Nor do I wish to speak about the video game playing aunt who was fatally shot through her own bedroom window by an unannounced policeman, or the eyes of her nephew watching her brown body fall to the ground. Nor do I wish to speak about the militarized police force that fired tear gas and rubber bullets into picket sign protesters who have grown weary of officers using black bodies as target practice nor do I wish to speak about the hiding list of hashtag names, the lives that will not be forgotten. Nor do I wish to speak about the black boy again and again full of life before they slaughter him for possession of a lethal cell phone. Nor do I wish to speak about the heartbroken mother that will not be granted justice in a system that refuses to put itself on trial. I need to speak about the promised land where my children will live through a traffic stop. I need to speak about the promised land where the men of my family are not packed down in jail cells. I need to speak about the promised land where I can watch the news without boiling with rage at the sight of my own kin 
laying in a pool of his own blood for the world to see. Where I must not ask where is death, because he will be at our family house. I need to talk about the promised land, because I need to talk about unity. Thank you. And also an important reminder of the many ways that we can take that phrase, words made flesh, right? Um, so without further ado, we're going to go to our last panel of the day, the Creative Methodologies panel. Um, having a real meta moment with this screen right here. <laughs> but thank you. faces, to see new faces. Thanks so much to Jahan and Shakoya and everyone involved um, in the planning and the execution of this symposium. It's been an amazing experience. Thank you especially to Carol Boyce Davies, um, Professor Carol Boyce Davies, um, the notorious CBD as many of us um, <laughs> like to call her. Um, it's wonderful to be um, in this gathering of so many generations of her students and colleagues um, and feeling very grateful for this moment. Um, one of the things that I'm most grateful for is that I am getting to introduce, introduce our first panelist, Marcia Douglas, who is my sister friend extraordinaire, um, comrade um, in the trenches <laughs> of English classes <laughs> at SUNY Binghamton so many years ago. Um, I'm honored to introduce you this evening um, and also to get the opportunity to learn more um, about your work um, and also to think about the ways that this concept, this idea of the creative theoretical continues to evolve and be so relevant for so many generations of students and scholars. Um, Marcia Douglas teaches in the creative writing program at the University of Colorado Boulder. The author of three novels, The Marvelous Equations of Dread, Madam Fate, and Notes from a Writer's Book of Cures and Spells, Marcia Douglas is the recipient of several awards, including the 2020 Capital Creative Capital Award, um, which is a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship and a UK Poetry Book Society recommendation. Additionally, um, Douglas is the author of a collection of poetry, Electricity Comes to Cocoa Bottom. Without further ado, Professor Douglas. Thank you so much, Meredith, and so great to be here with everyone. And um, I'd also like to add my thanks as well to Shakoya, Jahan, um, all the grad students, and uh, Professor Carol Boyce Davies. Um, I'm going to say um, a little bit today about um, my uh, creative writing journey and lineages, you might say. And I'm calling this piece, I say all this to say that, where words come from. So, one of my characters, Alva, has an obsession with words. She works in a garment factory and secretly sews words into the hems of clothing, suspecting that these words may have the power to influence wearers. I like this about Alva. Left to her own devices, I have a feeling that she could sew a whole manuscript into the hems of 1,000 dresses ready for unsuspecting target customers. I think she could create a whole revolution that way. Her words go something like this. Jump, pimento, fever, salt, river bottom, Zion, chicken wire, bend, shout, watch, swipe, sweet, gate, see, book, ball. Alva does not know it, but her practice of sewing words into the hems of garments reminds of West African traditions of enclosing protective scripts inside charms and stitching them into clothing. Words are power. Alva enters realms I dare not tread except through her. 
but in tracing her creative lineage, she has me thinking about where words come from and what they do. And she has me thinking about my own lineages and this word novel and its empireness in the post-colonial context. I come from a space where, out of necessity and imagination, European and African tongues become nation language. Rastafarian drumming, gospel, and R&B become reggae. Christianity and African spirituality become kumina. We are adept at reinventing and remaking, and in so doing, surviving and remembering ourselves. What then? might the novel become? This is the territory I have always been interested in charting. Thread, ocean, kotai, true, stitch, yellow, bones, new, maker, Babylon, craven, worn. And Alva has me wondering what to call myself. I like storyteller better than novelist because it unlatches the work from Western form and honors connection to multiple lineages of word and narrative, tracing language to the bottom of ships, cane fields and storefronts, Kingston street fights, speaking in tongues, the lyrics of a, of a reggae tune and innovators like Ursuline and her pitchy patchy walls. Ursuline, my grandmother, was a countrywoman who practiced the old time Jamaica tradition of papering the walls of one's home with newspaper clippings, magazine pages, and whatever pretty paper could be found. It was from these walls that I learned something about text and image and story design. There studying a tiny house up in the no electricity hills of Clarendon, Jamaica. When I was a little girl, I spent much time just looking at these walls, not so much to read the actual words, but to take in all the detailed wonder of them. The clippings interrupted every now and then by a black and white photo from a relative in England, or by an old calendar page, or an advertisement for palm olive soap or hair pomade. All of it glued to the wall with a mixture of flour and water. I didn't know it then, but these flower water walls were a beginning apprenticeship. Long while now, and still each time I try to explain my work to myself, it is to these walls I return. Robert Farris Thompson connects the Afro-diasporic tradition of papering the walls of a house in this irregular and random style to the multi-patterning aesthetic found in asymmetrical African textiles. Here the art is more concerned with staggered and offbeat patterns rather than order and repeated symmetry. In West Africa, asymmetrical patterning emerges from the understanding that evil travels in straight lines, and something of this memory has zigzagged its way across the Atlantic to form such as crazy quilts and pitchy patchy walls. In the old days, to paper a wall in this unpredictable, uneven fashion then, was believed by some to confuse bad intention spirits. As one African-American informant said to Thompson, the evil spirits will get tired of reading and go away. Crabgrass, foot bottom, barbecue, blue, tick clock, wick lamp, hollering, girl and wheel and turn and mirror and bulb and foil and jug is true. In writing my second novel, notes from a writer's book of cures and spells, I set out to construct an asymmetrical narrative. I wanted to write a novel just a little lopsided, speckled with fascinating imperfections. I flower pasted it with little pitchy patchy off the wall things, some of which got edited out as the novel traveled from editor to editor. This is beautiful, they said, but we don't know how to market it or our readers will not have the patience for this, or this is much too busy. By the time the book found a home, I had cleaned up the margins, held myself in check a little. I went back to my grandmother's house a few years ago, and her wallpaper was gone. Someone had painted over it. In Colorado, I take pages from my new manuscript to my office walls. I cover every inch of the walls in that way, as far as I can reach. 
When I run out of space, I cover the door, the windows and the bookshelves, then walk around and read. It is a holiday and Denison Hall is quiet, the building empty. This is how I navigate plot, arrive at the last word and enter a half open gate. Red coat, chant down, on dock, through, chocho, congo, afayam now. While in Portland, Jamaica one summer, I meet with a writer of unusual independence. He is an elderly man, Jay, and he wears four pencils stuck in his red headscarf. On this day, he is dressed in white. He sits next to me, tears a page from a notebook, and begins to write. His expressive interlocked lines are incomprehensible. The writing scrawls across the page. To me, the marks look like ocean waves, the hurricane kind. This is his way of writing, he explains, and it can be read only by him. He watches the sky and writes instructions for my life, then folds the paper. I am in awe and a little afraid of him. I hold this experience in my mind, and then I come across kindred in writers such as Harriet Mullen and her work on African script systems and, men and mention of African spirit writers and Congo prophetic practices. And this gives me a name and lineage to put to Jay's scribbling, and everything comes full circle, and I understand. I think of the Portland spirit writer as someone like Alva, but unlike Alva, he is free of the trappings of alphabet and formalized letters. I think he feels words. The spirit writer comes as another link in my understanding of relationship to the page. I do not know what he wrote on that torn sheet, but perhaps the most important gift he gave to me that day was a reminder that my connection to page is part of a heritage of inscripting and inscription of which I traverse assuredly, though faintly still. District, leave, another, luck, go, tie, staff, wash, war, burn, red, psalm, bleed, shed, deliverance, write. And God said, let there be sound. I am thinking of myself as a teenager sitting in church at 54 Chisholm Avenue, Kingston 11. Inside the church, there is clapping and singing and tongues of fire, while down the road, a mega amp reggae sound system blasts the feeling of the nation. The sisters in the pews begin to dance, and for an instance, it is not clear to me whether they are rocking to the church music or to the sound system. It is all happening so loud and at the same time. At home at night, I lay in bed, and there are two or three competing sound systems in the neighborhood. This is Kingston, and one gets used to music, develops a high tolerance for big sound. Soon, all the neighborhood dogs will begin to bark, and this will continue into the wee hours of the morning. The dogs and the music, the dogs and the music, the sound systems conscious of each other and layering over each other, answering one another, two and three, two and three tunes wailing at the same time in different parts of the neighborhood. There is a pause as the bass line drops and the dogs are silent for a while, feeling it. And then one by one, they start again and a DJ runs another tune and a few riffs later, a second tune from another neighborhood sound system comes in. And so the night continues. Reggae and dance hall consciousness rule both day and night, as well as the spaces in between. This is the pulse of Kingston. And I find here wrought in sound something akin to the multi patterning of the writing on the walls, sounds unpredictable and colliding. When I began writing my third novel, The Marvelous Quagions of the Dread, I knew I wanted to honor this experience. In this new work, then, I am conscious of how voices layer, how sounds layer. I am mindful of the acoustics of the page, how pages layer, chapters layer. I call it a reggae book. It is a sound conscious book, a novel in bass rhythm. There are vocal passages as well as instrumental or dub passages. The vocal passages or tracks are narrated out of the novel's urban centers, Kingston, London, Addis Ababa, while the dub passages emerge from the spirit world where the dead speak and plan our future, anxious for our survival. During the writing of the first draft, my father had a stroke and could not speak. 
His words came out all jumbled. He told whole epic stories that way. I wondered what wisdom we might be missing. When we gave him paper and pencil, his lines looked like the spirit writers. One afternoon, I foolishly get this grand idea that I am going to help him speak. One word at a time, Dad, I say. And then suddenly he says very clearly, one word at a time. Oh, one word at a time. One word at a time. Oh, one word at a time. Jesus, God, one word at a time. And he goes on and on with it and won't stop. One word at a time. Tears running down his face and it breaks my heart. And I wish I had never suggested it. But I never forget it. One word at a time. One of the characters in The Marvelous Equations is a young slave boy hung from a silk cotton tree in 1766. As his feet dance and he breathes his last breath, he finds himself trying to remember a word, a beautiful ancient Yoruba word he once knew in Africa. Something about that word he senses is important to recall, but there hanging from the tree, he dies without retrieving it. In the world of this novel, the spirit of that boy is restless into the future, all the way into the now, anxious to remember. He, along with other spirits, haunt the clock tower at Halfway Tree, erected right on the spot where the silk cotton once grew. It turns out that the word the boy longs to remember is ashe, which means the power to make things happen. Ashe is creativity, vital force, the part of us which cannot be destroyed. And I like to think of it as the power to make and remake, like the recovery of ourselves, fierce and pitchy patchy. Uptown, nightfall, foot pedal, sheet, lionfish, tongue, back answer, blink. One of my father's favorite expressions used to be, I say all this to say that. He, who in the effort to illuminate, often told a story with many tangents, recovering always, after much ado, his thread. Sound, rhythm, throat, text, multi, late root, sword, rise, ash, ash, ashe. Novelist, storyteller, roots worderman. I say all this to say that one day you find your true name sewn somewhere, a word in a protective script, the syllables so ancient, they are new. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you so much. Can you all imagine sitting in seminar with Marcia and then having to read a segment of your paper after that? It was terrifying. Thank you so much for that. Our next panelist is Dr. Christopher Smith. Um, who is a research associate at the Center for Ethics at the University of Toronto um, with the ethic, with, excuse me, with the Race, Ethics and Power Project. They received their PhD from the Department of Social Justice Education um, and at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education in 2020. Their research interests reside in the productive interstices of Black diaspora cultural studies, Black expressive cultures and practices, queer and feminist theory, including post-colonial and decolonial studies. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my gratitude to uh, Jehan and Shakoya and as well, uh, Carol Boyce Davies for uh, extending this invitation uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, if we could, uh, I just want to make sure the first slide is up. Yes, perfect. And so uh, just as a kind of brief preamble, uh, part of the way in which I'm coming to this conversation, uh, despite the fact that uh, most of my work is oriented towards cultural studies, uh, for all intents and purposes, I'm formally trained as a sociologist, uh, specifically sociology and equity studies and education. and. One of the things that I'd always found uh, arduous was that social, uh, sociological writing is not always fun. You're writing about statistics. And for me, the very practice of writing, um, beginning a sentence with, and some of my respondents said this and felt like I was too detached 
from whatever it was that I was writing about. And this became even more apparent uh, as I was uh, at the stage of writing my dissertation, which will now turn into my manuscript, uh, Itinerant Hospitalities, Black, Queer, World Making. And this prompted to me, prompted me to, uh, this invitation kind of prompted me to reflect on a variety of things, variety of things in terms of my own growth and development as a writer, uh, because I've been, I've been writing since I was eight years old. Uh, I wouldn't publish any of it. Uh, they were whimsical and pretty much more of a lark than anything. But thinking about that whole journey where in my master's, uh, my supervisor was Leslie Sanders at York University, who was the mentor of then my supervisor, uh, Ronaldo Walcott, and remembering uh, her first feedback on uh, a draft of my first chapter. And she said, oh my God, you and Ronaldo are like, you both write like you talk. And I'm just like, okay, is that necessarily a bad thing? But I understood what she meant in terms of grammatical errors, structure, so on and so forth. But what I understood and what I took from that was also that ultimately I want to find my voice in some way, shape or form. And I oriented myself towards different kinds of creative uh, outputs, uh, in particular poetry, uh, to get me motivated to write. Uh, one, of the one of the things, I guess, like a ritual you would say, uh, when I was engaged both in my master's, but then later on uh, in uh, my doctoral writing and still to this day, I would replay in my head a short stanza from, uh, I think, I believe it's discourse, uh, discourse on language uh, from She Tries Her Tongue uh, by uh, Marlene Narbesi Phillip. Uh, as follows, if the word does not nourish, bite it off at its source, mm -hmm. spit it out, start again. And so with that, I started to kind of think about not just textual in terms of the written word, but also visual kinds of ways of documenting, because my current project right now is looking, uh, looking at Black queer tourism practices uh, as a way to kind of intervene in the ways in which queer tourism as a practice, but also the ways in which queer tourism is being theorized or critiqued, uh, in this case, critiqued by like folks like Jasper Poir or uh, M. Jackie Alexander, where I notice that there's no space to imagine Black queer subjects moving. And I begin this by, un and then I begin this project by understanding that Black subjectivity is often produced in transit. I've been traveling since I was two years old, back and forth from Trinidad with my mother. And so part of my life is forming myself, being in transit and understanding the nuances. And so with that, uh, what I'm going to share with you uh, and so the title of this talk is Root Prints, Dispatch, Different Maps, or Turn Left. Dispatches, 2018. When I, read your, when I read your poem this evening, I knew the source, its, in, its impetus, a culmination of dispatches we shared while you were in NOLA, without me, like I, that time without you. When we travel, sisters in crime, we lean, sorry, we lean in with all kinds of reads and ting, plenty laughs followed by late night ruminations. You text me at 5 a.m., not uncommon. I'd like to know how you keep in, especially that weekend. Trust, Nola can do a number on you. 
Hell, I never thought I would be the star of my own Western Union commercial. Girl, never use an ATM near the dark room. Just saying. 2012 was jokes. In your dispatch, you exclaim, girl, this place is run like a fucking plantation. I want to say, didn't I tell you that last year? But instead I pause. Girl, I feel you, Manuel. We ain't broke but we ain't bougie, yet somehow we are being served. Are we tourists or merely wayward, for, wayward folks finding ourselves in this place, passing through? You can begin with roots, but it's ultimately our routes, our roots, that ultimately change us. An imprint, a root print resting in our bodies held as sensuous remains as we traverse, uh, traverse many borders, a small yet blessed comfort. When we move, we are never alone. Root print number one, NOLA 2012, Black Gay Men's Research, uh, a research Group Conference, Designing a Decade. One afternoon while having an obligatory pre-presentation uh, pre cigarette outside of the Marriott Hotel, nestled in the heart of the French Quarter, I happened upon a white middle-class heterosexual couple eagerly waiting to board a tour bus, perhaps to see the quote-unquote real New Orleans. While I'm typically not inclined to eavesdrop, yeah, right, uh, I overheard the woman remark, I don't know what's going on. But there seems to be a great number of people of that persuasion here at this hotel. Now intrigued, I listened attentively to see how she would qualify her observation. As a means of ensuring her uh, comments were not misconstrued as either racist or homophobic, or perhaps both, she continu uh, continued in a manner reminiscent of a Seinfeld-like gesture of political correctness. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Her significant other, I assume, appears unamused and did not accept her invita uh, invitation to dialogue on the purportedly unusual number of Black queer folk residing at their hotel. In the days after bearing witness to this, this is ext uh, after the days, sorry, in the days after bearing uh, witness to this exchange, I would engage in conversations with colleagues specifically what it means for a collective of unabashed Black gay men and trans folks to adamantly occupy space in what this woman thought of as an intrusion, whether on Bourbon Street in a club or a pub or catching up in the hotel lounge, one was compelled to think that we were making a scene, so to speak, rather than seeing us uh, as merely being embodied subjects unanticipated to appear, but again, en masse. The Big Easy would not be as laid back as one is inclined to imagine, despite its popular representation as such. These series of uh, exchanges compelled me to engage in a series of self-reflective questions. First, how is it that the visible presence of Black queer bodies conjures such a remark in the first place. Second, while I'm, while I'm not inclined to see a stranger's observations as immediately rooted in a homophobic or racist compulsion, or at least not, a, not in a hostile manner, how does one account for the anxiety I intuited and similarly felt that ultimately animate, animated the scene I found myself in and truth be told, did I care? Further, I was indeed, uh, further, I was indeed a part of this moment considering the fact that my body was not, like was up, sorry, I'm gonna skip back. Further, was I actually a part of this moment considering the fact that my body was not formally interpolated to either bear witness to or become the subject of this person's observation? Third, in considering these questions, one might ask then, is there a narrative of tourism, a tourism experience 
that one acquires that cannot uh, imagine the mobility of Black queer bodies. Lastly, what does it mean for Black queer bodies to occupy what we imagine as tourist space in a manner that is deliberate, such that our bodily presences create a scene? Of note, the Texan with whom I shared a nightcap exclaimed a different version. Damn, is there a Queen's Convention in here? Well then, root print number two, before the page. That night out on Bourbon Street, I am leaning in with a colleague because I know I am not the only one that is noticing the element of surprise that our presence is evoking, either upon the road or in the club. Most of our crew are dropping it on the dance floor. And then all of a sudden, a white woman approaches us. Oh my God, thank, thank God you are here, she exclaims. I'm like, what? My friend sitting over there is gay too. And we have, and we have not found any gay folks in the city. We are so glad to see more queer people out tonight. Leaning in, I whisper, um, did we just bring the party? But then I thought to myself, girl, you know, that was bound to happen anyway. It always does. Turn left. Tw uh, 2022. Girl, did you get those pictures I sent? No, not that one. The one with them white folks shuffling antique cotillion dresses on chartered bus on a chartered bus. I hope they are antiques. Who would make new versions? Anyway, apparently Scarlett wears battery riders in the daylight. I tell you, go left. Follow the bacchanal until it seems party done. Turn left, hit rampart. Trust, you will find it and the page will turn you. Ain't nothing like running in the rain in heels to find there are still gentlemen that will say, how do, while a cocktail slides in your hand. Maybe I'm partial to old school things like jukeboxes and late night slow jams dancing under candlelight. Every dollar in the jukebox holds a wish, a desire, a song that must be heard, a story yet to be written. I pause as his, I, I pause as his arm curl up my waist, hands hanging on his shoulders, fingers stroking all the tickly parts, prompting giggles. Bliss. Girl, I'm gonna tell you more next week when I get home. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Lamar Jarrell Bruce, who is a cultural and literary critic, um, Black Studies devotee, first generation college graduate, and associate professor of American Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. His debut book titled How, um, How to Go Mad Without Losing Your Mind, Madness and Black Racial Creativity, earned the Nicolas Guillen Outstanding Book Award. His next book experiments in the convergence in the convergences of love and madness, or what he titles the Afromantic. Dr. Bruce. Good evening, friends. I'm delighted to be in community and in conversation with you all today. Thank you, especially to Jahan Robinson, Shakoya Kidwell, Carol Boyce Davies, Chris Walford, my co-panelists and everyone else involved in uh, making this marvelous event happening and gathering to participate today. I'm gonna unfurl a very brief, very quick and dirty account of a creative theoretical paradigm and tradition that blooms at the convergence of madness and blackness. Um, so I'll leap right in. Um, so I recently slide. I recently published a book called How to Go Mad Without Losing Your Mind, Madness and Black Radical Creativity, which is a study of 20th and 21st century Black cultural producers who mobilize madness in radical cultural forms and world making. Among the prominent 
protagonists in the project are uh, Buddy Bolden, Charles Mingus, Sun Ra, Richard Wright, Nina Simone, Entezake Shange, Gail Jones, Richard Pryor, Lauren Hill, Dave Chappelle, Kendrick Lamar, Kanye West, among others. And in the works of these artists, what I claim is that madness animates and sometimes agitates Black radical art making, self making, and world making. Madness becomes content, form, symbol, idiom, aesthetic, existential posture, philosophy, strategy, energy, and methodology in an enduring Black radical tradition. So in the book, I propose that madness signifies at least four entities in the modern West. Next slide. First is what I call phenomenal madness, which encompasses the lived first person experience of psychic turmoil and unruliness of mind. Second is what I call medicalized madness, the psychiatric diagnosis of mental illness that right, is arbitrated by uh, medical experts and medical authority. Third is furious madness, right? Anger, wrath, rage, um, an emotional state of intense and aggressive displeasure. And fourth is psychosocial madness, the most capacious of these, um, these categories. Psychosocial madness or psychosocial alterity, which, which entails a sort of drastic deviation from psychosocial norms, right? Anything, any person, behavior, articulation that sort of radically vexes and perplexes the psychosocial status quo is liable to be labeled crazy. I want to be clear, I'm not attempting to establish a rigid, exhaustive definition of madness. Madness is too messy to be placed in tidy boxes and too restless to hold still for rigid definitions. I'm sketching um, an account uh, of four ways among potentially infinite other ways that madness manifests and circulates in Western modernity. But for my purposes today, I want us to think together about what I call mad methodology. Beyond regarding madness as an object of analysis, I activate in my work and in my life, the life world more broadly, I activate madness as methodology, mad methodology. It's what I want to center today. As I propose and practice it, Mad methodology is an ensemble of epistemological frameworks, political praxis, interpretive techniques, quotidian life strategies, existential orientations, and affective dispositions that activate madness. I'm proposing a methodology where madness informs and infuses critical, ethical, radical ways of thinking, ways of protesting, ways of reading, ways of feeling, living, ways of being. Mad methodology chases and rides the unruly movements of madness without intent to capture what it chases. It attunes itself to and is conversant in the expressivity of the purported rants and raves of mad persons. Mad methodology, as I propose, it ponders the sporadic violence of madness. And listen closely to this, the sporadic violence of madness in tandem and intense in, in tension with the structural violence of reason. Right, I can think of modern atrocities, both mundane and momentous. We can think about the transatlantic slave trade. We can think about the Holocaust. We can think about myriad iterations of colonialism and, and war right, that are perpetrated under the ages, under the banner of reason. Right? Far more modern harm has been done under the banner of reason than by rogue mad persons. Mad methodology realizes and sometimes harnesses mad feelings like obsession, rage, and paranoia as stimulus for radical thought and practice. Mad methodology historicizes and contextualizes madness as a social construction and social relation vis-a-vis -vis reason. And reason for my purposes, capital R reason, uh, for my purposes is a proper noun de denoting a positivist, secularist, enlightenment root and episteme is purported to uphold objective truth, truth always in scare quotes, uh, while mapping and mastering the world. I'll say that again, a, a, a positivist, secularist, enlightenment rooted episteme um, purported to uphold objective, quote unquote, truth while mapping and mastering the world. In normative Western philosophy since the age of enlightenment, reason and rationality are believed essential for achieving modern, modern personhood, for joining civil society, 
and participating in liberal politics. However, reason has been entangled, right? from those enlightenment roots with misogynist, colonialist, ableist, anti-Black and other pernicious ideologies. But back to mad methodology, whereas reason roundly discredits mad persons, mad methodology, as I propose, it recognizes mad persons as critical theorists and decisive protagonists in struggles for liberation. Mad methodology neither vilifies the mad person as evil incarnate, nor romanticizes the mad person as resistance personified, nor patronizes the mad person as a helpless ward awaiting aid. Rather, mad methodology uh, engages the complexity and variability of mad subjects. And mad methodology, as I propose and practice it, it doesn't attempt to wholly transparently reveal madness. How could it? Madness, after all, tends to frustrate rational interpretation, to, to elude understanding, to refuse neat resolution. To study madness, I know, is to become, and to live with madness, I know, is to become accustomed to uncertainty and irresolution. As mad methodologist, I relinquish the imperative to know, to take, to capture, to master, right? All associated with, with that project of enlightenment reason. Um, I relinquish the imperative to know, to take, to capture, to master, to lay bare all the world with its countless terrors and wonders, that imperative that drives so much scholarly inquiry. I, I refuse it, or I try to refuse it. I don't always succeed. I want to highlight, next slide, a few specific examples of how MAD methodology, well, uh, I suppose these examples won't be very specific. I had another uh, version of this talk planned where I dove into specifics, but what I'm gonna do here is give you an overview of a few iterations of, a few elements of, and iterations of uh, MAD methodology. Let's start with radical compassion. Radical compassion is at the heart of MAD methodology. It's, it's perhaps the primary function of MAD methodology to extend radical compassion to mad persons. Radical compassion is a will to care for, a commitment to feel with, a striving to learn from, a readiness to work alongside, an openness to be vulnerable before a precarious other, though they may be drastically dissimilar to yourself. Radical compassion is not a naive appeal to an idyllic oneness where subjectivities converge and differences blithely effaced, nor is it a smug projection of oneself into the position of another, consequently displacing that other, nor is it an invitation to, to walk a mile in someone else's shoes and amble like a tourist through their life world, leaving them existentially barefoot all the while. Rather, radical compassion is an exhortation to ethically walk and sit and learn and fight and build alongside another whose condition may be utterly unlike your own. Radical compassion works to impart care, exchange feeling, transmit awareness, embolden vulnerability, and fortify solidarity against circumstantial, sociocultural, phenomenological, and ontological chasms. It seeks to forge an existential entanglement, not easily loosened. It persists even and especially, especially toward beings who are the object of contempt and condemnation from dominant value systems. Now, for those who experience profound self-alienation, who are existentially estranged from their own selves, who endure internal rupture and fragmentation, it's vital to extend radical compassion to one's own self. I hasten to mention that radical compassion is no uh, panacea. As intently as it strives, it sometimes fails, sometimes falls short. After all, it is subject to the limits of human comprehension, imagination, and will. And maybe there are some chasms too wide to cross. These contingencies should not be cause for resignation or despair. Another aspect of mad methodology, as I propose it, is fluency in the idiom of madness. Mad methodology re reads, hears, amplifies, and respects idioms of madness. Uh, modes of radical utterance that are incomprehensible to normative logics that are inaudible to rational hearing, that subvert the grammars of reason. I'm talking about um, mad articulations that are typically dismissed as rant, rave, ramble, gibberish. I, for the purposes of my project, my work, am invested in becoming, in becoming conversant in, fluent in various modes of mad methodology, although uh, maybe fluency 
ever evades us, right? Madness resists neat, tidy translation. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about mumbles, moans, wails, shrieks, sighs, groans, grunts, discomforting silences that might all be idioms of madness, right? It's not always verbal. Mad methodology teaches us to read upside down. That's another key element. Um, and I pulled this particular theory from a fictional uh, Black woman in a short story by Gail Jones, a short story called Asylum, published in 1977, um, whose protagonist, unnamed protagonist, is a Black woman in psychiatric confinement who practices what I call reading up, what she calls reading upside down. She's, in an, uh, she's being examined by a psychiatrist and she says, quote, I watch him write something down in a book. He thinks I can't read upside down. While she's literally describing her gaze at a doctor's paperwork, I think about reading upside down in my work as a, a model of a practice of counter reading, right? That deliberately defies dominant discourse. Uh, perhaps to read upside down is to turn hegemonic logic on its head, to expose its underbelly, to deliberately misread its terms and disobey its instructions, to invert and subvert its pre presumptions, to imagine its top on bottom and its bottom on top, to scramble its syntax, to read in ways that rally upheaval of unjust order. Reading upside down as articulated by a mad black woman in a psychiatric hospital, a fictional mad black woman in a psychiatric hospital, not who we typically go to for theoretical insight, right? This belongs in the toolkit of mad methodology, right? And I'm grateful to that mad black fictional woman in a psychiatric hospital. Um, so I want to briefly, because I always go over, I'm gonna just talk in a few seconds about critical ambivalence, swerving and giving you something you can feel. Um, when, when studying madness, um, critical ambivalence is key. Um, madness, I recognize, might be a site of freedom, exhilaration, revelation, yes, ecstasy, but also a site and scene of violence, uh, of terror, of harm. It's okay to feel ambivalent. We needn't always achieve affective resolution, cognitive closure, or ideological certitude. Sometimes it's useful, even crucial, to tarry in the openness of ambiguity the both andness, the, the sort of tension and friction of being, uh, when one recognizes the sort of liberatory possibility and hegemonic force of a thing that coexists in a thing at once. Mad methodology also invites us to swerve. And I'm thinking about Marsha's comment on evil traveling in straight lines. When I write about madness and through madness, some, some of our colleagues are invested in argumentation that sort of barrels forward like a steam engine. And I'm interested in what it means to, to incorporate swerving into our sentences and paragraphs, right? The expression of doubt, the process of self-questioning, um, the critical intentional detour, right? That doesn't undermine the argument, that intensifies the argument because I'm signaling to skeptical readers that I too have pondered, have engaged in thinking through the questions, not barreling over um, madness and the other matters I think through. Um, giving you something you can feel, madness evades knowing. Sometimes we have to seek recourse in feeling instead and flipping the table. I'll close with this. What would it mean to move beyond seeking a, a seat at the table of reason, of enlightenment reason, respectable reason, and instead choosing to flip the goddamn table and carry our meals outside instead? I think that process of flipping the table is, is key to the mad methods I want to practice. Thank you, friends. Thank you so much. Um, that was a feast for my soul. Thanks to all three of our panelists. I'd like to open the floor for questions. I'm not sure, Jahan, if you are fielding questions or if you'd like for me to ask questions of the panelists this evening. Okay, I'll start with um, with one question and then you can redirect as needed, okay? Thank you. Thank um, you. One of the things that I see, one of the threads that I see um, connecting um, each of these presentations is um, this idea of moving between 
um, line and lyric pattern and textile, um, thinking about reading stories kind of inside out um, or telling stories in a way that's inside out, right? Where you focus on the kind of interiority of community to be able to reflect the story out to the reader. And so I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about that process. Um, I recall that um, Christopher mentioned um, the idea of somewhat like eavesdropping. Um, I know in your field, there's the, the term strategic lur lurking. Um, another term I really like is skylark. I love a skylark. And there's a way that you weave that idea of the skylark in um, Marcia talking about thinking about different types of textualities. Um, um, I think sits kind of at the foundation of your work. And Lamar, this idea of flipping the table, kind of flipping the way that we do theory and recognize theory, right? We know Patricia Hill Collins gives us a really powerful example of thinking about um, theory, not from below, I don't like that term as much, but thinking about different kinds of um, theoretical authority. And I think each of you um, is playing with that a bit. Can you talk a bit more about how you embed that in your process? Who'd like to start? Shall I call on you? <laughs> how about, how about um, Marcia, would you like to begin? Unmute myself. Yeah, Thank thank, thanks for that question, Meredith. Um, you know, I, I see myself as um, interested in uh, different sites or sources, spaces of story, you might say, you know. Um, and so, you know, wh when I think of my creative lineage, so to speak, um, it's not necessarily a literary one, um, but it's one which encompasses um, uh, music or, you know, tracing, as we say in Jamaica, when you cuss somebody and you trace them. And I love this word tracing, you know, because it suggests going back, you know, it suggests this kind of um, um, archaeology almost. Um, it's speaking in tongues, you know, it's, it's preaching, it's... Um, it's it's all kinds of things. It's it's the it, it's music li lyrics. Um, to me, all of all of these um, are texts and sites of story and and poetry, um, which, to be quite frank, are um, just as important, if not more important, to me than um, maybe certain literary texts. So th that's what I'm. That's what I'm drawing from and plugging into and spinning around. My uh, so I have no problem jumping in next uh, to answer uh, answer your question. And my apologies to the audience because uh, Lamar, you talk about going over time. Sometimes I try to push too much into twelve minutes that I forget things. And so one of the slides that should have been shown was a picture of my friend Brian Riggs' book, mm -hmm. uh, which I had intended to recite from where uh, he wrote a triptych to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I was going to read triptych number two, but available in bookstores near you. Mm -hmm. uh, shameless plug. Uh, but uh, yeah, no. Uh, Look at that. Uh, oh, yes, perfect. There we go. And so on Bourbon Street. And I mean, I mean, part of my process, because I'm kind of pushing against certain kinds of practices, uh, is that I'm, I'm relying on my own memory for a lot of what's going to end up on the page in the manuscript. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and again, this very kind of en enlightenment and post enlightenment kinds of uh, notions of reason where it's like truth has to be validated in a particular kind of way. And yet we consider memory as fallible, not easily documented. And so one of the things that I was, I want to say being playful with mm. uh, and still being playful with in my manuscript is how can I share memory while at the same time adhering to uh, this notion that it has to be validated. And so, I'm just like, well, you were there, you tell me. 
Mm-hmm. Like, am, am I, am I, is this a fabulation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or, you know, like have I gone mad? And so this is where like, I was so happy to have a, uh, be on this panel with Lamar uh, and Marcy, your presentation was amazing as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, like thinking about like how, because it all comes down to legibility mm-hmm. ultimately, right? Mm-hmm. And so for me, like experiences of the ways in which we move not only do we carry memories in our body, but they require some sort of dialogic engagement. And so that's also something that I've engaged in my practice Mm -hmm. uh, as as a method, uh, in part precisely to honor the conversations that we have because they gain greater meaning or greater substance when they last and live among and between different bodies, different folks. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that would be my short-ish answer. (laughs) I appreciate that. Um, You know, and um, Lamar, if you'd respond as well, I just wanted to interject that all of this reminds me so much of so many different conversations about liminality um, and literacy. I keep thinking about Vivi Clark here. And um, I think one of you quoted um, Norbessia Philip, and I keep thinking about Grace Nichols. I have crossed an ocean, I have lost my tongue from the root of the old one, a new one has sprung, um, which for me is, is a, a wonderful kind of um, connective, a bit of connective tissue that helps us think about these different movements, travels, de- uh, I think dislocations, displacement, displacements, but then also this ongoing process of regeneration. Right, that's iterative. Lamar? I'll just say briefly, because I know that we're low on time, that I'm, I'm at the core of my project, that the crux of my project is an investment in respecting, respecting honoring, illuminating, taking seriously, mm-hmm. right? Thinkers, creators, theorists who are categorically um, discredited, dismissed, mm-hmm. disregarded, reviled, and exiled. Um, insofar as they inhabit the, the um, convergence of madness and blackness. They're so readily um, dismissed. The most, I, I sort of call and think through the most trenchant theories of, for example, anti-black modernity um, that come from figures whose theories are only heard, are illegible, right? are inaudible to rational hearing, I only heard his rant, rave, rave, ramble, gibberish. So that's, mm-hmm. that's at the core. And the process of reading it upside down, think about that in relation to literacy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, being able to read upside down, a, a sort of faculty with reading in reading upside down. The fact is that that woman in that psychi- psychiatric holding space, right, is capable of reading upside down, but the doctor doesn't think so, right? At his peril, and I'm interested in the ways in which the refusal to for sort of dominant anti-black white supremacist, ableist, et cetera, et cetera, logics to sort of un- to, to recognize the, the sort of wisdom being generated by these marginalized peoples, these vulnerable peoples comes at the, maybe there's an opening there mm-hmm. um, for us to, to sort of, maybe that's, that's that rickety place under the table where you stick something to hold it up that we might grab hold of when we're trying to flip it. So mm-hmm. yes theory everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't mind calling it theory from below because I think there's that below is a really um, mm-hmm. useful vantage point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have 15 million questions, but I'm going to step back so that others can step forward. Jahan, are there questions from the floor? I cannot see them, so I will have to rely on you to share them. Okay. Any questions? Uh, we might go to the chat first, actually. We've got a couple questions there. Um, I can do it. Oh, okay. So from Shante Morris, a uh, student here. Thank you to everyone. Professor Bruce, you said you relinquish the imperative to know. My question is, how do you practice being comfortable in the not knowing? I'm thinking about how in Black Studies, uh, when dealing with the archive, we have to sit with unknowing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I said very briefly during my comments is that, um, when we, we don't know, sometimes we seek solace in feeling instead. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to give people something they can feel. 
um, and I actually wrote something I, I study categorically, spiritual uh, processes, metaphysical phenomena, emotional experiences, um, the life worlds of Black people and mad people for whom there are very few archival traces, right? Um, I try always to open up space, hold space for the opaque, the mysterious, the ghostly, the unknowable, the unimaginable, the sublime, the speculative, right? And when we can't achieve knowing, we can lean into feeling instead. I try to sort of give, I try to generate sentences and even sometimes consciously and sometimes beyond my own consciousness, when I, when I deliver my talks, there's a sort of emphasis upon the, the, the sort of visceral, emphasis upon um, how even if the, if the content of my words evade your understanding, something about the melody, uh, the sensory quality of my delivery will, will kind of lead you forward nonetheless. And it's okay to not understand it's, it's, I tell my students all the time, we have to move beyond understanding as the sort of categorical paradigm for a, a sort of successful outcome in a classroom encounter. Like, let's, let's engage, let's think through, let's grapple with, let's, let's sit in our frustration. Frustration is a genre, I tell them of inspiration. That frustration is gonna move you. Um, and it's going to sort of keep you from the sort of complacency of, of that sort of neat, glib belief that one knows for sure. Thank you for that. Of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Boyce Davis just said he's so smart. <laughs> <laughs> Is there uh, any other question in the room or in the chat? It's so funny. It's like the old people used to say, you don't have to know everything. <laughs> and you were like, of course I do. And you're like, but then you realize that you actually, you don't, but it is, it's the process of getting to know and the sitting with that discomfort. That's really important. That's where the sweetness is, no? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you all for your amazing presentations. My name is Amir, first year PhD student in Africana Studies. Um, Professor Lamardra Bruce, I'm really interested in how madness can propel to the sonic space from exhaustion. Um, the reason why I ask that is because I'm reading um, Incidents of the Life of a Slave Girl, and it reminds me of Harriet Jacobs' quote when she talks about she listens to music until it sounds like screams. I was wondering to hear your perspective on that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to spend more time studying sort of paralinguistic utterances and outbursts that are often associated with madness. I, I gave a, a list, a litany at one point, shrieks, howls, moans, grunts, unseemly silences also. Um, you know, rants, raves, and rambles tend to be associated with language, but I'm interested in the spaces of madness that refuse language, that obliterate, disintegrate language, and music that can become particularly, again, these paralinguistic utterances can become a really fascinating, infinitely fascinating space. Like how does, I don't know, one of Fantasia, I'm thinking about Fantasia Barino, a contemporary singer, who squawks in particular ways, right? When words just won't do it, when melody just won't do it either, when sort of rhythm won't contain it, like a squawk, an outburst, when it comes to sort of a, an ecstatic feeling that sometimes that, that, that uh, Black folks within the sort of religious tradition that fan, from which Fantasia emerged associate with God, Right, but also uh, a sort of the mad feeling, the first blues, the first uh, commercial blues recording by a, 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 a black vocalist was called Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith, 1920, right? And the way of the spaces in that song where again, language fails and 
a grunt or a moan is far more apt. So those are some of the spaces that I'm, I'm interested in. I, I, I do this with Lauren Hill. I think about Lauren Hill's uh, peace of mind performance where she, where language disintegrates. This is on her Unplugged 2.0 album, um, recorded in 2001, released in, 20, uh, in 2002. Um, at a certain point, language comes undone mm -hmm. and, a, and a sputter and a moan and a stammer mm -hmm. are far more apt to convey this mad, this ecstatic, this unspeakable, but perhaps soundable, perhaps, mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcy, I wonder if you'd want to respond to that um, question as well, because I know that you have some characters in your fiction who occupy that space as well. Yeah. Um, I've, well, first of all, I, I, I want to comment on um, something that was said before that Lamar, um, you know, when, when you talk about um, unknowing, you know, um, being willing to be in this space of unknowingness. Um, and I just wanted to say quickly that I found that to be very liberating. So mm -hmm. for that, um, but sound yeah, I, I, I engage with sound also in my work. Um, in, in, in the context of my work, I'm thinking specifically of bass rhythm mm -hmm. um, and the way in which it represents something of this, um, this space of um, deepness and unspeakableness, um, something uh, which uh, comes from a very core place. Um, and in the context of the marvelous equations, base rhythm has the power to even call back the dead. There is something of this urgency um, which is conveyed via the sound and, and, and via, via the, the baseness of, of the music. Um, so I, I do think that maybe um, there is a way in which it's in, in conversation um, with what Lamar is saying about sound and, and something of the, the urgency of, of utterance and, and the power of it as well. And the, the way in which um, sound can be unfettered as well. I, 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 think, I think that there's something of the sound which, which can also hinge on uh, the mad also and, and madness. Thank, Thank you. you. So Christopher, did you want to, did you want to respond? I I, I engage with sound um, uh, because I'm an interdisciplinary scholar since my master's. My master's was in uh, interdisciplinary studies. And so my engagement with sound, uh, currently, I think about sound as spatial punctuation. And so for me, when I'm talking, uh, when I'm rec like recollecting my experiences going to Black Pride events or also uh, being uh, on the initial committee of Blockorama, which is kind of like a variation of Black Pride in Toronto, I think about the ways in which bass signifies geography. Mm -hmm. And so like I would recall like, you know, the first time that uh, a dear friend of mine went to Detroit for Hotter Than July, and we parked somewhere near Parma Park, but we're just like, so where is this place? And we're just like, well, follow the base. And you just keep on walking. And as you get closer, you feel its embrace. I mean, it's very much in the same way that anyone who's, in, who's extroverted and likes to go clubbing. It's like, you know, in the nineties, trying to find a warehouse party, it's like, where is this place? It's like, wait, yo, y'all hear that? It's like, okay, keep on following him. He know where he going. Like, it's like, there, and so for me, that, I mean, that's the way in which I embrace the sonic on that level in terms of what are, like, what are these kinds of spatial cues that come through sound that tell us where we are, but also tell us how we fit within this landscape, even if it's only for an ephemeral moment. And Dr. Boyce Davies talks about taking space where it is, when it is that the music cues you in to the time when it's, when it is not just appropriate, but when it's your turn, when it's your time to take up space. 
right? And even when the words, you don't necessarily need the, need the words because the body already knows right. and responds. So it's a different type of literacy as well. Thank, thank you to each of you. Speaking of madness, no one was mad. I hope no one thinks they were going mad. There was an eight-year-old slipping a note through the cracks of this um, <laughs> just now um, <laughs> on a yellow piece of paper. That actually did happen. <laughs> I think we uh, sadly are out of time. I hate to cut this conversation short. because This has just been amazing. But thank you all so much for being here for all of your offerings. Thank you. 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 That's it.